The Wedding by H. L. Mencken. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Wedding, a Stage Direction. The scene is a church in an American city of about half a million population, and the time is about eleven o'clock of a fine morning in early spring. The neighborhood is well to do, but not quite fashionable. That is to say, most of the families of the vicinage keep two servants, alas, more or less intermittently, and eat dinner at half past six, and about one in every four boasts a colored butler, who attends to the fires, washes windows, and helps with the sweeping, and a last year's automobile. The heads of these families are merchandise brokers, jobbers in notions, hardware, and drugs, manufacturers of candy, hats, badges, office furniture, blank books, picture frames, wire goods and patent medicines, managers of steamboat lines, district agents of insurance companies, owners of commercial printing offices and other such businessmen of substance, and the prosperous lawyers and popular family doctors who keep them out of trouble. In one block live a congressman and two college professors, one of whom has written an unimportant textbook and got himself into who's who in America. In the block above lives a man who once ran for mayor of the city and came near being elected. The wives of these householders wear good clothes and have a liking for a reasonable gaiety, but very few of them can pretend to what is vaguely called social standing, and, to do them justice, not many of them waste any time lamenting it. They have, taking one with another, about three children apiece, and are good mothers. A few of them belong to women's clubs or flirt with the suffragettes, but the majority can get all of the intellectual stimulation they crave in the Ladies' Home Journal and the Saturday Evening Post, with Vogue added for its fashions. Most of them, deep down in their hearts, suspect their husbands of secret frivolity, and about 10% have the proofs, but it is rare for them to make rows about it, and the divorce rate among them is thus very low. Themselves indifferent cooks, they are unable to teach their servants the art, and so the food they set before their husbands and children is often such as would make a Frenchman cut his throat. But they are diligent housewives otherwise. They see to it that the windows are washed, that no one tracks mud into the hall, that the servants do not waste coal, sugar, soap, and gas, and that the family buttons are always sewed on. In religion these estimable wives are pious in habit, but somewhat nebulous in faith. That is to say, they regard any person who specifically refuses to go to church as a heathen, but they themselves are by no means regular in attendance, and not one in ten of them could tell you whether transubstantiation is a Roman Catholic or a Dunkard doctrine. About two percent have dallied more or less gingerly with Christian science, their average period of belief being one year. The church we are in is, like the neighborhood and its people, well-to-do but not fashionable. It is Protestant in faith and probably Episcopalian. The pews are of a thick yellow-brown oak, severe in pattern and hideous in color. In each there is a long, removable cushion of a dark, purplish, dirty hue, with here and there some of its hair stuffing showing. The stained glass windows, which were all bought ready-made and depict scenes from the New Testament, commemorate the virtues of departed worthies of the neighborhood, whose names appear, in illegible black letters, in the lower panels. The floor is covered with a carpet of some tough, fibrous material, apparently a sort of grass, and along the center aisle it is much worn. The normal smell of the place is rather less unpleasant than that of most other halls, for on the one day when it is regularly crowded practically all of the persons gathered together have been very recently bathed. On this fine morning, however, it is full of heavy mortuary perfumes, for a couple of florists' men have just finished decorating the chancel with flowers and potted palms. Just behind the chancel rail, facing the center aisle, there is a prie dieu, and to either side of it are great banks of lilies, carnations, gardenias, and roses. Three or four feet behind the prie dieu and completely concealing the high altar, there is a dense jungle of palms. 
those in the front rank are authentically growing in pots, but behind them the florist's men have artfully placed some more durable and hence more profitable sophistications. Anon the reverend clergyman, emerging from the vestry room to the right, will pass along the front of this jungle to the prie dieu and so framed in flowers, face the congregation with his saponaceous smile. The florist's men, having completed their labors, are preparing to depart. The older of the two, a man in the fifties, shows the ease of an experienced hand by taking out a large plug of tobacco and gnawing off a substantial chew. The desire to spit, seizing him shortly, he proceeds to gratify it by a trick long practiced by gas fitters, musicians, caterers' helpers, piano movers, and other such alien invaders of the domestic hearth. That is to say, he hunts for a place where the carpet is loose along the chancel rail, finds it where two lengths join, deftly turns up a flap, spits upon the bare floor, and then lets the flap fall back, finally giving it a pat with the sole of his foot. This done, he and his assistant leave the church to the sexton, who has been sweeping the vestibule, and, after passing the time of day with the two men who are putting up a striped awning from the door to the curb, disappear into a nearby speakeasy, there to wait and refresh themselves until the wedding is over and it is time to take away their lilies, their carnations, and their synthetic palms. It is now a quarter past eleven, and two flappers of the neighborhood, giggling and arm in arm, approach the sexton and inquire of him if they may enter. He asks them if they have tickets, and when they say they haven't, he tells them that he ain't got no right to let them in, and don't know nothing about what the rule is going to be. At some weddings, he goes on, hardly nobody ain't allowed in, but then again, sometimes they don't scarcely look at the tickets at all. The two flappers retire, abashed, and as the sexton finishes his sweeping, there enters the organist. The organist is a tall, thin man of melancholy, uramic aspect, wearing a black slouch hat with a wide brim and a yellow overcoat that barely reaches to his knees. A pupil in his youth of a man who had once studied, irregularly and briefly, with Charles-Marie Widor, he acquired thereby the artistic temperament, and with it a vast fondness for malt liquor. His mood this morning is acidulous and depressed, for he spent yesterday evening in a Pilsner Ausschank with two former members of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, and it was 3 a.m. before they finally agreed that Johann Sebastian Bach, all things considered, was a greater man than Beethoven, and so parted amicably. Sourness is the precise sensation that wells within him. He feels vinegary. His blood runs cold. He wishes he could immerse himself in bicarbonate of soda. But the call of his art is more potent than the protest of his poisoned and quaking liver, and so he manfully climbs the spiral stairway to his organ loft. Once there, he takes off his hat and overcoat, stoops down to blow the dust off the organ keys, throws the electrical switch which sets the bellows going, and then proceeds to take off his shoes. This done, he takes his seat, reaches for the pedals with his stockinged feet, tries an experimental 32-foot subcontra C, and then wanders gently into a Bach toccata. It is his limbering up piece. He always plays it as a prelude to a wedding job. It thus goes very smoothly and even brilliantly, but when he comes to the end of it and tackles the ensuing fugue, he is quickly in difficulties, and after four or five stumbling repetitions of the subject, he hurriedly improvises a crude coda and has done. Peering down into the church to see if his flounderings have had an audience, he sees two old maids enter, the one very tall and thin, and the other somewhat brisk and bunchy. They constitute the vanguard of the nuptial throng, and as they proceed hesitatingly up the center aisle, eager for good seats but afraid to go too far, the organist wipes his palms upon his trousers' legs, squares his shoulders, and plunges into the program that he has played at all weddings for fifteen years past. It begins with Mendelssohn's spring song, Pianissimo. Then comes Rubinstein's melody in F, with a touch of forte toward the close, and then Nevin's Oh That We Two Were Maying, and then the Chopin waltz in A-flat, Opus 69, number 1, and then the spring song again, 
and then a free fantasia upon the rosary, and then a Moskowski mazurka, and then the Dvorak humoresque, with its heart-rending cry in the middle, and then some vague and turbulent thing, apparently the disjecta membra of another fugue, and then Tchaikovsky's Autumn, and then Elgar's Salut d'Amour, and then the Spring Song a third time, and then something or other from one of the Pierre Gint suites, and then an hurrah or two from the Hallelujah Chorus, and then Chopin again, and Nevin, and Elgar, and... But meanwhile, there is a growing activity below. First comes a closed automobile bearing the six ushers, and soon after it another automobile bearing the bridegroom and his best man. The bridegroom and the best man disembark before the side entrance of the church and make their way into the vestry room, where they remove their hats and coats and proceed to struggle with their cravats and collars before a mirror which hangs on the wall. The room is very dingy. A baize-covered table is in the center of it, and around the table stand six or eight chairs of assorted designs. One wall is completely covered by a bookcase, through the glass doors of which one may discern piles of cheap Bibles, hymn books, and back numbers of the parish magazine. In one corner is a small washstand. The best man takes a flat flask of whiskey from his pocket, looks about him for a glass, finds it on the washstand, rinses it at the tap, fills it with a policeman's drink, and hands it to the bridegroom. The latter downs it at a gulp. Then the best man pours out one for himself. The ushers, reaching the vestibule of the church, have handed their silk hats to the sexton and entered the sacred edifice. There was a rehearsal of the wedding last night, but after it was over the bride ordered certain incomprehensible changes in the plan, and the ushers are now completely at sea. All they know clearly is that the relatives of the bride are to be seated on one side, and the relatives of the bridegroom on the other. But which side for one and which side for the other? They discuss it heatedly for three minutes, and then find that they stand three for putting the bride's relatives on the left side, and three for putting them on the right side. The debate, though instructive, is interrupted by the sudden entrance of seven women in a group. They are headed by a truculent old battleship, possibly an aunt or something of the sort, who fixes the nearest usher with a knowing, suspicious glance, and motions to him to show her the way. He offers her his right arm, and they start up the center aisle, with the six other women following in irregular order, and the five other ushers scattered among the women. The leading usher is tortured damnably by doubts as to where the party should go. If they are aunts, to which house do they belong, and on which side are the members of that house to be seated? What if they are not aunts, but merely neighbors, or perhaps an association of former cooks, parlor maids, nurse girls, or strangers? The sufferings of the usher are relieved by the battleship, who halts majestically about twenty feet from the altar, and motions her followers into a pew to the left. They file in, silently, and she seats herself next to the aisle. All seven settle back and wriggle for room. It is a tight fit. Who, in point of fact, are these ladies? Don't ask the question. The ushers never find out. No one ever finds out. They remain a joint mystery for all time. In the end, they become a sort of tradition, and years hence, when two of the ushers meet, they will cackle over old Dreadnought and her six cruisers. The bride, grown old and fat, will tell the tale to her daughter, and then to her granddaughter. It will grow more and more strange, marvelous, incredible. Variorum versions will spring up. It will be adapted to other weddings. The dreadnought will become an apparition, a witch, the devil in skirts. And as the years pass, the date of the episode will be pushed back. By 2017, it will be dated 1150. By 2475, it will take on a sort of sacred character, and there will be a footnote referring to it in the latest revised version of the New Testament. It is now a quarter to twelve, and of a sudden the vestibule fills with wedding guests. Nine-tenths of them, perhaps even nineteen-twentieths, are women, and most of them are beyond thirty-five. Scattered among them, hanging on to their skirts, are about a dozen little girls, one of them a youngster of eight or thereabout, with spindle shanks and shining morning face, entranced by her first wedding. Here and there lurks a man. Usually he wears a hurried, unwilling, protesting look. 
he has been dragged from his office on a busy morning, forced to rush home and get into his cutaway coat, and then marched to the church by his wife. One of these men, much hustled, has forgotten to have his shoes shined. He is intensely conscious of them, and tries to hide them behind his wife's skirt as they walk up the aisle. Accidentally, he steps upon it and gets a look over the shoulder, which lifts his diaphragm an inch and turns his liver to water. This man will be court-martialed when he reaches home, and he knows it. He wishes that some foreign power would invade the United States and burn down all the churches in the country, and that the bride, the bridegroom, and all the other persons interested in the present wedding were dead and in hell. The ushers do their best to seat these wedding guests in some sort of order, but after a few minutes the crowd at the doors becomes so large that they have to give it up, and thereafter all they can do is hold out their right arms ingratiatingly and trust to luck. One of them steps on a fat woman's skirt, tearing it very badly, and she has to be helped back to the vestibule. There she seeks refuge in a corner under a stairway leading up to the steeple, and essays to repair the damage with pins produced from various nooks and crevices of her person. Meanwhile the guilty usher stands in front of her, mumbling apologies and trying to look helpful. When she finishes her work and emerges from her improvised dry dock, he again offers her his arm but she sweeps past him without noticing him and proceeds grandly to a seat far forward. She is a cousin to the bride's mother and will make a report to every branch of the family that all six ushers disgraced the ceremony by appearing at it far gone in liquor. Fifteen minutes are consumed by such episodes and divertisements. By the time the clock in the steeple strikes twelve, the church is well filled. The music of the organist, who has now reached Mendelssohn's spring song for the third and last time, is accompanied by a huge buzz of whispers, and there is much craning of necks and long-distance nodding and smiling. Here and there an unusually gorgeous hat is the target of many converging glances, and of as many more or less satirical criticisms. To the damp funeral smell of the flowers at the altar there has been added the cacoterous scents of forty or fifty different brands of talcum and rice powder. It begins to grow warm in the church, and a number of women open their vanity bags and duck down for stealthy dabs at their noses. Others, more reverent, suffer the agony of augmenting shines. One, a trickster, has concealed powder in her pocket handkerchief and applies it dexterously while pretending to blow her nose. The bridegroom in the vestry room, entering upon the second year, or is it the third, of his long and ghastly wait, grows increasingly nervous, and when he hears the organist pass from the spring song into some more sonorous and stately thing, he mistakes it for the wedding march from Lohengrin, and is hot for marching upon the altar at once. The best man, an old hand, restrains him gently, and administers another sedative from the bottle. The bridegroom's thoughts turn to gloomy things. He remembers sadly that he will never be able to laugh at Benedict's again, that his days of low Rabelaisian wit and carefree scoffing are over, that he is now the very thing he mocked so gaily but yesteryear. Like a drowning man, he passes his whole life in review, not, however, that part which is past, but that part which is to come. Odd fancies throng upon him. He wonders what his honeymoon will cost him, what there will be to drink at the wedding breakfast, what a certain girl in Chicago will say when she hears of his marriage. Will there be any children? He rather hopes not, for all those he knows appear so greasy and noisy, but he decides that he might conceivably compromise on a boy. But how is he going to make sure that it will not be a girl? The thing as yet is a medical impossibility, but medicine is making rapid strides. Why not wait until the secret is discovered? This sapient compromise pleases the bridegroom, and he proceeds to a consideration of various problems of finance. And then, of a sudden, the organist swings unmistakably into Lohengrin, and the best man grabs him by the arm. There is now great excitement in the church. The bride's mother, two sisters, three brothers, and three sisters-in-law have just marched up the center aisle and taken seats in the front pew, and all the women in the place are craning their necks toward the door. The usual electrical delay ensues. There is something the matter with the bride's train, and the two bridesmaids have a deuce of a time fixing it. 
Meanwhile, the bride's father, in tight pantaloons and tighter gloves, fidgets and fumes in the vestibule, the six ushers crowd about him inanely, and the sexton rushes to and fro like a rat in a trap. Finally, all being ready, with the ushers formed to abreast, the sexton pushes a button, a small buzzer sounds in the organ loft, and the organist, as has been said, plunges magnificently into the fanfare of the Lohengrin march. Simultaneously, the sexton opens the door at the bottom of the main aisle, and the wedding procession gets under way. The bride and her father march first. Their step is so slow, about one beat to two measures, that the father has some difficulty in maintaining his equilibrium, but the bride herself moves steadily and erectly, almost seeming to float. Her face is thickly encrusted with talcum in its various forms, so that she is almost a dead white. She keeps her eyelids lowered modestly, but is still acutely aware of every glance fastened upon her, not in the mass, but every glance individually. For example, she sees clearly, even through her eyelids, the still, cold smile of a girl in Pew 8R, a girl who once made an unwomanly attempt upon the bridegroom's affections, and was routed and put to flight by superior strategy. And her ears are open, too. She hears every, how sweet, and, oh, lovely, and, ain't she pale, from the latitude of the last pew to the very glacis of the altar of God. While she has thus made her progress up the hymeneal chute, the bridegroom and his best man have emerged from the vestry room and begun the short march to the prie -dieu. They walk haltingly, clumsily, uncertainly, stealing occasional glances at the advancing bridal party. The bridegroom feels of his lower right-hand waistcoat pocket. The ring is still there. The best man wriggles his cuffs. No one, however, pays any heed to them. They are not even seen, indeed, until the bride and her father reach the open space in front of the altar. There, the bride and the bridegroom find themselves standing side by side, but not a word is exchanged between them, nor even a look of recognition. They stand motionless, contemplating the ornate cushion at their feet, until the bride's father and the bridesmaids file to the left of the bride, and the ushers, now wholly disorganized and imbecile, drape themselves in an irregular file along the altar rail. Then, the music having died down to a faint murmur, and a hush having fallen upon the assemblage, they look up. Before them, framed by foliage, stands the reverend gentleman of God, who will presently link them in indissoluble chains, the estimable rector of the parish. He has got there just in time. It was, indeed, a close shave. But no trace of haste or of anything else of a disturbing character is now visible, upon his smooth, glistening, somewhat feverish face. That face is wholly occupied by his official smile, a thing of oil and honey all compact, a balmy, unctuous illumination, the secret of his success in life. Slowly his cheeks puff out, gleaming like soap bubbles. Slowly he lifts his prayer book from the prie -dieu and holds it droopingly. Slowly his soft, caressing eyes engage it. There is an almost imperceptible stiffening of his frame. His mouth opens with a faint click. He begins to read. The ceremony of marriage has begun. End of The Wedding Read for LibriVox.org by Ben Adams The Yellow Drawing Room by Mona Caird. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ginny. I approach this episode in my life, which presents itself to my memory thus entitled, with dislike mingled with fascination. I hate the whole subject, but I can't leave it alone. Those accursed three weeks, spent under the same roof with Venora Hayden, seemed to have deprived me of myself, unhinged me, destroyed the balance of my character. I feel as if I might, perhaps, throw off this absurd spell 
by calmly smoothing out the ruffled memories and studying them scientifically. The Nora's aunt, Miss Clementina Thorne, was a nice, appreciative old maiden lady, who thought me the most estimable and charming of men. I had long regarded her with warm affection, tempered only by a mild resentment at her perpetual attempts to get me married. In her pressing invitation to come once more to Fairfield, where the fresh air would be so good for me after my dusty and dingy office, I read at sight that another matrimonial scheme was fermenting in that most hymeneal brain. I knew that this time she had destined me for one of her nieces, as she mentioned that they had no visitors at present, and that Venora would be at home though i had hovered about clara with vague admiration for over a year i had never yet seen venora her aunt mentioned in her much underlined epistle that her brother-in-law since his dear wife's death had let the girls have too much of their own way and that venora who had received permission to decorate and furnish the drawing-room at fairfield exactly as she pleased had unworthily employed her liberty by producing a room of brilliant yellow I had a prejudice against Venora, and this last freak made me think none the better of her. Evidently she was rather a headstrong and probably affected young person. Everyone said that she liked to make herself conspicuous, and that you never knew what she was going to do next. I hate that sort of girl. The true woman is retiring, unobtrusive, indistinguishable even, until you come to know her well and then she is very much like what every other true woman would be under the same conditions i had pronounced views in these matters as for the yellow drawing-room i was anxious to see just how far venora's mania to be out of the common had carried her in this instance arrived at fairfield i was at once shown into the notorious drawing-room it was yellow the colour had been washed out of the very daffodils which looked green with jealousy the sunshine was confronted in a spirit of respectful independence brotherhood being acknowledged but the principle of equality uncompromisingly asserted miss thorne sadly shook her head we want my brother-in-law to have the room done over again mr st vincent but he won't hear of it we did all we could with venora we told her that nobody used such a brilliant colour but she only said that she found nobody when you came to talk to him seriously was a person quite open to reason dear venora is so quaint her taste seems to be rather quaint i said several visitors were passionately admiring the prospect the pictures the chairs and tables anything to protect themselves against a threatening summons to say something about the general colouring miss thorne seemed to be piteously endeavouring by her manners her attire her sentiments to atone for that unpardonable drawing-room the sisters also Mary and Clara were doing their best in the same direction, but hopeless was their protest. The room was in a glow of golden light. No ladylike antidote, however strong, could lead one to ignore it. It was radiant, bold, unapologetic, unabashed. It was not the room that my ideal woman would have created. My ideal woman would unfailingly choose a nice tone of grey-blue. Certain suspicions which I had harbored that Clara Hayden was my ideal woman grew stronger as I watched her quiet English face bent over the tea-tray. I liked the straightforward look of the girl, her blue eyes and fair complexion. If I was to give up my liberty, the rein should be handed over to a kind, sensible young woman like Clara, who would hate to make herself remarkable or her drawing-room yellow. I think the hot afternoon sun and the unceasing sound of Aunt Clementina's voice must have made me drowsy for i was thinking mistily what a wonderfully and conspicuously clean girl clara hayden was when the door opened and i found myself floundering i cannot do more than describe these dreamy impressions in an ocean of laughter in my efforts to keep my head above water i discovered rather sharply that i had upset my tea which clara's exceedingly clean fingers had just poured out for me this brought me to my senses i appear to be graduating for an idiot i exclaimed furious at my clumsiness and stupidity venora laughed in a friendly manner we have all been yearning to get rid of this cup she said and we really feel grateful to you for your opportune assistance in the few bewildering moments of apology and reassurance i found myself presented emphatically to venora and lightly indicated to a dark and lank young man who followed her into the room 
but Nora herself was simply radiant. She had a mass of glistening golden hair, a color full, varying, emotional, eyes like the sea. I lose my temper when people ask me to describe their color. In figure she was robust, erect, pliant, firmly knit. Though her movements were so swift, there was nothing restless about her. A ground tone of repose sounded up through the surface scintillations. She was vital, not galvanic. That was the revealing word, vital. In the human color spectrum, she took the place of the yellow ray. This was all out of keeping. According to my doctrines, it was even impossible. Women ought to take the place of the blue or violet rays. In my scheme of the universe, they always did so, except in the case of a distinctly unwomanly woman. But this, in spite of offending against every canon I had ever set up, Venora certainly was not. She was supremely, overpoweringly womanly. The womanhood of her sisters paled before the exuberant feminine quality which I could not but acknowledge in Venora. Everything was wrong and contradictory. I seemed to be taking part in some comedy of errors, wherein Venora played Columbine and I, the part of fool, I began grimly to suspect. For already, I shrugged my shoulders at myself in contemptuous despair. I found that I hated the lank young man who had been introduced as Mr. George Inglis, simply and solely because I saw that he was head over ears in love with Venora, and that she treated him with a sort of indescribable good fellowship, mingled with a peculiar tenderness. I never saw anything to equal Venora's tenderness when she was moved that way. I hear, Miss Venora, I said, that the credit of this room is entirely yours. The lank admirer looked around. Venora glanced at me alertly. You have every reason to be proud, I continued, determined not to spare her. You must have surprised more people than you could easily count, though I have no wish to impugn your arithmetic. They will all be grateful to you for a new sensation. Forgive me for disagreeing with you, she said. It is so easy to surprise people. They are so amiable. They keep themselves always prepared for astonishment. They are like a sensitized plate which is ready at a moment's notice to be surprised into a photograph. You come with your dogma, or your self-evident fact, or simply your pot of yellow paint, and behold, forth springs the various amazements. Oh, no, thanking you all the same, I am not proud. I raised my eyebrows witheringly. My ideal woman would consider it almost indelicate to play with words in this fantastic fashion. I glanced at my grey-blue goddess. How comfortably certain one felt with her of enjoying conversational repose. Dear Clara, with what admirable good taste she carried out one's cherished ideas. She fitted them like a glove. I completely, ardently approved of Clara. To her I rather ostentatiously devoted myself for the rest of the afternoon but I was furtively watching her sister. And now I come to the disagreeable and inexplicable part of my broken and absurd episode. I know not to this day why or wherefore, but Fenora began to exercise over me an extraordinary fascination. If there were any other word, I would use it, but I cannot find one. I fell into the strangest and most contradictory state of mind. Fenora's personality seemed to enwrap me as a garment, she was like some great radiating center of light and warmth. I was penetrated with the glowing atmosphere. I never approved of the girl. I don't believe that I then liked her. I know that I often hated her, and yet I felt miserable out of her sight. She became a necessity to me. A feeling of misery, which I cannot describe, assailed me in her absence. A sick feeling of senseless despair. I used to pace the terrace among the peacocks. The boys impertinently insisted that they were unable on such occasions to distinguish me from those conceited birds, and as I thus worked off some of my restlessness, I tried to understand what had happened to me. One morning after breakfast, Venora came out onto the terrace. She walked straight up to me and said, Good morning. I think you want to talk to me, don't you? I looked at her in despair. If she lived and improved for a thousand years, she would never be an ideal woman. You disapprove of me, Venora continued calmly. I wish you would tell me why. You really wish me to be frank, I said, stopping and facing her. I really do, she replied, offering crumbs of bread to a haughty peacock, who eyed them superciliously. Well then, Miss Hayden, your blood be upon your own head. Beautiful was that golden head in the morning light. 
you seem to me to have many qualities and ideas that are not suited to your sex no doubt i am old-fashioned about these things but i confess that i cannot rejoice when i see our beautiful ideals of womanhood set scornfully at naught no said Panora, do go on i scarcely know how to approach a subject of which you do not seem to understand the rudiments i said severely this interests me cried Venora. i particularly desire to be awakened on this drowsy side of me i can't bear to be blind and stupid i want very much to be shown at least the gates of realms that are forbidden to me the sacred realms where woman is queen will soon be forbidden to you if you consistently continue to think and act in disharmony with the feminine nature and genius that is what aunt clementina and mr barnes so often tell me mr barnes is our clergyman but at present the threat of being excluded from the realms you mention does not terrify me i rather prefer the realms where woman is not queen a mistake a mistake i exclaimed yes so i am told but often people don't know what is good for them i have heard of persons of mature judgment who had a chance of going straight off to heaven to play on golden harps and wear a halo hanging back and sending for the doctor in a strongly ill-advised manner of course we shall all have to go to the realms where woman is queen but for myself i confess to a weak inclination to postpone or let us say not to anticipate my royalty the suspicion is clearly blamable but what if i should happen to get tired of the everlasting harping but nora's face was perfectly serious miss hayden i said gravely and sadly you may have a brilliant career in the future but the more brilliant the more complete will be your failure the more i shall mourn the loss of a real woman from the spheres where she was intended to create and to maintain those sacred ties and sentiments without which this world would be a howling wilderness but nora tossed another crumb to the supercilious peacock do go on she repeated if women only realized where their true power lay and how mighty was that power they would never seek to snatch it in directions where they are inevitably weak and if i must say it inevitably ridiculous i was born to be ridiculous said venora my father never sought to arrange a sphere for me and in my case instinct seems at fault at one time i used to make a credible number of antimacassars and sofa cushions and to this day my sisters do all that can possibly be required of a well-conducted family and what is especially satisfactory from a popular point of view they think a baby far more interesting than a grown-up creature with a soul or even than a child who can think and feel they are keeping up the feminine traditions admirably don't you think it would be a little monotonous if i were to go over exactly the same ground it seems to me that that ground is getting rather trodden in i am sorry to hear you sneer at your good and charming sisters and at the true instincts of your sex venora burst out laughing <laughs> oh mr st vincent you really are a little stupid sometimes she said she turned and i saw a change come into her face as george inglis appeared from the wood at the far end of the terrace and walked towards us that filled me with unaccountable fury my critical mood which i had maintained with no little difficulty fell off me and i was swaying as a wind-tossed reed with strange uncontrollable emotion you don't know what it has cost me to speak to you thus i said catching her hand you interest me you yes i must say it you fascinate me and it distresses me maddens me to feel myself led away by qualities which ought to repel me the attraction is morbid unwholesome i am angry with myself for even feeling it venora you must release me release you she repeated what do you mean i mean i replied crazily that you must learn to love me and to be a woman in the old sweet sense for my sake you are very naive she said smiling you seem just now to me like a nice egotistical child i turned abruptly away i knew that george inglis joined her and that they walked down the terrace together i suppose i must have been in love with her yet all the time i seemed to hate her i longed to make her yield to me to love me with a lowly uplooking love i had a burning desire to subdue her she seemed to evade me and my theories as if she were a creature from another sphere i cannot describe the irritation of mind which all this caused me i set about my wooing as if i had been going to fight a duel shortly after this to my intense disgust 
I found that George Inglis had discovered my accursed secret. I chanced to overhear him saying to Miss Thorne, The contest is a typical one. If one could imagine the eighteenth century as a lover wooing the nineteenth century, this is the sort of angular, labyrinthian courtship we should have. I wondered what the chattering fool meant by it. She shall love me, and she shall learn, through love, the sweet lesson of womanly submission, I said to myself, all the dominating instincts of my manhood roused into activity by this hateful experience. I felt that she was utterly wrong, that she had mistaken her own powers and her own noblest impulses. It was for me, through the might of an overwhelming affection, to set alight the true womanly flame within her heart. I would make her proud of her subordination. I would turn the splendid stream of her powers and affection into the true channel. After a day or two of lover-like devotion, I began to slacken in my pursuit, and to transfer my attentions to Clara. Clara became a new creature. Her expression softened, her eyes brightened, but I was too absorbed in my own little drama to consider what part Clara might be likely to play in it. I watched Venora secretly. She seemed depressed and restless. My heart bounded. Venora was jealous, a woman after the old eternal pattern, therefore to be won. Dear, erratic, foolish, brilliant Venora, you shall be brought back safe and sound to your true destiny. I followed her to the garden, whither I knew she had gone to gather flowers. Very lovely she looked in her white dress, with a bunch of daffodils in her belt. I plunged headlong. Venora, I love you. I want to know my fate. Me? she said with a gasp of astonishment. I thought it was Clara. I clasped her hands. I protested. I told her how my love for her had overwhelmed and shattered me. And Clara? she repeated in dismay. Did she not understand? It was out of pique to make her jealous. When I become jealous of my sisters, said Venora, with a quiet and scornful aloofness, you can come and preach me your doctrines. I shall understand them then. Venora! At present they seem to me like soap bubbles, full of emptiness. But you don't understand. True, she returned, they have never before assailed me in this stiff-backed fashion. I offend against them unconsciously. My father never constrained me to move in any particular direction because of my sex. He has perhaps spoiled me. I have hitherto had only a joyous sense of drawing in what was outside, and radiating out what was within me. When you describe your doctrines, I seem to see the doors of a dark prison opening out of the sunshine, and— Strange to say, I feel no divine, unerring instinct prompting me to walk in. I offer you no prison but a home, I cried excitedly. You would turn all homes into prisons, she returned. Prisons whose bars are the golden bars of love and duty. Yes, you take a woman's love and duty, and fashion out of them her prison bars. Is that generous? I fancy not, but it is most ingenious. It is loyal-esque. But I don't like even golden bars, Mr. St. Vincent. You have evidently not a spark of love for me, I cried distractedly. Her face suddenly changed. Ah, that is the horrible absurdity of it, she exclaimed, coloring painfully. You enthrall one part of me, and leave the other scornful and indifferent. We have scarcely a thought in common, but I am miserable when you are absent. Stop, don't misunderstand. Your gods and goddesses are to me creatures of pasteboard. Your world of belief seems to me like a realm fashioned out of tissue paper. She spoke with breathless rapidity, and she was quivering from head to foot. To live with you would be like living in a tomb. I lack the sense of fresh air, and there is no sunshine within miles of you. Yet, when I am not with you, there is a sort of ache. Your personality seems to fascinate me. I wish to heaven you had never come here. You have disturbed my happiness, destroyed my delight in life, left me miserably dependent on you, yet to the end of time I should continue to shock and irritate you, and you would stifle, depress, and perhaps utterly unhinge me. I wish you would go, today, now. She looked white and distraught. I pleaded like a lunatic, argued, urged. For one supreme moment my arms were round her, and I thought that she would yield, but whether or not a triumph was in store for me I shall never know, for suddenly we both started in dismay. Before us, pausing abruptly as she came round the bend of the laurel shrubberies, stood Clara. I shall never forget the look on her face at that moment. 
it was like that of some gentle animal mortally and wantonly wounded without a word clara turned away and venora and i stood in silence at last slowly moving away venora spoke i can forgive you the injury you have done to me that you could not help and the fault after all is my own but i can never forgive what you have done to clara she passed out of sight and i stood spellbound i never saw venora again i left fairfield immediately and i heard that she and her sister had gone abroad i could not find out where they were nor had i the temerity to think of following them I knew that fate had no reprieve for me. The episode remains in my mind as a haunting, incomprehensible dream. Ponder as I may, I cannot understand what impulses of our nature Venora and I had power mutually to set at variance, what irresistible attraction we had for one another combined with what inevitable antipathy. We could never have lived together. I see that now. Yet when the memory of those ten days returns to torment me, I feel that neither can we live apart. I have never been the same man since I met Venora. I am neither my former self, complete and comfortable, nor am I thoroughly a new being. I am a sort of abortive creature, striding between two centuries. The spirit of a coming age has brushed me with his wing, but I resent and resist that which brings havoc into the citadel of my dearest beliefs, and I angrily pluck off the tiny feather which he dropped from those great ploughing pinions of his that shadow the firmament of the future end of the yellow drawing room by mona card old lady mandel by edna farber this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org reading by matt Perard old lady mandel by edna ferber old lady mandel was a queen her domain undisputed was a six-room flat on south park avenue chicago her faithful servitress was anna an ancient person of polish nativity bad teeth and a cunning hand at cookery not so cunning however but that old lady mandel's was more artful still in such matters as meat soups broad noodles fish with egg sauce and the like as ladies-in-waiting flattering yet jealous admiring though resentful she had mrs lamb mrs brunswick and mrs wormser themselves old ladies and erstwhile queens now deposed and the crown jewel in old lady mandel's diadem was my son hugo mrs mandel was not only a queen but a spoiled old lady and not only a spoiled old lady but a confessedly spoiled old lady bridling and wagging her white head she admitted her pampered state it was less an admission than a boast her son hugo had spoiled her this too she acknowledged my son hugo spoils me she would say and there was no proper humbleness in her voice though he was her only son she never spoke of him merely as hugo or my son but always as my son hugo she rolled the three words on her tongue as though they were delicious morsels from which she would extract all possible savour and sweetness and when she did this you could almost hear the click of the stiffening spines of mrs lamb mrs brunswick and mrs wormser for they envied her her son hugo and resented him as only three old ladies could who were living tolerated and dependent with their married sons and their sons wives any pleasant summer afternoon at four o'clock you might have seen mrs mantle holding court the four old women sat a decent black silk row on a shady bench in washington park near the refectory and afternoon coffee Three of them complained about their daughters-in-law. One of them bragged about her son. Adjective, crowding adjective, pride in her voice, majesty in her mien. She bragged about my son Hugo. My son Hugo had no wife. Not only that, Hugo Mandel, at forty, had no thought of marrying. Not that there was anything austere or saturnine about Hugo. 
he made you think somehow of a cherubic jovial monk it may have been his rosy rotundity or perhaps the way in which his thinning hair vanished altogether at the top of his head so as to form a tonsure hugo mandel kindly generous shrewd spoiled his old mother in the way in which women of seventy whose middle life has been hard like to be spoiled first of all of course she reigned unchecked over the south park avenue flat she quarrelled wholesomely and regularly with polish anna alternately she threatened anna with dismissal and anna threatened ma mandel with impending departure this had been going on comfortably for fifteen years ma mandel held the purse and her son filled it hugo paid everything from the rent to the iceman and this without once making his mother feel a beneficiary she possessed an infinitesimal income of her own left her out of the ruins of her dead husband's money but this hugo always waved aside did she essay to pay for her own movie ticket or an ice cream soda now now none of that ma your money's no good to-night when he returned from a new york business trip he usually brought her two gifts one practical the other absurd she kissed him for the first and scolded him for the second but it was the absurdity fashioned of lace or silk or fragile stuff that she pridefully displayed to her friends look what my son hugo brought me i should wear a thing like that in my old days but it's beautiful anyway hmm? he's got taste my son hugo in the cool of the evening you saw them taking a slow and solemn walk together his hand on her arm he surprised her with matinee tickets in pairs telling her to treat one of her friends on anna's absent thursdays he always offered to take dinner downtown he brought her pound boxes of candy tied with sly loops and bands of gay satin ribbon which she carefully rolled and tucked away in a drawer he praised her cooking and teased her with elephantine playfulness and told her that she looked like a chicken in that hat oh yes indeed mrs mandel was a spoiled old lady at half past one she always prepared to take her nap in the quiet of her neat flat she would select a plump after-lunch chocolate from the box in her left-hand bureau drawer take off her shoes and settle her old frame in comfort no noisy grandchildren to disturb her rest no fault-finding daughter-in-law to bustle her out of the way the sounds that anna made moving about in the kitchen at the far end of the long hall were the subdued homely swishings and brushings that lulled and soothed rather than irritated at half past two she rose refreshed dressed herself in her dotted swiss with its rose of vow or in black silk modish both she was in fact a modish old lady as were her three friends they were not the ultra-modern type of old lady who at sixty apes sixteen they were neat and rather tart-tongued septuagenarians guiltless of artifice their soft white hair was dressed neatly and craftily so as to conceal the thinning spots that revealed the pink scalp beneath their corsets and their stomachs were too high perhaps for fashion and their heavy brooches and chains and rings appeared clumsy when compared to the hoar-frost tracery of the platinum smith's exquisite art but their skirts had pleased when pleated skirts were worn and their sleeves were snug when snug sleeves were decreed they were inclined to cling over long to a favorite leather reticule scuffed and shapeless as an old shoe but they could hold their own at bridge on a rainy afternoon in matters of material and cut mrs mantle triumphed her lace was likely to be real where that of the other three was imitation so there they sat on a park bench in the pleasant afternoon air filling their lives with emptiness they had married and brought children into the world sacrificed for them managed a household been widowed they represented magnificent achievement those four old women 
though they themselves did not know it. They had come up the long hill, reached its apex, and come down. Their journey was over, and yet they sat by the roadside. They knew that which could have helped younger travelers over the next hill, but those fleet-footed ones pressed on, wanting none of their wisdom. Ma Mandel, alone, still moved. She still queened it over her own household. She alone still had the delightful task of making a man comfortable. If the world passed them by as they sat there, it did not pass unscathed. Their shrewd old eyes regarded the panorama undeceived. They did not try to keep up with the procession, but they derived a sly amusement and entertainment from their observation of the modes and manners of this amazing day and age. Perhaps it was well that this plump matron in the overtight skirt or that miss mincing on four-inch heels could not hear the caustic comment of the white-haired four sitting so mildly on the bench at the side of the path their talk stray as it might always came back to two subjects they seemed never to tire of them three talked of their daughters-in-law and bitterness rasped their throats one talked of her son and her voice was unctuous with pride. "'My son's wife,' one of the three would begin. There was something terribly significant in the mock respect with which she uttered the title. "'If I had ever thought,' Mrs. Brunswick would say, shaking her head, "'if I had ever thought that I would live to see the day when I had to depend on strangers for my comfort, I would have wished myself dead.' You wouldn't call your son a stranger, Mrs. Brunswick, in shocked tones from Mrs. Mantel. A stranger has got more consideration. I count for nothing, less than nothing. I'm in the way. I don't interfere in that household. I see enough, and I hear enough, but I say nothing. My son's wife, she says it all. A silence, thoughtful, brooding. Then, from Mrs. Wormser, what good do you have of your children? They grow up, and what do you have of them? More shaking of heads, and a dark murmur about the advisability of an old people's home as a refuge. Then, my son Hugo said only yesterday, Ma, he said, when it comes to housekeeping, you could teach them all something, believe me. Why, he says, if I was to try and get a cup of coffee like this in a restaurant, well, you couldn't get it in a restaurant, that's all. You couldn't get it in any hotel, Michigan Avenue, or I don't care where. Goaded, Mrs. Lamb would look up from her knitting. Mark my words, he'll marry yet. She was a sallow, lively woman, her hair still markedly streaked with black. Her rheumatism-twisted fingers were always grotesquely busy with some handiwork, and the finished product was a marvel of perfection. Mrs. Wormser, plump, placid, agreed. That's the kind always marries late, and they get it the worse. Say, my son was no spring chicken, either, when he married, and you would think the sun rises and sets in his wife. Well, I suppose it's only natural, but you wait. Some girl is going to have a snap, Mrs. Brunswick, eager peering a trifle vindictive offered final opinion the girls aren't going to let a boy like your hugo get away not nowadays the way they run after them like crazy all they think about is dress and a good time the three smiled grimly ma mandel smiled too a little nervously her fingers creasing and uncreasing a fold of her black silk skirt as she made airy answer if i've said once i've said a million times to my son hugo hugo why don't you pick out some nice girl and settle down i won't be here always and he says getting tired of me are you ma i guess maybe you're looking for a younger fellow only last night i said at the table hugo when are you going to get married and he laughed when i find somebody that can cook dumplings like these Pass me another, Ma. That's all very well, said Mrs. Wormser. 
but when the right one comes along he won't know dumplings from mud oh a man of forty isn't such a he's just like a man of twenty-five only worse mrs mandel would rise abruptly well i guess you all know my son hugo better than his own mother how about a cup of coffee ladies they would proceed solemnly and eagerly to the columned coolness of the park refectory where they would drink their thick creamy coffee they never knew perhaps how keenly they counted on that cup of coffee or how hungrily they drank it their minds unconsciously were definitely fixed on the four o'clock drink that stimulated the old nerves life had not always been so plumply upholstered for old lady mandel she had known its sharp corners and cruel edges at twenty-three a strong healthy fun-loving girl she had married herman mandel a dour man twenty-two years her senior in their twenty-five years of married life together hattie mandel never had had a five-cent piece that she could call her own her husband was reputed to be wealthy and probably was according to the standards of that day there were three children etta the oldest a second child a girl who died and hugo her husband's miserliness and the grind of the planning scheming and contriving necessary to clothe and feed her two children would have crushed the spirit of many women but hard and glum as her old husband was he never quite succeeded in subduing her courage or her love of fun the habit of heartbreaking economy clung to her however even when days of plenty became hers it showed in little hoarding ways in the saving of burned matches of bits of ribbon of scraps of food of the very furniture and linen as though when these were gone no more would follow ten years after her marriage her husband retired from active business he busied himself now with his real estate with mysterious papers documents agents he was forever poking around the house at hours when a household should be manless, grumbling about the waste where there was none, peering into bread boxes, prying into corners never meant for masculine eyes. Etta, the girl, was like him, sharp-nosed, ferret-faced, stingy. The mother and the boy turned to each other. In a wordless way, they grew very close, those two it was as if they were silently matched against the father and daughter it was a queer household brooding sinister like something created in a bronte brain the two children were twenty-four and twenty-two when the financial avalanche of ninety-three thundered across the continent sweeping herman mandel a mere speck into the debris stocks and bonds and real estate became paper with paper value he clawed about with frantic clutching fingers but his voice was lost in the shrieks of thousands more hopelessly hurt you saw him sitting for hours together with a black tin box in front of him pawing over papers scribbling down figures muttering the bleak future that confronted them had little of terror for hattie mandel it presented no contrast with the bleakness of the past on the day that she came upon him his head fallen at a curious angle against the black tin box his hands a sprawl clutching the papers that strewed the table she was appalled not at what she found but at the leap her heart gave at what she found herman mandel's sudden death was one of the least of the tragedies that trailed in the wake of the devastating panic thus it was that hugo mandel at twenty-three became the head of a household he did not need to seek work from the time he was seventeen he had been employed in a large china importing house starting as a stock boy brought up under the harsh circumstances of hugo's youth a boy becomes food for the reformatory or takes on the seriousness and responsibility of middle age in hugo's case the second was true from his father he had inherited a mathematical mind and a sense of material values from his mother a certain patience and courage 
though he never attained her iron indomitability. It had been a terrific struggle. His salary at twenty-three was most modest, but he was getting on. He intended to be a buyer some day and take trips abroad to the great Austrian and French and English China houses. The day after the funeral, he said to his mother, Well, now we've got to get Etta married, but married well. Somebody who'll take care of her. You're a good son, Hugo, Mrs. Mantle had said. Hugo shook his head. It isn't that. If she's comfortable and happy, or as happy as she knows how to be, she'll never come back. That's what I want. There's debts to pay, too. But I guess we'll get along. They did get along but at snail's pace. There followed five years of economy so rigid as to make the past seem profligate. Etta, the acid-tongued, the ferret-faced, was not the sort to go off without the impetus of a dowry. The man for Etta, the shrew, must be kindly, long-suffering, subdued, and in need of a start. He was. They managed a very decent trousseau and the miracle of five thousand dollars in cash. Every stitch in the trousseau and every penny in the dowry represented incredible sacrifice and self-denial on the part of mother and brother. Etta went off to her new home in Pittsburgh with her husband. She had expressed thanks for nothing and had bickered with her mother to the last. But even Hugo knew that her suit and hat and gloves and shoes were right. She was almost handsome in them, the unwanted flush of excitement coloring her cheeks, brightening her eyes. The next day, Hugo came home with a new hat for his mother, a four-pound steak, and the announcement that he was going to take music lessons. A new era had begun in the life of Ma Mandel. Two people, no matter how far apart in years or tastes, cannot struggle side by side like that in a common cause without forging between them a bond indissoluble. Hugo, at twenty-eight, had the serious mien of a man of forty. At forty he was to revert to his slighted twenty-eight, but he did not know that then. His music lessons were his one protest against a beauty-starved youth. He played rather surprisingly well, the cheap music of the day, wagging his head, already threatening baldness, in a professional vaudeville manner, and squinting up through his cigar smoke, happily. His mother, seated in the room, sewing, would say, Play that again, Hugo. That's beautiful. What's the name of that? He would tell her, for the dozenth time, and play it over, she humming, off-key, in his wake. The relation between them was more than that of mother and son. It was a complex thing that had in it something conjugal. When Hugo kissed his mother with a resounding smack and assured her that she looked like a kid, she would push him away with little futile shoves, pat her hair into place, and pretend annoyance. Go away, you big rough thing, she would cry, but all unconsciously she got from it a thrill that her husband's withered kisses had never given her. Twenty years had passed since Etta's marriage. Hugo's salary was a comfortable thing now, even in these days of soaring prices. The habit of economy, so long a necessity, had become almost a vice in old Lady Mandel. Hugo, with the elasticity of younger years, learned to spend freely, but his mother's thrift and shrewdness automatically swelled his savings. When he was on the road, as he sometimes was for weeks at a time, she spent only a tithe of the generous sum he left with her. She and Anna ate those sketchy meals that obtain in a manless household. When Hugo was home, the table was abundant and even choice, though Ma Mandel often went blocks out of her way to save three cents on a bunch of new beets. So strong is usage. She would no more have wasted his money than she would have knifed him in the dark. She ran the household capably, but her way was the old-fashioned way. Sometimes Hugo used to protest, aghast at some petty act of parsimony. 
But, Ma, what do you want to scrimp like that for? You're the worst tightwad I ever saw. Here, take this tin and blow it. You're worse than the squirrels in the park. Darned if you ain't. She couldn't resist the tin. Neither could she resist showing it next day to Mrs. Brunswick, Mrs. Lamb, and Mrs. Wormser. How my son Hugo spoils me. He takes out a ten-dollar bill, and he stuffs it into my hand and says, Ma, you're the worst tightwad I ever saw. She laughed contentedly, but she did not blow the ten. As she grew older, Hugo regularly lied to her about the price of theater tickets, dainties, articles of dress, railway fares, luxuries. Her credulity increased with age, shrewd, though she naturally was. It was a second blooming for Ma Mandel. When he surprised her with an evening at the theater, she would fuss before her mirror for a full hour. Some gal, Hugo would shout when finally she had merged. Everybody will be asking who the old man is you're out with. First thing I know, I'll have a policewoman after me for going around with a chicken. Don't talk foolishness. But she would flush like a bride. She liked a musical comedy with a lot of girls in it and a good-looking tenor. Next day, you would hear her humming the catch tune in an airy falsetto. Sometimes she wondered about him. She was, after all, a rather wise old lady, and she knew something of men. She had a secret horror of his becoming what she called fast. Why don't you take out some nice young girl instead of an old woman like me, Hugo? Any girl would be only too glad. But in her heart was a dread. She thought of Mrs. Lamb, Mrs. Wormser, and Mrs. Brunswick. So they had gone on, year after year, in the comfortable flat on South Park Avenue. A pleasant thing, life. And then Hugo married, suddenly, breathlessly, as a man of forty does. Afterward, Ma Mandel could recall almost nothing from which she might have taken warning. That was because he had said so little. She remembered that he had come home to dinner one evening and had spoken admiringly of a woman buyer from Omaha. He did not often speak of business. She buys like a man, he had said at dinner. I never saw anything like it. Knew what she wanted and got it. She bought all my best numbers at rock bottom. I sold her a four-figure bill in half an hour. And no fuss. Everything right to the point. And when I asked her out to dinner, she turned me down. Good looking, too. She's coming in again tomorrow for novelties. Mrs. Mandel didn't even recall hearing her name until the knife descended. Hugo played the piano a great deal all that week after dinner. Sentimental things, with a minor wail in the chorus. Smoked a good deal, too. Twice he spent a full hour in dressing, whistling absent-mindedly during the process and leaving his necktie rack looking like a nest of angry pythons when he went out, without saying where he was going. The following week he didn't touch the piano and took long walks in Washington Park alone after ten. He seemed uninterested in his meals. Usually he praised this dish or that. How do you like the blueberry pie, Hugo? It's all right, and declined a second piece. The third week, he went west on business. When he came home, he dropped his bag in the hall, strode into his mother's bedroom, and stood before her like a schoolboy. Lil and I are going to be married, he said. Ma Mandel had looked up at him, her face a blank. Lil? Sure, I told you all about her. He hadn't. He had merely thought about her for three weeks, to the exclusion of everything else. Ma, you'll love her. She knows all about you. She's the grandest girl in the world. Say, I don't know why she ever fell for a dub like me. Well, don't look so stunned. I guess you kind of suspicioned, huh? But who? I never thought she'd look at me. Earned her own salary and strictly business, but she's a real woman. Says she wants her own home and everything. Says every normal woman does. Says ad lib. 
They were married the following month. Hugo subleased the flat on South Park and took an eight-room apartment farther east. Ma Mandel's red and green plush parlor pieces and her mahogany rockers and her rubber plant and the fern and the can of grapefruit pits that she and Anna had planted and that had come up miraculously in the form of shiny, thick, little green leaves all were swept away in the upheaval that followed. Gone, too, was Polish Anna with her damp calico and her ubiquitous pale and dripping rag and her gutturals. In her place was a trim Swede who wore white kid shoes in the afternoon and gray dresses and cobweb aprons. The sight of the neat Swede sitting in her room at 2.30 in the afternoon, tatting, never failed to fill Ma Mandel with a dumb fury. Anna had been an all-day scrubber. But Lil, Hugo thought her very beautiful, which she was not. A plump, voluble, full-bosomed woman, exquisitely neat, with a clear, firm skin, bright brown eyes, an unerring instinct for clothes, and a shrewd business head. Hugo's devotion amounted to worship. He used to watch her at her toilet in the rose and black mahogany front bedroom. Her plump white shoulders gleamed from pink satin straps. She smelled pleasantly of sachet, and a certain heady scent she affected. Seated before the mirror, she stared steadily at herself with a concentration such as an artist bestows upon a work that depends, for its perfection, upon nuances of light and shade. Everything about her shone and glittered. Her pink nails were like polished coral. Her hair gleamed in smooth undulations, not a strand out of place. Her skin was clear and smooth as a baby's. Her hands were plump and white. She was always getting what she called a facial, from which process she would emerge, looking pinker and creamier than ever. Lil knew when camisoles were edged with fillet and when with Irish instinctively she sensed when taffeta was to be superseded by foulard the contents of her scented bureau drawers need only a dab of whipped cream on top to look as if they might have been eaten as something souffle how do i look in it hugo do you like it was a question that rose daily to her lips a new hat or frock or collar or negligee not that she was unduly extravagant. She knew values and profited by her knowledge. Let's see. Turn around. It looks great on you. Yep, that's all right. He liked to fancy himself a connoisseur in women's clothes, and to prove it, he sometimes brought home an article of feminine apparel glimpsed in a shop window or showcase. But Lil soon put a stop to that. She had her own ideas on clothes. He turned to jewelry. On Lil's silken bosom reposed a diamond and platinum pen the size and general contour of a fish knife. She had a dinner ring that crowded the second knuckle, and on her plump wrist sparkled an oblong so encrusted with diamonds that its utilitarian dial was almost lost. It wasn't a one-sided devotion, however. Lil knew much about men, and she had an instinct for making them comfortable. It is a gift that makes up for myriad minor shortcomings. She had a way of laying his clean things out on the bed. Fresh linen, clean white socks. Hugo was addicted to white socks and tan, low-cut shoes. Silk shirt, immaculate handkerchief. When he came in at the end of a hard day downtown, hot, fagged, sticky, she saw to it that the bathroom was his own for an hour so that he could bathe, shave, powder, dress, and emerge refreshed to eat his good dinner in comfort. Lil was always waiting for him, cool, interested, sweet-smelling. When she said, How's business, Lava? She really wanted to know. More than that, when he told her, she understood, having herself been so long in the game. She gave him shrewd advice, too, so shrewdly administered that he never realized he had been advised, and so, manlike, 
could never resent it. Ma Mandel's reign was over. To Mrs. Lamb, Mrs. Brunswick, and Mrs. Wormser, Ma Mandel lied magnificently. Their eager, merciless questions pierced her like knives, but she made placid answer. Young folks are young folks. They do things different. I got my way. My son's wife has got hers. Their quick ears caught the familiar phrase. It's hard, just the same, Mrs. Wormser insisted, after you've been boss all these years to have somebody else step in and shove you out of the way. Don't I know? I'm glad to have a little rest. Marketing and housekeeping nowadays is no snap with the prices what they are. Anybody that wants the pleasure is welcome. But they knew, the three. There was, in Ma Mandel's tone, a hollow pretense that deceived no one. They knew, and she knew, that they knew. She was even, as they were, a drinker of the hemlock cup, an eater of ashes. Hugo Mandel was happier and more comfortable than he had ever been in his life it wasn't merely his love for lil or her love for him that made him happy lil set a good table though perhaps it was not as bounteous as his mother's had been his food somehow seemed to agree with him better than it used to it was because lil selected her provisions with an eye to their building value and to hugo's figure she told him he was getting too fat, and showed him where, and Hugo agreed with her and took off twenty-five burdensome pounds, but Ma Mandel fought every ounce of it. You'll weaken yourself, Hugo. Eat. How can a man work and not eat? I never heard of such a thing. Fads. But these were purely physical things. It was a certain mental relaxation that Hugo enjoyed, though he did not definitely know it. He only knew that Lil seemed, somehow, to understand. For years his mother had trailed after him, putting away things that he wanted left out, tidying that which he preferred left in seeming disorder. Lil seemed miraculously to understand about those things. He liked, for example, a certain grimy, gritty old rag with which he was wont to polish his golf clubs. It was caked with dirt and most disreputable, but it was of just the right material, or weight, or size, or something. And he had for it the unreasoning affection that a child has for a tattered rag doll among a whole family of golden-haired, blue-eyed beauties. Ma Mandel, tidying up, used to throw away that rag in horror. Sometimes he would rescue it, crusted as it was with sand and mud and scouring dust. Sometimes he would have to train in a new rag, and it was never as good as the old. Lil understood about that rag and, and approved of it. For that matter, she had a rag of her own, which she used to remove cold cream from her face and throat. It was a clean enough bit of soft cloth to start with, but she clung to it as an actress often does, until it was smeared with the pink of makeup and the black of Chicago soot. She used to search remote corners of it for an inch of unused, unsmeared space. Lil knew about not talking when you wanted to read the paper, too. Ma Mandel, at breakfast, had always had a long and intricate story to tell about the milkman or the strawberries that she had got the day before and that had spoiled overnight in the icebox. A shame! Sometimes he had wanted to say, let me read my paper in peace, won't you? But he never had. Now it was Lil who listened patiently to Ma Mandel's small grievances, and Hugo was left free to peruse the headlines. If you had told Ma Mandel that she was doing her best to ruin the life of the one person she loved best in all the world, she would have told you that you were insane. If you had told her that she was jealous, she would have denied it furiously but both were true when hugo brought his wife a gift he brought one for his mother as well you don't need to think you have to bring your old mother anything she would say unreasonably didn't i always bring you something ma 
If seventy can be said to sulk, Ma Mandel sulked. Lil, on her way to market in the morning, was a pleasant sight, trim, well-shod, immaculate. Ma, whose marketing costume had always been neat but sketchy, would eye her disapprovingly. Are you going out? Just to market. I thought I'd start early, before everything was picked over. Oh, to market. I thought you were going to a party. You're so dressy. In the beginning, Lil had offered to allow Ma Mandel to continue with the marketing, but Mrs. Mandel had declined acidly. Oh, no, she had said. This is your household now. But she never failed to inspect the groceries as they lay on the kitchen table after delivery. She would press a wise and disdainful thumb into a head of lettuce, poke a pot roast with disapproving finger, turn a plump chicken over and thump it down with a look that was pregnant with meaning. Mrs. Mandel disapproved of many things, of Lil's silken lacy lingerie, of her social activities, of what she termed her wastefulness. Lil wore the fewest possible undergarments, according to the fashion of the day, and she worried good-naturedly about additional plumpness that was the result of leisure and of rich food. She was addicted to afternoon parties at the homes of married women of her own age and station, pretty, well-dressed, overindulged women who regularly ate too much. They served a mayonnaise chicken salad and little hot buttery biscuits and strong coffee with sugar and cream, and there were dishes of salted almonds and great shiny oily black ripe olives and a heavy rich dessert when she came home she ate nothing i couldn't eat a bite of dinner she would say let me tell you what we had she would come to the table in one of her silken lace bedecked tea gowns and talk animatedly to hugo while he ate his dinner and eyed her appreciatively as she sat there leaning one elbow on the cloth the sleeve fallen back so that you could see her plump white forearm she kept her clear rosy skin in spite of the pastry and sweets and the indolent life and even the layers of powder with which she was forever dabbing her face had not coarsened its texture hugo manlike was unconscious of the undercurrent of animosity between the two women. He was very happy. He only knew that Lil understood about cigar ashes, that she didn't mind if a pillow wasn't plumped and padded after his Sunday nap on the Davenport, that she never complained to him about the shortcomings of the little Swede, as Ma Mandel had about Polish Anna. Even at house-cleaning time, which Ma Mandel had always treated as a scourge things were as smooth running and peaceful as at ordinary times just a little bare perhaps as to floors and smelling of cleanliness lil applied business-like methods to the conduct of her house and they were successful in spite of ma mandel's steady efforts to block them old lady mandel did not mean to be cruel she only thought that she was protecting her son's interests she did not know that the wise men had a definite name for the mental processes which caused her perversely to do just the thing which she knew she should not do hugo and lil went out a great deal in the evening they liked the theatre restaurant life gaiety hugo learned to dance and became marvellously expert at it as does your fat man come out and go with us this evening mother lil would say sure hugo would agree heartily come along ma we'll show you some night life i don't want to go ma mandel would mutter i'm better off at home you enjoy yourself better without an old woman dragging along that being true they vowed it was not and renewed their urging in the end she went grudgingly but her old eyes would droop the late supper would disagree with her the noise, the music, the laughter, and shrill talk bewildered her. She did not understand the banter and resented it. Next day in the park, she would boast of her life of gaiety to the vaguely suspicious three. Later, she refused to go out with them. 
She stayed in her room a good deal, fussing about, arranging bureau drawers already geometrically precise, winding endless old ribbons, ripping the trimming off hats long passé and retrimming them with odds and ends and scraps of feathers and flowers. Hugo and Lil used to ask her to go with them to the movies, but they liked the second show at 8.30, while she preferred the earlier one at 7. She grew sleepy early, though she often lay awake for hours after composing herself for sleep. She would watch the picture absorbedly, but when she stepped, blinking, into the bright glare of 53rd Street, she always had a sense of letdown, of depression. A wise old lady of seventy, who could not apply her wisdom for her own good. A rather lonely old lady, with hardening arteries and a dilating heart. An increasingly fault-finding old lady. Even Hugo began to notice it. She would wait for him to come home, and then, motioning him mysteriously into her own room, would pour a tale of fancied insult into his ear. I ran a household and brought up a family before she was born. I don't have to be told what's what. I may be an old woman, but I'm not so old that I can sit and let my own son be made a fool of. One girl isn't enough. She's got to have a washwoman. And now a washwoman isn't enough. She's got to have a woman to clean one day a week. An hour later, from the front bedroom, where Hugo was dressing, would come the low murmur of conversation. Lil had reached the complaining point, goaded by much repetition. The attitude of the two women distressed and bewildered Hugo. He was a simple soul, and this was a complex situation. His mind leapt from mother to wife and back again, joltingly. After all, one woman at a time is all that any man can handle successfully. "'What's got into you women, folks?' he would say, always quarreling. Why can't you get along? One night, after dinner, Lil said, quite innocently, Mother, we haven't a decent picture of you. Why don't you have one taken in your black lace? Old Lady Mandel broke into sudden fury. I guess you think I'm going to die. A picture to put on the piano after I'm gone, huh? That's my dear mother that's gone. Well, I don't have any picture taken. You can think of me the way I was when I was alive. The thing grew and swelled and took on bitterness as it progressed. Lil's face grew strangely flushed and little veins stood out on her temples. All the pent-up bitterness that had been seething in Ma Mandel's mind broke bounds now and welled to her lips. Accusation, denial, vituperation, retort. You'll be happy when I'm gone. If I am, it's your fault. It's the ones that are used to nothing that always want the most. They don't know where to stop. When you were working in Omaha... The salary I gave up to marry your son was more money than you ever saw. And through it all, like a late motif, ran Hugo's attempt at pacification. Now, Ma, don't, Lil. You'll only excite yourself. What's got into you two women? It was after dinner. In the end, Ma Mandel slammed out of the house, hatless. Her old legs were trembling. Her hands shook. It was a hot June night. She felt as if she were burning up. In her frantic mind, there was even thought of self-destruction. There were thousands of motor cars streaming by. The glare of their lamps and the smell of the gasoline blinded and stifled her. Once, at a crossing, she almost stumbled in front of an onrushing car. The curses of the startled driver sounded in her terrified ears after she had made the opposite curb in a frantic bound. She walked on and on for what seemed to her to be a long time, with plodding, heavy step. She was not conscious of being tired. She came to a park bench and sat down, feeling very abused and lonely and agonized. This was what she had come to in her old days. It was for this you bore children and brought them up and sacrificed for them. How right they were, 
Mrs. Lamb, Mrs. Brunswick, and Mrs. Wormser, useless, unconsidered, in the way. By degrees, she grew calmer. Her brain cooled as her fevered old body lost the heat of anger. Lil had looked kind of sick, perhaps, and how worried Hugo had looked. Feeling suddenly impelled, she got up from the bench and started toward home. Her walk, which had seemed interminable, had really lasted scarcely more than half an hour. She had sat in the park scarcely fifteen minutes. Altogether, her flight had been, perhaps, an hour in duration. She had her latchkey in her pocket. She opened the door softly. The place was in darkness. Voices from the front bedroom, and the sound of someone sobbing, as though spent. Old Lady Mandel's face hardened again. The door of the front bedroom was closed, plotting against her. She crouched there in the hall, listening. Lil's voice, hoarse with sobs. I've tried and tried, but she hates me. Nothing I do suits her. If it wasn't for the baby coming, sometimes I think I... You're just nervous and excited, Lil. It'll come out all right. She's an old lady. I know, I know it. I've said that a million times in the last year and a half, but that doesn't excuse everything, does it? Is that any reason why she should spoil our lives? It isn't fair. It isn't fair. Shh. Don't cry like that, dear. Don't. You'll only make yourself sick. Her sobs again, racking, choking, and the gentle murmur of his soothing endearments. Then, unexpectedly, a little high-pitched laugh through the tears. <laughs> I'm... No! I'm not hysterical. I... It just strikes me funny. I was just wondering if I might be like that. When I grow old, and my son marries, maybe I'll think everything his wife does is wrong. I suppose if we love them too much, we really harm them. I suppose. Oh, it's going to be a son, is it? Yes. Another silence. Then, come, dear, bathe your poor eyes. You're all worn out from crying. Why, sweetheart, I don't believe I ever saw you cry before. I know it. I feel better now. I wish crying could make it all right. I'm sorry. She's so old, dear. That's the trouble. They live in the past, and they expect us to live in the past with them. You were a good son to her, Hughie. That's why you make such a wonderful husband. Too good, maybe. You spoiled us both, and now we both want all of you. Hugo was silent a moment. He was not a quick-thinking man. A husband belongs to his wife, he said then, simply. He's his mother's son by accident of birth, but he's his wife's husband by choice and deliberately. But she laughed again at that. <laughs> it isn't as easy as that, sweetheart. If it was, there'd be no jokes in the funny papers. My poor boy. And just now, too, when you're so worried about business. Business'll be all right, Lil. Trade'll open up next winter. It's got to. We kept going on the Japanese and English stuff. But if the French and Austrian factories start running, we'll have a whirlwind year. If it hadn't been for you this last year, I don't know how I'd have stood the strain. No importing, and the business just keeping its head above water. But you were right, honey. We've weathered the worst of it now. I'm glad you didn't tell Mother about it. She'd have worried herself sick. If she had known we both put every cent we had into the business. We'll get it back ten times over. You'll see. The sound of footsteps. I wonder where she went. She oughtn't to be out alone. I'm kind of worried about her, Hugo. Don't you think you'd better? Mrs. Mandel opened the front door and then slammed it ostentatiously, as though she had just come in. That you, Ma? called Hugo. He turned on the hall light. She stood there, blinking, a bent, pathetic little figure. Her eyes were averted. Are you all right, Ma? We began to worry about you. I'm all right. I'm going to bed. 
He made a clumsy, masculine pretense at hardiness. Lil and I are going over to the drugstore for a soda. It's so hot. Come on along, Ma. Lil joined him in the doorway of the bedroom. Her eyes were red-rimmed behind the powder that she had hastily dabbed on, but she smiled bravely. Come on, Mother, she said. It'll cool you off. But Ma Mantle shook her head. I'm better off at home. You run along, you two. That was all, but the two standing there caught something in her tone. Something new, something gentle, something wise. She went on down the hall to her room. She took off her clothes and hung them away neatly. But once in her nightgown, she did not get into bed. She sat there, in the chair by the window. Old Lady Mandel had lived to be seventy and had acquired much wisdom. One cannot live to be seventy without having experienced almost everything in life. But to crystallize that experience of a long lifetime into terms that would express the meaning of life, this she had never tried to do. She could not do it now, for that matter. But she groped around painfully in her mind. There had been herself and Hugo, and now Hugo's wife and the child-to-be. They were the ones that counted now. That was the law of life. She did not put it into words, but something of this she thought as she sat there in her plain white nightgown, her scant white locks pinned in a neat knob at the top of her head. Selfishness. That was it. They called it love, but it was selfishness. She must tell them about it tomorrow. Mrs. Lamb, Mrs. Brunswick, and Mrs. Wormser. Only yesterday Mrs. Brunswick had waxed bitter because her daughter-in-law had let a moth get into her husband's winter suit. I never had a moth in my house, Mrs. Brunswick had declared. Never! But nowadays housekeeping is nothing. A suit is ruined. What does my son's wife care? I never had a moth in my house. Ma Mandel chuckled to herself there in the darkness. I bet she did. She forgets. We all forget. It was very hot tonight. Now and then there was a wisp of breeze from the lake, but not often. How red Lil's eyes had been. Poor girl. Moved by a sudden impulse, Ma Mandel thudded down the hall in her bare feet, found a scrap of paper in the writing desk drawer, scribbled a line on it turned out the light, and went into the empty front room. With a pen from the tray on the dresser, she fastened the note to Lil's pillow, high up, where she must see it in the instant she turned on the light. Then she scuttled down the hall to her room again. She felt the heat terribly. She would sit by the window again. All the blood in her body seemed to be pounding in her head. Pounding in her head. Pounding. At ten, Hugo and Lil came in, softly. Hugo tiptoed down the hall, as was his wont, and listened. The room was in darkness. Sleeping, Ma? he whispered. He could not see the white-gowned figure sitting peacefully by the window, and there was no answer. He tiptoed with painful awkwardness up the hall again. She's asleep, all right. I didn't think she'd get to sleep so early on a scorcher like this. Lil turned on the light in her room. It's too hot to sleep, she said. She began to disrobe languidly. Her eye fell on the scrap of paper pinned to her pillow. She went over to it, curiously, leaned over, read it. Oh, look, Hugo. She gave a little tremulous laugh that was more than half sob. He came over to her and read it, his arm around her shoulder. My son Hugo and my daughter Lil, they are the best son and daughter in the world. A sudden hot haze before his eyes blotted out the words as he finished reading them. End of Old Lady Mandel by Edna Ferber
Charlotte Bronte's Last Sketch by Charlotte Bronte. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ginny. Not many days since, I went to visit a house where in former years I had received many a friendly welcome. We went into the owner's and artist's studio. Prints, pictures, and sketches hung on the walls as I had last seen and remembered them. The implements of the painter's art were there. The light which had shone upon so many, many hours of patient and cheerful toil poured through the northern window. Upon print and bust lay figure and sketch, and upon the easel before which the good, the gentle, the beloved Leslie labored. In this room the busy brain had devised, and the skillful hand executed, I know not how many of the noble works which have delighted the world with their beauty and charming humor. Here the poet called up into pictorial presence, and informed with life, grace, beauty, infinite friendly mirth, and wondrous naturalness of expression, the people of whom his dear books told him the stories, his Shakespeare, his Cervantes, his Moliere, his Lesage. There was his last work on the easel, a beautiful, fresh, smiling shape of Titania, such as his sweet guileless fancy imagined the midsummer night's queen to be gracious and pure and bright the sweet smiling image glimmers on the canvas fairy elves no doubt were to have been grouped around their mistress in laughing clusters honest bottom's grotesque head and form are indicated as reposing by the side of the consummate beauty the darkling forest would have grown around them with the stars glittering from the midsummer sky the flowers at the queen's feet and the boughs and foliage about her would have been peopled with gambling sprites and fays they were dwelling in the artist's mind no doubt and would have been developed by that patient faithful admirable genius but the busy brain stopped working the skilful hand fell lifeless the loving honest heart ceased to beat what was she to have been that fair titania when perfected by the patient skill of the poet who in imagination saw the sweet innocent figure and with tender courtesy and caresses as it were posed and shaped and traced the fair form is the record kept anywhere of fancies conceived beautiful unborn some day will they assume form in some yet undeveloped light if our bad unspoken thoughts are registered against us and are written in the awful account will not the good thoughts unspoken the love and tenderness the pity beauty charity which pass through the breast and cause the heart to throb with silent good find a remembrance too a few weeks more and this lovely offspring of the poet's conception would have been complete to charm the world with its beautiful mirth may there not be some sphere unknown to us where it may have an existence they say our words once out of our lips go travelling in omne oivum, reverberating forever and ever if our words why not our thoughts if the has been why not the might have been some day our spirits may be permitted to walk in galleries of fancies more wondrous and beautiful than any achieved works which at present we see and our minds to behold and delight in masterpieces which poets and artists minds have fathered and conceived only with a feeling much akin to that with which i looked upon the friends the admirable artist's unfinished work i can fancy many readers turning to these the last pages which were traced by charlotte bronte's hand of the multitude that has read her books who has not known and deplored the tragedy of her family her own most sad and untimely fate which of her readers has not become her friend who that has known her books has not admired the artist's noble english the burning love of truth the bravery the simplicity the indignation at wrong the eager sympathy the pious love and reverence the passionate honor so to speak of the woman what a story is that of that family of poets in their solitude yonder on the gloomy northern moors at nine o'clock at night mrs gaskell tells after evening prayers when their guardian and relative had gone to bed the three poetesses the three maidens charlotte and emily and anne charlotte being the motherly friend and guardian to the other two began like restless wild animals to pace up and down their parlor making out their wonderful stories talking over plans and projects and thoughts of what was to be their future life one evening at the close of eighteen fifty four as charlotte nichols sat with her husband by the fire listening to the howling of the wind about the house 
she suddenly said to her husband, If you had not been with me, I must have been writing now. She then ran upstairs and brought down and read aloud the beginning of a new tale. When she had finished, her husband remarked, The critics will accuse you of repetition. She replied, Oh, I shall alter that. I always begin two or three times before I can please myself. But it was not to be. The trembling little hand was to write no more. The heart, newly awakened to love and happiness, and throbbing with maternal hope, was soon to cease to beat. That intrepid outspeaker and champion of truth, that eager, impetuous redresser of wrong, was to be called out of the world's fight and struggle, to lay down the shining arms, and to be removed to a sphere where even a noble indignation, cor alterius nuquit lacerara, and where truth complete and right triumphant no longer need to wage war. I can only say of this lady, Weedy Tantum. I saw her first, just as I rose out of an illness from which I had never thought to recover. I remember the trembling little frame, the little hand, the great honest eyes. An impetuous honesty seemed to me to characterize the woman. Twice I recollect she took me to task for what she held to be errors in doctrine. Once about fielding we had a disputation. She spoke her mind out. She jumped too rapidly to conclusions. I have smiled at one or two passages in the biography in which my own disposition or behavior forms the subject of talk. She formed conclusions that might be wrong, and built up whole theories of character upon them. New to the London world, she entered it with an independent, indomitable spirit of her own, and judged of contemporaries and especially spied out arrogance or affectation with extraordinary keenness of vision. She was angry with her favorites if their conduct or conversation fell below her ideal. Often she seemed to me to be judging the London folk prematurely, but perhaps the city is rather angry at being judged. I fancied an austere little Joan of Arc marching in upon us and rebuking our easy lives, our easy morals. She gave me the impression of being a very pure and lofty and high-minded person. A great and holy reverence of right and truth seemed to be with her always. Such, in our brief interview, she appeared to me. As one thinks of that life so noble, so lonely, of that passion for truth, of those nights and nights of eager study, swarming fancies, invention, depression, elation, prayer, as one reads the necessarily incomplete, though most touching and admirable history of the heart that throbbed in this one little frame, of this one among the myriads of souls that have lived and died on this great earth, this great earth, this little speck in the infinite universe of God, with what wonder do we think of today, with what awe await tomorrow, when that which is now but darkly seen shall be clear. As I read this little fragmentary sketch, I think of the rest. Is it? And where is it? Will not the leaf be turned some day and the story be told? Shall the deviser of the tale somewhere perfect the history of little Emma's griefs and troubles? Shall Titania come forth complete with her sportive court, with the flowers at her feet, the forest around her, and all the stars of summer glittering overhead? How well I remember the delight and wonder and pleasure with which I read Jane Eyre, sent to me by an author whose name and sex were then alike unknown to me the strange fascinations of the book, and how, with my own work pressing upon me, I could not, having taken the volumes up, lay them down until they were read through. Hundreds of those who, like myself, recognized and admired that master work of a great genius, will look with a mournful interest and regard and curiosity upon this, the last fragmentary sketch from the noble hand which wrote Jane Eyre. W. M. Thackeray Emma, a fragment of a story by the late Charlotte Bronte. Chapter 1. We all seek an ideal in life. A pleasant fancy began to visit me, in a certain year, that perhaps the number of human beings is few who do not find their quest at some era of life for some space more or less brief. I had certainly not found mine in youth, though the strong belief I held of its existence sufficed through all my brightest and freshest time to keep me hopeful. I had not found it in maturity. I was become resigned never to find it. I had lived certain dim years entirely tranquil and unexpectant. And now I was not sure but something was hovering round my hearth, which pleased me wonderfully. Look at it, reader. Come into my parlor and judge for yourself. 
whether I do right to care for this thing. First, you may scan me, if you please. We shall go on better together after a satisfactory introduction and due apprehension of identity. My name is Mrs. Chalfont. I am a widow. My house is good, and my income such as need not check the impulse either of charity or a moderate hospitality. I am not young, nor yet old. There is no silver yet in my hair, but its yellow luster is gone. In my face wrinkles are yet to come, but I have almost forgotten the days when it wore any bloom. I married when I was very young. I lived for fifteen years a life which, whatever its trials, could not be called stagnant. Then, for five years I was alone, and having no children, desolate. Lately fortune, by a somewhat curious turn of her wheel, placed in my way an interest in a companion. The neighborhood where I live is pleasant enough, its scenery agreeable, and its society civilized, though not numerous. About a mile from my house there is a ladies' school, established but lately, not more than three years since. The conductresses of this school were of my acquaintances, and though I cannot say that they occupied the very highest place in my opinion, for they had brought back from some month's residence abroad, for finishing purposes, a good deal that was fantastic, affected, and pretentious. Yet I awarded them some portion of that respect, which seems the fair due of all women who face life bravely and try to make their own way by their own efforts. About a year after the Mrs. Wilcox opened their school, when the number of their pupils was as yet exceedingly limited, and when, no doubt, they were looking out anxiously enough for augmentation, the entrance gate of their little drive was one day thrown back to admit a carriage, a very handsome, fashionable carriage, Miss Mabel Wilcox said, in narrating the circumstance afterwards, and drawn by a pair of really splendid horses. The sweep up the drive, the loud ring at the doorbell, the bustling entrance into the house, the ceremonious admission to the drawing-room, roused excitement enough in Fuchsia Lodge. Miss Wilcox repaired to the reception-room, in a pair of new gloves, and carrying in her hand a handkerchief of French cambric, she found a gentleman seated on the sofa, who, as he rose up, appeared a tall, fine-looking personage, at least she thought him so, as he stood with his back to the light. He introduced himself as Mr. Fitzgibbon, inquired if Miss Wilcox had a vacancy, and intimated that he wished to entrust to her care a new pupil in the shape of his daughter. This was welcome news for there was many a vacancy in Miss Wilcox's schoolroom. Indeed, her establishment was as yet limited to the select number of three, and she and her sisters were looking forward with anything but confidence to the balancing of accounts at the close of their first half-year. Few objects could have been more agreeable to her then than that to which, by a wave of the hand, Mr. Fitzgibbon now directed her attention, the figure of a child standing near the drawing-room window, had Miss Wilcox's establishment boasted fuller ranks, had she indeed entered well on that course of prosperity which in after years an undeviating attention to externals enabled her so triumphantly to realize, an early thought with her would have been to judge whether the acquisition now offered was likely to answer well as a show pupil. She would have instantly marked her look, dress, etc., and inferred her value from these indicia. In those anxious commencing times, however, Miss Wilcox could scarce afford herself the luxury of such appreciation. A new pupil represented forty pounds a year, independently of master's terms, and forty pounds a year was a sum Miss Wilcox needed, and was glad to secure. Besides, the fine carriage, the fine gentleman, and the fine name gave gratifying assurance enough in despair of eligibility in the proffered connection. It was admitted, then, that there were vacancies in Fuchsia Lodge, that Miss Fitzgibbon could be received at once, and that she was to learn all that the school prospectus proposed to teach, to be liable to every extra, in short, to be as expensive and consequently as profitable a pupil as any directress's heart could wish. All this was arranged as upon velvet, smoothly and liberally. Mr. Fitzgibbon showed in the transaction none of the hardness of the bargain-making man of business, and as little of the penurious anxiety of the straitened professional man. Miss Wilcox felt him to be quite the gentleman. Everything disposed her to be partially inclined toward the little girl whom he, 
on taking leave, formally committed to her guardianship, and as if no circumstance should be wanting to complete her happy impression, the address left written on a card served to fill up the measure of Miss Wilcox's satisfaction. Conway Fitzgibbon, Esquire, May Park, Midland County. That very day, three decrees were passed in the newcomer's favor. First, that she was to be Miss Wilcox's bedfellow. Second, to sit next her at table. Third, to walk out with her. In a few days it became evident that a fourth sacred clause had been added to these, namely, that Miss Fitzgibbon was to be favored, petted, and screened on all possible occasions. An ill-conditioned pupil, who before coming to Fuchsia Lodge, had passed a year under the care of certain old-fashioned Mrs. Sterling of Hartwood, and from them had picked up unpractical notions of justice, took it upon her to utter an opinion on this system of favoritism. The Mrs. Sterling, she injudiciously said, never distinguished any girl because she was richer or better dressed than the rest. They would have scorned to do so. They always rewarded girls according as they behaved well to their schoolfellows and minded their lessons, not according to the number of their silk dresses and fine laces and feathers. For it must not be forgotten that Miss Fitzgibbon's trunks, when opened, disclosed a splendid wardrobe. So fine were the various articles of apparel indeed, that instead of assigning for their accommodation the painted deal drawers of the school bedroom, Miss Wilcox had them arranged in a mahogany bureau in her own room. With her own hands, too, she would on Sundays array the little favorite in her quilted silk pelisse, her hat and feathers, her ermine boa, and little French boots and gloves, and very self-complacent she felt when she led the young heiress. A letter from Mr. Fitzgibbon, received since his first visit, had communicated the additional particulars, that his daughter was his only child, and would be the inheritress of his estates, including May Park, Midland County. When she led her, I say, into the church, and seated her stately by her side at the top of the gallery pew, unbiased observers might, indeed, have wondered what there was to be proud of, and puzzled their heads to detect the special merits of this little woman in silk, for, to speak truth, Miss Fitzgibbon was far from being the beauty of the school. There were two or three blooming little faces among her companions lovelier than hers. Had she been a poor child, Miss Wilcox herself would not have liked her physiognomy at all. Rather, indeed, would it have repelled than attracted her. And, moreover, though Miss Wilcox hardly confessed the circumstance to herself, but, on the contrary, strove hard not to be conscious of it, there were moments when she became sensible of a certain strange weariness in continuing her system of partiality. It hardly came natural to her to show this special distinction in this particular instance. An undefined wonder would smite her sometimes that she did not take more real satisfaction in flattering and caressing this embryo heiress, that she did not like better to have her always at her side, under her special charge. On principle, Miss Wilcox continued the plan she had begun on principle, for she argued with herself, this is the most aristocratic and richest of my pupils. She brings me the most credit and the most profit. Therefore, I ought in justice to show her a special indulgence, which she did, but with a gradually increasing peculiarity of feeling. Certainly, the undue favors showered on little Miss Fitzgibbon brought their object no real benefit unfitted for the character of playfellow by her position of favorite her fellow pupils rejected her company as decidedly as they dared active rejection was not long necessary it was soon seen that passive avoidance would suffice the pet was not social no even miss wilcox never thought her social when she sent for her to show her fine clothes in the drawing-room when there was company and especially when she had her into her parlor of an evening to be her own companion, Miss Wilcox used to feel curiously perplexed. She would try to talk affably to the young heiress, to draw her out, to amuse her. To herself the governess could render no reason why her efforts soon flagged, but this was invariably the case. However, Miss Wilcox was a woman of courage, and be the protégé what she might, the patroness did not fail to continue on principle her system of preference. A favorite has no friends, and the observation of a gentleman 
who about this time called at the lodge and chanced to see miss fitzgibbon was that child looks consummately unhappy he was watching miss fitzgibbon as she walked by herself fine and solitary while her schoolfellows were merrily playing who is the miserable little wight he asked he was told her name and dignity wretched little soul he repeated and he watched her pace down the walk and back again marching upright her hands in her ermined muff her fine pelisse showing a gay sheen to the winter sun her large leghorn hat shading such a face as fortunately had not its parallel on the premises wretched little soul reiterated this gentleman he opened the drawing-room window watched the bearer of the muff till he caught her eye and then summoned her with his finger she came he stooped his head down to her she lifted her face up to him don't you play little girl no sir no why not you think yourself better than other children no answer is it because people tell you you are rich you won't play the young lady was gone he stretched his hand to arrest her but she wheeled beyond his reach and ran quickly out of sight an only child pleaded miss wilcox possibly spoiled by her papa you know we must excuse a little pettishness hm. i am afraid there is not a little to excuse chapter two mr ellen the gentleman mentioned in the last chapter was a man who went where he liked and being a gossiping leisurely person he liked to go almost anywhere he could not be rich he lived so quietly and yet he must have had some money for without apparent profession he continued to keep a house and a servant he always spoke of himself as having once been a worker but if so that could not have been very long since for he still looked far from old sometimes of an evening under a little social conversational excitement he would look quite young but he was changeable in mood and complexion and expression and had chameleon eyes sometimes blue and merry sometimes gray and dark and anon green and gleaming on the whole he might be called a fair man of average height rather thin and rather wiry he had not resided more than two years in the present neighborhood his antecedents were unknown there but as the rector a man of good family and standing and of undoubted scrupulousness in the choice of acquaintance had introduced him he found everywhere a prompt reception of which nothing in his conduct had yet seemed to prove him unworthy some people indeed dubbed him a character and fancied him eccentric but others could not see the appropriateness of the epithets he always seemed to them very harmless and quiet not always perhaps so perfectly unreserved and comprehensible as might be wished he had a discomposing expression in his eye and sometimes in conversation an ambiguous diction but still they believed he meant no harm mr ellen often called on the misses wilcox he sometimes took tea with them he appeared to like tea and muffins and not to dislike the kind of conversation which usually accompanies that refreshment he was said to be a good shot a good angler he proved himself an excellent gossip he liked gossip well on the whole he liked women's society and did not seem to be particular in requiring difficult accomplishments or rare endowments in his female acquaintance the mrs wilcox for instance were not much less shallow than the china saucer which held their teacups yet mr ellen got on perfectly well with them and had apparently great pleasure in hearing them discuss all the details of their school he knew the names of all their young ladies too and would shake hands with them if he met them walking out he knew their examination days and gala days and more than once accompanied mr cecil the curate when he went to examine in ecclesiastical history this ceremony took place weekly on wednesday afternoons after which mr cecil sometimes stayed to tea and usually found two or three lady parishioners invited to meet him mr ellen was also pretty sure to be there rumor gave one of the misses wilcox in anticipated wedlock to the curate and furnished his friend with a second in the same tender relation so that it is to be conjectured they made a social pleasant party under such interesting circumstances their evenings rarely passed without miss fitzgibbon being introduced all worked muslin and streaming sash and elaborated ringlets others of the pupils would also be called in perhaps to sing to show off a little at the piano or sometimes to repeat poetry 
Miss Wilcox conscientiously cultivated display in her young ladies, thinking she thus fulfilled a duty to herself and to them, at once spreading her own fame and giving the children self-possessed manners. It was curious to note how, on these occasions, good, genuine, natural qualities still vindicated their superiority to counterfeit artificial advantages. While dear Miss Fitzgibbon, dressed up and flattered as she was, could only sidle round the circle with the crestfallen air which seemed natural to her, just giving her hand to the guests, then almost snatching it away, and sneaking in unmannerly haste to the place allotted to her at Miss Wilcox's side, which place she filled like a piece of furniture, neither smiling nor speaking the evening through, while such was her deportment, certain of her companions, as Mary Franks, Jessie Newton, etc., handsome, open-countenanced little damsels, fearless because harmless, would enter with a smile of salutation and a blush of pleasure, make their pretty reverence at the drawing-room door, stretch a friendly little hand to such visitors as they knew, and sit down to the piano to play their well-practiced duet with an innocent, obliging readiness which won all hearts. There was a girl called Diana, the girl alluded to before as having once been Miss Sterling's pupil, a daring, brave girl, much loved and a little feared by her comrades. She had good faculties, both physical and mental, was clever, honest, and dauntless. In the schoolroom, she set her young brow like a rock against Miss Fitzgibbon's pretensions. She found also heart and spirit to withstand them in the drawing-room. One evening, when the curate had been summoned away by some piece of duty directly after tea, and there was no stranger present but Mr. Ellen, Diana had been called in to play a long, difficult piece of music which she could execute like a master. She was still in the midst of her performance when, Mr. Ellen, having for the first time perhaps recognized the existence of the heiress by asking if she was cold, Miss Wilcox took the opportunity of launching into a strain of commendation on Miss Fitzgibbon's inanimate behavior, terming it ladylike, modest, and exemplary. Whether Miss Wilcox's constrained tone betrayed how far she was from really feeling the approbation she expressed, how entirely she spoke from a sense of duty, and not because she felt it possible to be in any degree charmed by the personage she praised, or whether Diana, who was by nature hasty, had a sudden fit of irritability, is not quite certain, but she turned on her music-stool. Ma'am, said she to Miss Wilcox, that girl does not deserve so much praise. Her behavior is not at all exemplary. In the schoolroom she is insolently distant. For my part, I denounce her airs. There is not one of us but is as good or better than she, though we may not be as rich. And Diana shut up the piano, took her music-book under her arm, curtsied, and vanished. Strange to relate, Miss Wilcox said not a word at the time, nor was Diana subsequently reprimanded for this outbreak. Miss Fitzgibbon had now been three months in the school, and probably the governess had had leisure to wear out her early raptures of partiality. Indeed, as time advanced, this evil often seemed likely to right itself. Again and again, it seemed, that Miss Fitzgibbon was about to fall to her proper level, but then, somewhat provokingly to the lovers of reason and justice, some little incident would occur to invest her insignificance with artificial interest. Once it was the arrival of a great basket of hothouse fruit, melons, grapes, and pines, as a present to Miss Wilcox in Miss Fitzgibbon's name. Whether it was that a share of these luscious productions was imparted too freely to the nominal donor, or whether she had had a surfeit of cake on Miss Mabel Wilcox's birthday, it so befell that in some disturbed state of the digestive organs Miss Fitzgibbon took to sleepwalking. She one night terrified the school into a panic by passing through the bedrooms, all white in her nightdress, moaning and holding out her hands as she went. Dr. Percy was then sent for. His medicines probably did not suit the case, for within a fortnight, after the somnambulistic feat, Miss Wilcox, going upstairs in the dark, trod on something which she thought was the cat. Calling for a light found her darling Matilda Fitzgibbon curled round on the landing, blue, cold, and stiff, without any light in her half-open eyes, or any color in her lips, or movement in her limbs. She was not soon roused from this fit, 
her senses seemed half scattered and miss wilcox had now an undeniable excuse for keeping her all day on the drawing-room sofa and making more of her than ever there comes a day of reckoning both for petted heiresses and partial governesses one clear winter morning as mr ellen was seated at breakfast enjoying his bachelor's easy chair and damp fresh london newspaper a note was brought to him marked private and in haste the last injunction was vain for william ellen did nothing in haste he had no haste in him he wondered anybody should be so foolish as to hurry life was short enough without it he looked at the little note three-cornered scented and feminine he knew the handwriting it came from the very lady rumor had so often assigned him as his own the bachelor took out a morocco case selected from a variety of little instruments a pair of tiny scissors cut round the seal and read miss wilcox's compliments to mr ellen and she should be truly glad to see him for a few minutes if at leisure miss w requires a little advice she will reserve explanations till she sees mr e mr ellen very quietly finished his breakfast then as it was a very fine december day hoar and crisp but serene and not bitter he carefully prepared himself for the cold took his cane and set out he liked the walk the air was still the sun not wholly ineffectual the path firm and but lightly powdered with snow he made his journey as long as he could by going round through many fields and through winding unfrequented lanes when there was a tree in the way conveniently placed for support he would sometimes stop lean his back against the trunk fold his arms and muse if rumour could have seen him she would have affirmed that he was thinking about miss wilcox perhaps when he arrives at the lodge his demeanour will inform us whether such an idea be warranted at last he stands at the door and rings the bell he is admitted and shown into the parlour a smaller and a more private room than the drawing-room miss wilcox occupies it she is seated at her writing-table she rises not without air and grace to receive her visitor this air and grace she learned in france for she was in a parisian school for six months and learned there a little french and a stock of gestures and courtesies no it is certainly not impossible that mr ellen may admire miss wilcox she is not without prettiness any more than are her sisters and she and they are one and all smart and showy bright stone blue is a colour they like in dress a crimson bow rarely fails to be pinned on somewhere to give contrast positive colours generally grass greens red violets deep yellows are in favour with them all harmonies are at a discount many people would think miss wilcox standing there in her blue merino dress and pomegranate ribbon a very agreeable woman she has regular features the nose is a little sharp the lips a little thin good complexion light red hair she is very businesslike very practical she never in her life knew a refinement of feeling or of thought she is entirely limited respectable and self-satisfied she has a cool prominent eye sharp and shallow pupil unshrinking and inexpansive pale irid light eyelashes light brow miss wilcox is a very proper and decorous person but she could not be delicate or modest because she is naturally destitute of sensitiveness her voice when she speaks has no vibration her face no expression her manner no emotion blush or tremor she never knew what can i do for you miss wilcox says mr ellen approaching the writing-table and taking a chair beside it perhaps you can advise me was the answer or perhaps you can give me some information i feel so thoroughly puzzled and really fear all is not right where and how i will have redress if it is possible pursued the lady but how to set about obtaining it draw to the fire mr ellen it is a cold day they both drew to the fire she continued you know the christmas holidays are near he nodded well about a fortnight since i wrote as is customary to the friends of my pupils notifying the day when we break up and requesting that if it was desired that any girl should stay the vacation intimation should be sent accordingly satisfactory and prompt answers came to all the notes except one that addressed to conway fitzgibbon esquire may park 
Midland County. Matilda Fitzgibbon's father, you know. What? Won't he let her go home? Let her go home, my dear sir. You shall hear. Two weeks elapsed, during which I daily expected an answer. None came. I felt annoyed at the delay, as I had particularly requested a speedy reply. This very morning I had made up my mind to write again. When? What do you think the post brought me? I should like to know. My own letter, actually my own, returned from the post office with an intimation, such an intimation. But read for yourself. She handed to Mr. Ellen an envelope. He took from it the returned note and a paper. The paper bore a hastily scrawled line or two. It said in brief terms that there was no such place in Midland County as May Park, and that no such person had ever been heard of there as Conway Fitzgibbon, Esquire. On reading this, Mr. Ellen slightly opened his eyes. I hardly thought it was so bad as this, said he. What? You did think it was bad, then? You suspected that something was wrong? Really, I scarcely knew what I thought or suspected. How very odd. No such place as May Park. The grand mansion, the grounds, the oaks, the deer, vanished clean away. And then Fitzgibbon himself? But you saw Fitzgibbon. He came in his carriage. In his carriage, echoed Miss Wilcox, a most stylish equipage, and himself a most distinguished person. Do you think, after all, there is some mistake? Certainly a mistake, but when it is rectified, I don't think Fitzgibbon or May Park will be forthcoming. Shall I run down to Midland County and look after these two precious objects? Oh, would you be so good, Mr. Ellen? I knew you would be so kind. Personal inquiry, you know. There's nothing like it. Nothing at all. Meantime, what shall you do with the child? The pseudo-heiress, if pseudo she be, shall you correct her, let her know her place? I think, responded Miss Wilcox reflectively, I think not exactly as yet. My plan is to do nothing in a hurry. We will inquire first. If, after all, she should turn out to be connected as was at first supposed, one had better not do anything which one might afterward regret. No, I shall make no difference with her till I hear from you again. Very good, as you please, said Mr. Ellen, with that coolness which made him so convenient a counsellor, in Miss Wilcox's opinion. In his dry laconism, she found the response suited to her outer worldliness. She thought he said enough if he did not oppose her. The comment he stinted so avariciously, she did not want. Mr. Ellen ran down, as he said, to Midland County. It was an errand that seemed to suit him, for he had curious predilections as well as peculiar methods of his own. Any secret quest was to his taste. Perhaps there was something of the amateur detective in him. He could conduct an inquiry and draw no attention. His quiet face never looked inquisitive, nor did his sleepless eye betray vigilance. He was away about a week. The day after his return, he appeared in Miss Wilcox's presence as cool as if he had seen her but yesterday. Confronting her with that fathomless face he liked to show her, he first told her he had done nothing. Let Mr. Ellen be as enigmatical as he would. He never puzzled Miss Wilcox. She never saw enigma in the man. Some people feared, because they did not understand him. To her, it had not yet occurred to begin to spell his nature or analyze his character. If she had an impression about him, it was that he was an idle but obliging man, not aggressive, a few words, but often convenient, whether he were clever and deep, or deficient and shallow. Close or open, odd or ordinary, she saw no practical end to be answered by inquiry, and therefore did not inquire. Why had he done nothing, she now asked? Chiefly because there was nothing to do. Then he could give her no information? Not much. Only this, indeed. Conway Fitzgibbon was a man of straw, May Park a house of cards. There was no vestige of such a man or mansion in Midland County, or in any other shire in England. Tradition herself had nothing to say about either the name or the place. The oracle of old deeds and registers, when consulted, had not responded. Who can he be, then, that came here? And who is this child? That's just what I can't tell you. 
an incapacity which makes me say i have done nothing and how am i to get paid can't tell you that either a quarter's board and education owing and master's terms besides pursued miss wilcox how infamous i can't afford the loss and if we were only in the good old times said mr ellen where we ought to be you might just send miss matilda out to the plantations in virginia sell her for what she is worth and pay yourself matilda indeed and fitzgibbon a little impostor i wonder what her real name is betty hodge paul smith hannah jones suggested mr ellen now cried miss wilcox give me credit for sagacity it's very odd but try as i would and i made every effort i never could really like that child she has had every indulgence in this house and i am sure i made great sacrifice of feeling to principle in showing her much attention for i could not make any one believe the degree of antipathy i have all along felt toward her yes i can believe it i saw it did you well it proves that my discernment is rarely at fault her game is up now however and time it was i have said nothing to her yet but now have her in while i am here said mr ellen has she known of this business is she in the secret is she herself an accomplice or a mere tool have her in miss wilcox rang the bell demanded matilda fitzgibbon and the false heiress soon appeared she came in in her ringlets her sash and her fur below dress adornments alas no longer acceptable stand there said miss wilcox sternly checking her as she approached the hearth stand there on the farther side of the table i have a few questions to put to you and your business will be to answer them and mind let us have the truth we will not endure lies ever since miss fitzgibbon had been found in the fit her face had retained a peculiar paleness and her eyes a dark orbit when thus addressed she began to shake and blanch like conscious guilt personified who are you demanded miss wilcox what do you know about yourself a sort of half interjection escaped the girl's lips it was a sound expressing partly fear and partly the shock the nerves feel when an evil very long expected at last and suddenly arrives keep yourself still and reply if you please said miss wilcox whom nobody should blame for lacking pity because nature had not made her compassionate what is your name we know you have no right to that of matilda fitzgibbon she gave no answer i do insist upon a reply speak you shall sooner or later so you had better do it at once this inquisition had evidently a very strong effect upon the subject of it she stood as if palsied trying to speak but apparently not competent to articulate miss wilcox did not fly into a passion but she grew very stern and urgent spoke a little loud and there was a dry clamour in her raised voice which seemed to beat upon the ear and bewilder the brain her interest had been injured her pocket wounded she was vindicating her rights and she had no eye to see and no nerve to feel but for the point in hand mr ellen appeared to consider himself strictly a looker-on he stood on the hearth very quiet at last the culprit spoke a low voice escaped her lips oh my head she cried lifting her hands to her forehead she staggered but caught the door and did not fall some accusers might have been startled by such a cry even silenced not so miss wilcox she was neither cruel nor violent but she was coarse because insensible having just drawn breath she went on harsh as ever mr ellen leaving the hearth deliberately paced up the room as if he were tired of standing still and would walk a little for a change in returning and passing near the door and the criminal a faint breath seemed to seek his ear whispering his name oh mr ellen the child dropped as she spoke a curious voice not like mr ellen's though it came from his lips asked miss wilcox to cease speaking and say no more he gathered from the floor what had fallen on it she seemed overcome but not unconscious resting beside mr ellen in a few minutes she again drew breath she raised her eyes to him come my little one have no fear said he 
Reposing her head against him, she gradually became reassured. It did not cost him another word to bring her round. Even that strong trembling was calmed by the mere effects of his protection. He told Miss Wilcox, with remarkable tranquility, but still with a certain decision, that the little girl must be put to bed. He carried her upstairs and saw her laid there himself. Returning to Miss Wilcox, he said, Say no more to her. Beware, or you will do more mischief than you think or wish. That kind of nature is very different from yours. It is not possible that you should like it, but let it alone. We will talk more on the subject tomorrow. Let me question her. End of Charlotte Bronte's Last Sketch by Charlotte Bronte When I Was a Witch by Charlotte Perkins Gilman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. If I had understood the terms of that one-sided contract with Satan, the time of witching would have lasted longer. You may be sure of that. But how was I to tell? It just happened, and it has never happened again though I've tried the same preliminaries as far as I could control them. The thing began all of a sudden one October midnight, the 30th to be exact. It had been hot, really hot, all day, and was sultry and thunderous in the evening, no air stirring, and the whole house stewing with that ill-advised activity which always seems to move the steam radiator when it isn't wanted. I was in a state of simmering rage, hot enough even without the weather and the furnace, and I went up on the roof to cool off. A top floor apartment has that advantage, among others. You can take a walk without the mediation of an elevator boy. There are things enough in New York to lose one's temper over at the best of times, and on this particular day they seem to happen all at once, and some fresh ones. The night before, cats and dogs had broken my rest, of course. My morning paper was more than usually mendacious, and my neighbor's morning paper, more visible than my own as I went downtown, was more than usually salacious. My cream wasn't cream. My egg was a relic of my past. My new napkins were giving out. Being a woman, I'm supposed not to swear, but when the motorman disregarded my plain signal and grinned as he rushed by, when the subway guard waited till I was just about to step on board and then slammed the door in my face, standing behind it calmly for some minutes before the bell rang to warn his closing, I desired to swear like a mule driver. At night, it was worse. The way people paw one's back in the crowd. The cowpuncher who packs the people in or jerks them out. The men who smoke and spit, law or no law. The woman whose saw-edged cartwheel hats, swashing feathers and deadly pins, add so to one's comfort inside. Well, as I said, I was in a particularly bad temper and went up on the roof to cool off. Heavy black clouds hung low overhead and lightning flickered threateningly here and there. A starved black cat stole from behind a chimney and mewed dolefully. Poor thing, she had been scalded. The street was quiet for New York. I leaned over a little and looked up and down the long parallels of twinkling lights. A belated cab drew near, the horse so tired he could hardly hold his head up. Then the driver, with a skill born of plenteous practice, flung out his long-lashed whip and curled it under the poor beast's belly with a stinging cut that made me shudder. The horse shuddered too, poor wretch and jingled his harness with an effort at a trot. I leaned over the parapet and watched that man with a spirit of unmitigated ill will. I wish, said I, slowly, and I did wish it with all my heart, that every person who strikes or otherwise hurts a horse unnecessarily shall feel the pain intended, and the horse not feel it. It did me good to say it, anyhow, but I never expected any result. I saw the man throw up his hands, heard him scream, but I never thought what the matter was, even then. The lean black cat, timid but trustful, rubbed against my skirt and mewed. Poor kitty, I said. Poor kitty, it is a shame. And I thought tenderly of all the thousands of hungry hunted cats who stink and suffer in a great city. Later, when I tried to sleep, and up across the stillness rose the raucous shrieks of some of these same sufferers, my pity turned cold. Any fool that will try to keep a cat in a city, I muttered angrily. Another yell, a pause, an ear-torturing, continuous cry. I wish, I burst forth, that every cat in the city was comfortably dead. A sudden silence fell, and in course of time I got to sleep. 
Things went fairly well the next morning till I tried another egg. They were expensive eggs, too. I can't help it, said my sister, who keeps house. I know you can't, I admitted, but somebody could help it. I wish the people who are responsible had to eat their old eggs and never get a good one till they sold good ones. They'd stop eating eggs, that's all, said my sister, and eat meat. Let them eat meat, I said recklessly. The meat is as bad as the eggs. It's so long since we've had a clean, fresh chicken that I've forgotten how they taste. It's cold storage, said my sister. She is a peaceable sort. I'm not. Yes, cold storage, I snapped. It ought to be a blessing to tide over shortages, equalize supplies, and lower prices. What does it do? Corner the market, raise prices the year round, and make all the food bad. My anger rose. If there was any way of getting at them, I cried. The law don't touch them. They need to be cursed somehow. I'd like to do it. I wish the whole crowd that profit by this vicious business might taste their bad meat, their old fish, and their stale milk, whatever they ate. Yes, and feel the prices as we do. They couldn't, you know. They're rich, said my sister. I know that, I admitted sulkily. There's no way of getting at them. But I wish they could. And I wish they knew how people hated them and felt that too, till they mended their ways. When I left for my office, I saw a funny thing. A man who drove a garbage cart took his horse by the bits and jerked and wretched brutally. I was amazed to see him clap his hands to his own jaws with a moan, while the horse philosophically licked his chops and looked at him. The man seemed to resent his expression and struck him on the head, only to rub his own pole and swear amazedly, looking around to see who had hit him. The horse advanced a step, stretching a hungry nose toward a garbage pail crowned with cabbage leaves, and the man, recovering his sense of proprietorship, swore at him and kicked him in the ribs. That time he had to sit down, turning pale and weak. I watched with growing wonder and delight. A market wagon came clattering down the street, the hard-faced young raffian fresh from his morning task. He gathered the ends of the reins and brought them down on the horse's back with a resounding thwack. The horse did not notice this at all, but the boy did. He yelled. I came to a place where many teamsters were at work hauling dirt and crushed stone. A strange silence and peace hung over the scene where usually the sound of the lash and sight of brutal blows made me hurry by. The men were talking together a little and seemed to be exchanging notes. It was too good to be true. I gazed and marveled, waiting for my car. It came merrily running along. It was not full. There was one not far ahead, which I had missed in watching the horses. There was no other near it in the rear. Yet the coarse-faced person and authority who ran it went gaily by without stopping, though I stood on the track almost and waved my umbrella. A hot flush of rage surged to my face. I wish you felt the blow you deserve, said I viciously, looking after the car. I wish you'd have to stop and back to here and open the door and apologize. I wish that would happen to all of you every time you play that trick. To my infinite amazement, that car stopped and backed till the front door was before me. The motorman opened it, holding his hand to his cheek. Beg your pardon, madame, he said. I passed in, dazed, overwhelmed. Could it be? Could it possibly be that that what I wished came true? The idea sobered me, but I dismissed it with a scornful smile. No such luck, said I. Opposite me sat a person in petticoats. She was of a sort I particularly detest. No real body of bones and muscles, but the contours of grouped sausages. Complacent, gaudily dressed, heavily wigged and ratted, with powder and perfume and flowers and jewels, and a dog. A poor, wretched, little artificial dog, alive, but only so by virtue of man's insolence, not a real creature that God made and the dog had clothes on, and a bracelet. His fitted jacket had a pocket, and a pocket handkerchief. He looked sick and unhappy. I mediated on his pitiful position, and that of all the other poor chained prisoners, leading unnatural lives of enforced celibacy, cut off from sunlight, fresh air, the use of their limbs, led forth at stated intervals by unwilling servants, to defile our streets, overfed, underexercised, nervous, and unhealthy. And we say we love them, said I bitterly to myself. No wonder they bark and howl and go mad. No wonder they have almost as many diseases as we do. I wish, here the thought I had dismissed struck me again. I wish that all the unhappy dogs in cities would die at once. I watched the sad-eyed little invalid across the car. He dropped his head and died. She never noticed it till she got off. Then she made it fuss enough. The evening papers were full of it.
Some sudden pestilence had struck both dogs and cats, it would appear. Red headlines struck the eye. Big letters and columns were filled out of the complaints of those who had lost their pets, of the sudden labors of the Board of Health, and interviews with the doctors. All day, as I went through the office routine, the strange sense of this new power struggled with reason and common knowledge. I even tried a few furtive test wishes, wished that the wastebasket would fall over, that the inkstand would fill itself, but they didn't. I dismissed the idea as pure foolishness till I saw those newspapers and heard people telling worse stories. One thing I decided at once, not to tell a soul. Nobody'd believe me if I did, said I to myself, and I won't give them the chance. I've scored on cats and dogs anyhow, and horses. As I watched the horses at work that afternoon and thought of all their unknown sufferings from crowded city stables, bad air, and insufficient food, and from the wearing strain of asphalt pavements in wet and icy weather, I decided to have another try on horses. I wish, said I slowly and carefully, but with a fixed intensity of purposes, that every horse owner, keeper, hire, and driver, or rider might feel what the horse feels when he suffers at our hands. Feel it keenly and constantly till the case is mended. I wasn't able to verify this attempt for some time, but the effect was so general that it got widely talked about soon, and this new wave of humane feeling soon raised the status of horses in our city. Also, it diminished their numbers. People began to prefer motor drays, which was a mighty good thing. Now I felt pretty well assured in my own mind and kept my assurance to myself. Also, I began to make a list of my cherished grudges with a fine sense of power and pleasure. I must be careful, I said to myself, very careful, and above all things, make the punishment fit the crime. The subway crowding came to my mind next, both the people who crowd because they have to and the people who make them. I mustn't punish anybody for what they can't help, I mused, but when it's pure meanness. Then I bethought me of the remote stockholders, of the more immediate directors, of the more painfully prominent officials and insolent employees, and got to work. I might as well make a good job of it while this lasts, said I to myself. It's quite a responsibility, but lots of fun. And I wish that every person responsible for the conditions of our subways might be mysteriously compelled to ride up and down in them continuously during rush hours. This experiment I watched with keen interest, but for the life of me, I could see little difference. There were a few more well-dressed persons in the crowds, that was all. So I came to the conclusion that the general public was mostly to blame and carried their daily punishment without knowing it. For the insolent guards and cheating ticket sellers who give you short change very slowly when you are dancing on one foot and your train is there, I merely wish that they might feel the pain their victims would like to give them, short of real injury. They did, I guess. Then I wish similar things for all manner of corporations and officials. It worked. It worked amazingly. There was a sudden conscientious revival all over the country. The dry bones rattled and sat up. Boards of directors, having troubles enough of their own, were aggravated by innumerable communications from suddenly sensitive stockholders. In mills and mints and railroads, things began to mend. The country buzzed. The papers fattened. The churches sat up and took credit to themselves. I was incensed at this, and, after brief consideration, wished that every minister would preach to his congregation exactly what he believed and what he thought of them. I went to six services the next Sunday, about ten minutes each, for two sessions. It was most amusing. A thousand pulpits were emptied forthwith, refilled, re-emptied, and so on, from week to week. People began to go to church, men largely. Women didn't like it as well. They had always supposed the ministers thought more highly of them than now appeared to be the case. One of my oldest grudges was against the sleeping car people, and now I began to consider them. How often I had grinned and borne it, with other thousands submitting helplessly. There is a railroad, a common carrier, and you have to use it. You pay for your transportation a good round sum. Then if you wish to stay in the sleeping car during the day, they charge you another two dollars and a half for the privilege of sitting there, whereas you have paid for a seat when you bought your ticket. That seat is now sold to another person, twice sold. Five dollars in twenty-four hours in a space six feet by three by three at night, and one seat by day, twenty-four of these privileges to a car, a hundred and twenty dollars a day for the rent of the car, and the passengers to pay the porter besides. That makes forty-four thousand eight hundred dollars a year. Sleeping cars are expensive to build, they say. So are hotels, but they do not charge at such a rate. Now, what could I do to get even? 
Nothing could ever put back the dollars in the millions of pockets, but it might be stopped now, this beautiful process. So I wish that all persons who profited by this performance might feel a shame so keen that they would make public avowal and apology, and, as parcel restitution, offer their wealth to promote the cause of free railroads. Then I remembered parrots. This was lucky, for my wrath flamed again. It was really cooling, as I tried to work out responsibility and adjust penalties. But parrots! Any person who wants to keep a parrot should go and live on an island alone with their preferred conversationalist. There was a huge squawky parrot right across the street from me, adding its senseless, rasping cries to the more necessary evils of other noises. I had also an aunt with a parrot. She was a wealthy, ostentatious person who had been an only child and inherited her money. Uncle Joseph hated the yelling bird, but that didn't make any difference to Aunt Mathilda. I didn't like this aunt and wouldn't visit her, lest she think I was truckling for the sake of her money. But after I had wished this time, I called at the time set for my curse to work, and it did work, with a vengeance. There sat poor Uncle Joe, looking thinner and meeker than ever, and my aunt, like an overripe plum, complacent enough. "'Let me out,' said Polly, suddenly. "'Let me out to take a walk.' "'The clever thing,' said Aunt Mathilda. "'He never said that before.' She let him out. Then he flapped up on the chandelier and sat among the prisms, quite safe." "'What an old pig you are, Mathilda,' said the parrot. She started to her feet, naturally. "'Born a pig, trained a pig, a pig by nature and education,' said the parrot. "'Nobody'd put up with you, except for your money, unless it's this long-suffering husband of yours. He wouldn't if he hadn't the patience of Job.' "'Hold your tongue,' screamed out Mathilda. "'Come down from there. Come here.' Polly cocked his head and jingled the prisms. "'Sit down, Mathilda,' he said cheerfully. "'You've got to listen.' You are fat and homely and selfish. You are a nuisance to everybody about you. You have got to feed me and take care of me better than ever. And you've got to listen to me when I talk, pig. I visited another person with a parrot the next day. She put a cloth over his cage when I came in. Take it off, said Polly. She took it off. Won't you come into the other room? She asked me nervously. Better stay here, said her pet. Still, 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 still. She sat still. "'Your hair is mostly false,' said Pretty Paul. "'And your teeth and your outlines? "'You eat too much. You are lazy. "'You ought to exercise and don't know enough. "'Better apologize to this lady for backbiting. "'You've got to listen.' "'The trade in parrots fell off from that day. "'They say there is no call for them. "'But the people who kept parrots keep them yet. "'Parrots live a long time. "'Boars were a class of offenders "'against whom I had long borne undying enmity. Now I rubbed my hands and began on them, with the simple wish, that every person whom they bored should tell them the plain truth. There is one man who I have especially in mind. He was blackballed at a peasant club, but continues to go there. He isn't a member, he just goes, and no one does anything to him. It was very funny after this. He appeared that very night at a meeting, and almost every person present asked him how he came there. You're not a member, you know, they said. Why do you butt in? Nobody likes you. Some are more lenient with him. Why don't you learn to be more considerate of others and make some real friends, they said. To have a few friends who do enjoy your visits ought to be pleasanter than being a public nuisance. He disappeared from that club anyway. I began to feel very cocky indeed. In the food business, there was already a marked improvement and in transportation. The hubbub of reformation waxed louder daily, urged on by the unknown sufferings of all the profiters by inequity. The papers thrived on all this, and as I watched the loud voice protestations of my pet abomination in journalism, I had a brilliant idea, literally. Next morning, I was downtown early, watching the men open their papers. My abomination was shamefully popular, and never more so than this morning. Across the top was printing in gold letters. All intentional lies, in advertisement, editorial, news, or any other column, scarlet. All malicious matter, crimson. All careless or ignorant mistakes, pink. All for direct self-interest of owner, dark green. All mere bait to sell the paper, bright green. All advertising, primary or secondary, brown. All sensational and salacious matter, yellow. All hired hypocrisy, purple. Good fun, instruction and entertainment, blue. True and necessary news and honest editorials, ordinary print. You never saw such a crazy quilt of paper. They were bought like hotcakes for some days, but the real business fell off very soon. They'd have stopped it all if they could, but the papers looked all right when they came off the press. The color scheme flamed out only to the bona fide reader. 
I let this work for about a week to the immense joy of all the other papers and then turned it on to them all at once. Newspaper reading became very exciting for a little, but the trade fell off. Even newspaper editors could not keep on feeding a market like that. The blue printed and ordinary printed matter grew from column to column and page to page. Some papers, small, to be sure, but refreshing, began to appear in blue and black alone. This kept me interested and happy for quite a while, so much that I quite forgot to be angry at other things. There was such a change in all kinds of business, following the mere printing of truth in the newspapers. It began to appear as if we had lived in a sort of delirium, not really knowing the facts about anything. As soon as we really knew the facts, we began to behave very differently, of course. What really brought all my enjoyment to an end was women. Being a woman, I was naturally interested in them, and could see some things more clearly than men could. I saw their real power, their real dignity, their real responsibility in the world, and then the way they dressed and behaved used to make me fairly frantic. Twas like seeing archangels playing jackstraw, or real horses only used as rocking horses. So I determined to get after them. How to manage it? What to hit first? Their hats? Their ugly, inane, outrageous hats? That is what one thinks of first. Their silly, expensive clothes, their diddling beads and jewelry, their greedy childishness, mostly of the women provided for by rich men. Then I thought of all the other women, the real ones, the vast majority, patiently doing the work of servants without even a servant's pay, and neglecting the noblest duties of motherhood in favor of house service, the greatest power on earth, blind, chained, untaught, in a treadmill. I thought of what they might do, compared to what they did do, and my heart swelled with something that was far from anger. Then I wished, with all my strength, that women, all women, might realize womanhood at last, its power and pride and place in life, that they might see their duties as mothers of the world, to love and care for everyone alive, that they might see their duty to men, to choose only the best, and then to bear and rear better ones, that they might see their duty as human beings and come right out into full life and work in happiness. I stopped, breathless, with shining eyes. I waited, trembling for things to happen. Nothing happened. You see, this magic which had fallen on me was black magic, and I had wished white. It didn't work at all, and what was worse, it stopped all the other things that were working so nicely. Oh, if I had only thought to wish permanence for those lovely punishments. If only I had done more while I could do it, and half appreciated my privileges when I was a witch. End of When I Was a Witch by Charlotte Perkins Gilman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Derek Stewart. An Experiment in Misery by Stephen Crane. It was late at night, and a fine rain was swirling softly down, causing the pavements to glisten with hue of steel and blue and yellow in the rays of innumerable lights. A youth was trudging slowly, without enthusiasm, with his hands buried deep in his trousers' pockets, toward the downtown places where beds can be hired for coppers. He was clothed in an aged and tattered suit, and his derby was a marvel of the dust-covered crown and torn rim. He was going forth to eat as the wanderer may eat, and sleep as the homeless sleep. By the time he had reached City Hall Park, he was so completely plastered with yells of bum and hobo and with various unholy epithets that small boys had applied to him at intervals that he was in a state of the most profound dejection. The sifting rain saturated the old velvet collar of his overcoat, and as the wet cloth pressed against his neck, he felt that there no longer could be pleasure in his life. He looked around him searching for an outcast of highest degree, that they too might share miseries, but the lights threw a quivering glare over rows and circles of deserted benches that glistened damply, showing patches of wet sod behind them. It seemed that their usual freights had fled on this night to better things. There were only squads of well-dressed Brooklyn people who swarmed towards the bridge. The young man loitered about for a time and then went shuffling off down Park Row. In the sudden descent and style of the dress of the crowd, he felt relief as if he were at last in his own country. He began to see tatters that matched his tatters. In Chatham Square, there were aimless men strewn in front of saloons and lodging houses, standing sadly, 
patiently reminding one vaguely of the attitudes of chickens in a storm he aligned himself with these men and turned slowly to occupy himself with the flowing life of the great street through the mists of the cold and storming night the cable cars went in silent procession great affairs shining with red and brass moving with formidable power calm and irresistible dangerful and gloomy breaking silence only by the loud fierce cry of the gong two rivers of people swarmed along the sidewalks spattered with black mud which made each shoe leave a scar-like impression overhead elevated trains with a shrill grinding of the wheels stopped at the station which upon its leg-like pillars seemed to resemble some monstrous kind of crab squatting over the street the quick fat puffings of the engine could be heard down an alley there were sombre curtains of purple and black on which street lamps dully glittered like embroidered flowers a saloon stood with a voracious air on a corner a sign leaning against the front of the doorpost announced free hot soup tonight the swing doors snapping to and fro like ravenous lips made gratified smacks as the saloon gorged itself with plump men eating with astounding and endless appetite smiling in some indescribable manner as the men came from all directions like sacrifices to a heathenish superstition caught by the delectable sign the young man allowed himself to be swallowed a bartender placed a schooner of dark and pretentious beer on the bar its monumental form upreared until the froth atop was above the crown of the young man's brown derby soup over there gents said the bartender affably a little yellow man in rags and the youth grasped their schooners and went with speed toward a lunch counter where a man with oily but imposing whiskers ladled genially from a kettle until he had furnished his two medicants with a soup that was steaming hot and in which there was little floating suggestions of chicken the young man sipping his broth felt the cordiality expressed by the warmth of the mixture and he beamed at the man with oily but imposing whiskers who was presiding like a priest behind an altar have some more gents inquired of the two sorry figures before him the little yellow man accepted with a swift gesture but the youth shook his head and went out following a man whose wondrous seediness promised that he would have a knowledge of cheap lodging houses on the sidewalk he accosted the seedy man say do you know a cheap place to sleep the other hesitated for a time gazing sideways finally he nodded in the direction of the street i sleep up there he said when i got the price how much ten cents the young man shook his head dolefully that's too rich for me at that moment there approached the two a reeling man in strange garments his head was a fuddle of bushy hair and whiskers from which his eyes peered with a guilty slant in a close scrutiny it was possible to distinguish the cruel lines of a mouth which looked as if its lips had just closed with satisfaction over some tender and piteous morsel he appeared like an assassin steeped in crimes performed awkwardly but at this time his voice was tuned to the coaxing key of an affectionate puppy he looked at the men with wheedling eyes and began to sing a little melody for charity say gents can't you give a poor feller a couple cents to get a bed i got five and i gets another two gets me a bed now on the square gents can't you just give me two cents to get a bed now you know how a respectable gentleman feels when he's down on his luck and i the seedy man staring with imperturbable countenance at a train which clattered overhead interrupted in an expressionless voice i got to go there but the youth spoke to the prayerful assassin in tones of astonishment and inquiry say you must be crazy why don't you strike somebody that looks as if they had money the assassin tottering about on his uncertain legs and at intervals brushing imaginary objects before his nose entered into a long explanation of the psychology of the situation it was so profound that it was unintelligible when he had exhausted the subject the young man said to him let's see the five cents the assassin wore an expression of drunken woe at this sentence filled with suspicion of him a deeply pained air and he began to fumble in his clothing his red hands trembling presently he announced in a voice of bitter grief as if he had been betrayed there's only four four said the young man thoughtfully well look here i'm a stranger 
and if you'll steer me into your cheap joint, I'll find the other three. The assassin's countenance became instantly radiant with joy. His whiskers quivered with the wealth of his alleged emotions. He seized the young man's hand in a transport of delight and friendliness. Begod, he cried. If y'all do that, Bagod, I'd say he is a damn good fella. I would, and I remember you all my life. I would, Bagod, and if I ever got the chance, I'd return the compliment. He spoke with drunken dignity. Bagod, I'd treat you what? I would. I'd always remember you. The young man drew back, looking at the assassin coldly. Oh, that's all right, he said. You show me the joint. That's all you got to do. The assassin, gesticulating gratitude, led the young man along a dark street. Finally, he stopped before a little dusty door. He raised his hand impressively. Look here, he said, and there was a thrill of deep and ancient wisdom upon his face. I brought you here, and that's my part, isn't it? If the place don't suit you, you needn't get mad at me, need you? There won't be no bad feeling, will there? No, said the young man. The assassin waved his arm tragically and led the march up the steep stairway. On the way, the young man furnished the assassin with three pennies. At the top, a man with benevolent spectacles looked at them through a hole in the board. He collected their money, wrote some names on a register, and speedily was leading the two men along a gloom-shrouded corridor. Shortly after the beginning of this journey, the young man felt his liver turn white. For from the dark and secret places of the building there came to his nostrils strange and unspeakable odors, that assailed him like malignant diseases with wings. They seemed to be from human bodies packed in dens, the exhalations from a thousand pairs of reeking lips, the fumes from a thousand bygone debauches, the expression of a thousand present miseries. A man, naked save for a little snuff-colored undershirt, was parading sleepily along the corridor. He rubbed his eyes and, giving vent to her prodigious yawn, demanded to be told the time. Half past one, the man yawned again. He opened a door, and for a moment his form was outlined against a black opaque interior. To this door came three men, and as it was again opened, the unholy odors rushed out like fiends, so that the young man was obliged to struggle against the overpowering wind. It was some time before the youth's eyes were good in the intense gloom within, but the man with benevolent spectacles led him skillfully pausing but for a moment to deposit the limp assassin upon a cot. He took the youth to a cot that lay tranquilly by the window, and showing him a tall locker for clothes that stood near the head with the ominous air of a tombstone, left him. The youth sat on his cot and peered about him. There was a gas jet in a distant part of the room that burned a small flickering orange-hued flame. It caused vast masses of tumbled shadows in all parts of the place save where, immediately about it, there was a little gray haze. As the young man's eyes became used to the darkness, he could see upon the cots that thickly littered the floor the forms of men sprawled out, lying in death-like silence, or heaving and snoring with tremendous effort, like stabbed fish. The youth locked his derby and his shoes in the mummy case near him, and then lay down with an old and familiar coat around his shoulders, a blanket he handed gingerly, drawing it over part of the coat. The cot was covered with leather, and as cold as melting snow. The youth was obliged to shiver for some time on this affair, which was like a slab. Presently, however, his chill gave him peace, and during this period of leisure from it he turned his head to stare at his friend the assassin, whom he could dimly discern where he lay sprawled on a cot in the abandon of a man filled with drink. He was snoring with incredible vigor. His wet hair and beard dimly glistened, and his inflamed nose shone with subdued luster like a red light in a fog. Within reach of the youth's hand was one who lay with yellow breasts and shoulders bare to the cold draughts. One arm hung over the side of the cot, and the fingers lay full length upon the wet cement floor of the room. Beneath the inky brows could be seen the eyes of a man exposed by the partly open lids. To the youth it seemed that he and this corpse-like being were exchanging a prolonged stare, and that the other threatened with his eyes. He drew back, watching his neighbor from the shadows of his blanket edge. The man did not move once through the night, but lay in this stillness as of death like a body stretched out, expectant of the surgeon's knife. And all through the room could be seen the tawny hues of naked fish, limbs thrust into the darkness, projecting beyond the cots, upreared knees arms hanging long and thin over the cot edges. 
For the most part, they were statuesque, carven, dead, with the curious lockers standing all about like tombstones. There was a strange effect of a graveyard where bodies were merely flung. Yet occasionally could be seen limbs wildly tossing in fantastic nightmare gestures, accompanied by guttural cries, grunts, oaths. And there was one fellow off in a gloomy corner, who in his dreams was oppressed by some frightful calamity, for of a sudden he began to utter long wails that went almost like yells from a hound, echoing wailfully and weird through the chill place of tombstones where men lay like the dead. The sound in its high piercing beginnings that dwindled to final melancholy moans expressed a red and grim tragedy of the unfathomable possibilities of the man's dreams. But to the youth these were not merely the shrieks of a vision-pierced man, they were an utterance of the meaning of the room and its occupants. It was to him the protest of the wretch who feels the touch of the imperturbable granite wheels, and who then cries with impersonal eloquence with a strength not from him, giving voice to the wail of a whole section, a class, a people. This, weaving into the young man's brain, and mingling with his views of the vast and somber shadows that, like mighty black fingers curled around the naked bodies, made the young man so that he did not sleep, but lay carving the biographies for those men from his meager experience, at times the fellow in the corner howled in a writhing agony of his imaginations. Finally a long lance point of grey light shot through the dusty panes of the window. Without, the young man could see roofs drearily white in the dawning. The point of light yellowed and grew brighter, until the golden rays of the morning sun came in bravely and strong. They touched with radiant color the form of a small fat man, who snored in stuttering fashion. His round and shiny bald head glowed suddenly with the valor of a decoration. He sat up, blinked at the sun, swore fretfully, and pulled his blanket over the ornamental splendors of his hand. The youth contentedly watched this root of the shadows before the bright spears of the sun, and presently he slumbered. When he awoke, he heard the voice of the assassin raised in valiant curses. Putting up his head, he perceived his comrade seated on the side of the cot engaged in scratching his neck with long fingernails that wraps like files. Holy gee, this is a new breed. They got can openers on their feet, he continued in a violent triad. The young man hastily unlocked his closet and took out his shoes and hat. As he sat on the side of the cot lacing his shoes, he glanced about and saw that the daylight had made the room comparatively commonplace and uninteresting. The men whose faces seemed stolid, serene, or absent were engaged in dressing while a great crackle of the bantering conversation arose. A few were parading in unconcerned nakedness. Here and there were men of brawn whose skin shone clear and ruddy. They took splendid poses, standing massively like chefs. When they had dressed in their ungainly garments, there was an extraordinary change. They then showed bumps and deficiencies of all kinds. There were others who exhibited many deformities. Shoulders were slanting, humped, pulled this way and pulled that way, and notable among these latter men was the little fat man who had refused to allow his head to be glorified. His pudgy form, builded like a pear, bustled to and fro, while he swore in fishwife fashion. It appeared that some article of his apparel had vanished. The young man attired speedily, and went to his friend the assassin. At first the latter looked dazed at the sight of the youth. This face seemed to be appealing to him through the cloud wastes of his memory. He scratched his neck and reflected. At last he grinned, a broad smile gradually spreading until his countenance was around with illumination. Hello, Willie, he cried cheerily. Hello, said the young man. Are you ready to fly? Sure. The assassin tied his shoe carefully with some twine and came ambling. When he reached the street, the young man experienced no sudden relief from unholy atmospheres. He had forgotten all about them, and he had been breathing naturally and with no sensation of discomfort or distress. He was thinking of these things as he was walking along the street, when he was suddenly startled by feeling the assassin's hand, trembling with excitement, clutching his arm, and when the assassin spoke, his voice went into quivers from a supreme agitation. 
I'll be hully, bloomin' blowed if there wasn't a feller with a nightshirt on up there in that joint. The youth was bewildered for a moment, but presently he turned to smile indulgently at the assassin's humor. Oh, you're de liar, he merely said, whereupon the assassin began to gesture extravagantly and take oath by strange gods. He frantically placed himself at the mercy of remarkable fates if his tale were not true. Yes, he did. I crossed my heart a thousand times, he protested, and at the moment his eyes were large with amazement, his mouth wrinkled in an unnatural glee. Yes, sir. A nightshirt. A hully white nightshirt. You lie. No, sir. I hope to die before I can get another ball if there wasn't a jay with a wild hully bloomin' white nightshirt. His face was filled with the infinite wonder of it. A hully white nightshirt, he continually repeated. The young man saw the dark entrance to a basement restaurant. There was a sign which read, No mystery about our hash. And there were other age-stained, world-battered legends which told him that the place was within his means. He stopped before it and spoke to the assassin. I guess I'll get something to eat. At this, the assassin, for some reason, appeared to be quite embarrassed. He gazed at the seductive front of the eating place for a moment. Then he started slowly up the street. Well, goodbye, Willie, he said bravely. For an instant, the youth studied the departing figure. He then called out, Hold on a minute. As they came together, he spoke in a certain fierce way, as if he feared that the other would think him to be charitable. Look a here, if you want to get some breakfast, I'll lend you three cents to do it with. But say, look a here, you've got to get out in a hustle. I ain't going to support you, or I'll go broke before midnight. I ain't no millionaire. I take me oath, Willie, said the assassin earnestly. The only thing I really needs is a ball. My throat feels like a frying pan, but as I can't get a ball, why, the next big thing is breakfast, and if you can't do that for me, by God, then I say use the whitest lad I ever see. They spent a few moments in dexterous exchanges of phrases, in which they had each protested that the other was, as the assassin had originally said, a respectable gentleman and they concluded with mutual assurances that they were the souls of intelligence and virtue. Then they went into the restaurant. There was a long counter, dimly lighted from hidden sources. Two or three men in soiled white aprons rushed here and there. The youth bought a bowl of coffee for two cents and a roll for one cent. The assassin purchased the same. The bowls were webbed with brown seams, and the tin spoons wore an air of having emerged from the first pyramid. Upon them were black moss-like encrustations of age, and they were bent and scarred from the attacks of long-forgotten teeth. But over their repast the wanderers waxed warm and mellow. The assassin grew affable as the hot mixture went soothingly down his parched throat, and the young man felt courage flow through his veins. Memories began to throng in on the assassin, and he brought forth long tales, intricate, incoherent, delivered with a chattering swiftness as from an old woman. Great job out in Orange. Boss kept you hustling through all time. I was there three days, and then I went asking and lent me a dollar. G -g -go, go to the devil, he says, and I lose me a job. South no good. Damn niggers work for 25 and 30 cents a day. Run white man out. Good grub, though. Easy living. Yes. Used to work a little in Toledo. Rafting logs. Making two or three dollars a day in the spring. Lived high. Cold as ice, though, in the winter. I was raised in northern New York. Oh, uh, yeah, just get out, live there. No beer and a whiskey, though, all the way off in the woods. But all the good hot grub you can eat. But God, I hung around there as long as I could till the old man fired me. Get the hell out of here, you worthless skunk. Get the hell out of here and go die, he says. You're hell of a father, I says. You are, and I quit him. As they were passing from the dim eating place, they encountered an old man who was trying to steal forth with a tiny package of food. But a tall man with an indomitable mustache stood dragon fashion, barring the way of escape. They heard the old man raise a plaintive protest. Ah, you always want to know what I take out, and you never see that I usually bring a package in here from my place of business. As the wanderers trudged slowly along Park Row, the assassin began to expand and grow blithe. But God, we've been living like kings, he said, smacking his appreciative lips. Look out or we'll have to pay for it tonight, said the youth with gloomy warning. But the assassin refused to turn his gaze toward the future. He went with a limping step, into which he injected a suggestion of lamb-like gambles. His mouth was wreathed in a red grin.
In the city hall park, the two wanderers sat down in the little circle of benches sanctified by traditions of their class. They huddled in their old garments, slumberously conscious of the march of the hours which for them had no meaning. The people of the street hurrying hither and thither made a blend of black figures changing yet freeze-like. They walked in their good clothes as upon important missions, giving no gaze to the two wanderers seated upon the benches. They expressed to the young man his infinite distance from all that he valued. Social position, comfort, the pleasures of living were unconquerable kingdoms. He felt a sudden awe. And in the background a multitude of buildings, of pitiless hues and sternly high, were to him emblematic of a nation forcing its regal head into the clouds, throwing no downward glances, in the sublimity of its aspirations ignoring the wretches who may flounder at its feet. The roar of the city in his ear was to him the confusion of strange tongues babbling heedlessly. It was the clink of coin, the voice if the city's hopes which were to him no hopes. He confessed himself an outcast, and his eyes from under the lowered rim of his hat began to glance guiltily, wearing the criminal expression that comes with no certain convictions. End of An Experiment in Misery by Stephen Crane Part 1 of The Fall of Edward Bernard by W. Somerset Maugham this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. The Fall of Edward Barnard by W. Somerset Maugham Bateman Hunter slept badly. For a fortnight on the boat that brought him from Tahiti to San Francisco, he had been thinking of the story he had to tell, and for three days on the train, he had repeated to himself the words in which he meant to tell it. But in a few hours now, he would be in Chicago, and doubts assailed him. His conscience, always very sensitive, was not at ease. He was uncertain that he had done all that was possible. It was on his honor to do much more than the possible. And the thought was disturbing that, in a matter which so nearly touched his own interests, he had allowed his interests to prevail over his quixotry. Self-sacrifice appealed so keenly to his imagination that the inability to exercise it gave him a sense of disillusion. He was like the philanthropist who, with altruistic motives, builds model dwellings for the poor and finds that he has made a lucrative investment. He cannot prevent the satisfaction he feels in the ten per cent which rewards the bread he had cast upon the waters but he has an awkward feeling that it detracts somewhat from the savour of his virtue bateman hunter knew that his heart was pure but he was not quite sure how steadfastly when he told her his story he would endure the scrutiny of isabel longstaff's cool grey eyes they were far-seeing and wise she measured the standards of others by her own meticulous uprightness and there could be no greater censure than the cold silence with which she expressed her disapproval of a conduct that did not satisfy her exacting code there was no appeal from her judgment for having made up her mind she never changed it but bateman would not have had her different he loved not only the beauty of her person slim and straight with the proud carriage of her head, but still more the beauty of her soul. With her truthfulness, her rigid sense of honor, her fearless outlook, she seemed to him to collect in herself all that was most admirable in his countrywoman. But he saw in her something more than the perfect type of the American girl. He felt that her exquisiteness was peculiar in a way to her environment, and he was assured that no city in the world could have produced her but chicago a pang seized him when he remembered that he must deal so bitter a blow to her pride and anger flamed up in his heart when he thought of edward barnard but at last the train steamed in to chicago and he exulted when he saw the long streets of gray houses he could hardly bear his impatience at the thought of state and wabash with their crowded pavements their hustling traffic and their noise 
he was at home and he was glad that he had been born in the most important city in the united states san francisco was provincial new york was effete the future of america lay in the development of its economic possibilities and chicago by its position and by the energy of its citizens was destined to become the real capital of the country i guess i shall live long enough to see it the biggest city in the world bateman said to himself as he stepped down to the platform his father had come to meet him and after a hearty handshake the pair of them tall slender and well made with the same fine ascetic features and thin lips walked out of the station mr hunter's automobile was waiting for them and they got in mr hunter caught his son's proud and happy glance as he looked at the street glad to be back son he asked i should just think i was said bateman his eyes devoured the restless scene i guess there's a bit more traffic here than in your south sea island laughed mr hunter did you like it there give me chicago dad answered bateman you haven't brought edward barnard back with you no how was he bateman was silent for a moment and his handsome sensitive face darkened i'd sooner not speak about him dad he said at last that's all right my son i guess your mother will be a happy woman today they passed out of the crowded streets in the loop and drove along the lake till they came to the imposing house an exact copy of a chateau on the loire which mr hunter had built himself some years before as soon as bateman was alone in his room he asked for a number on the telephone his heart leapt when he heard the voice that answered him good morning isabel he said gaily good morning bateman how did you recognize my voice it is not so long since i heard it last besides i was expecting you when may i see you unless you have anything better to do perhaps you'll dine with us tonight you know very well that i couldn't possibly have anything better to do i suppose that you're full of news he thought he detected in her voice a note of apprehension yes he answered well you must tell me tonight good-bye she rang off it was characteristic of her that she should be able to wait so many unnecessary hours to know what so immensely concerned her to bateman there was an admirable fortitude in her restraint at dinner at which beside himself and isabel no one was present but her father and mother he watched to guide the conversation into the channels of an urbane small talk and it occurred to him that in just such a manner would a marquise under the shadow of the guillotine toy with the affairs of a day that would know no morrow her delicate features the aristocratic shortness of her upper lip and her wealth of fair hair suggested the marquise again and it must have been obvious even if it were not notorious that in her veins flowed the best blood in chicago the dining-room was a fitting frame to her fragile beauty for isabel had caused the house a replica of a palace on the grand canal at venice to be furnished by an english expert in the style of louis the fifteenth and the graceful decoration linked with the name of that amorous monarch enhanced her loveliness and at the same time acquired from it a more profound significance for isabel's mind was richly stored and her conversation however light was never flippant she spoke now of the musicale to which she and her mother had been in the afternoon of the lectures which an english poet was giving at the auditorium of the political situation and of the old master which her father had recently bought for fifty thousand dollars in new york it comforted bateman to hear her he felt that he was once more in the civilized world at the centre of culture and distinction and certain voices troubling and yet against his will refusing to still their clamor were at last silent in his heart gee but it's good to be back in chicago he said at last dinner was over and when they went out of the dining-room isabel said to her mother i'm going to take bateman along to my den 
we have various things to talk about very well my dear said mrs longstaff you'll find your father and me in the madame du barry room when you're through isabel led the young man upstairs and showed him into the room of which he had so many charming memories though he knew it so well he could not repress the exclamation of delight which had always wrung from him she looked round with a smile i think it's a success she said the main thing is that it's right there's not even an ash-tray that isn't of the period i suppose that's what makes it so wonderful like all you do it's so superlatively right they sat down in front of a log fire and isabel looked at him with calm grave eyes now what have you to say to me she asked i hardly know how to begin is edward bernard coming back no there was a long silence before bateman spoke again and with each of them it was filled with many thoughts it was a difficult story he had to tell for there were things in it which were so offensive to her sensitive ears that he could not bear to tell them and yet in justice to her no less than in justice to himself he must tell her the whole truth it had all begun long ago when he and edward bernard still at college had met isabel longstaff at the tea-party given to introduce her to society they had both known her when she was a child and they long-legged boys but for two years she had been in europe to finish her education and it was with a surprised delight that they renewed acquaintance with a lovely girl who returned both of them fell desperately in love with her but bateman saw quickly that she had eyes only for edward and devoted to his friend he resigned himself to the role of confidant he passed bitter moments but he could not deny that edward was worthy of his good fortune and anxious that nothing should impair the friendship he so greatly valued he took care never by a hint to disclose his own feelings in six months the young couple were engaged but they were very young and isabel's father decided that they should not marry at least till edward graduated they had to wait a year bateman remembered the winter at the end of which isabel and edward were to be married a winter of dances and theatre parties and of informal gaieties at which he the constant third was always present he loved her no less because she would shortly be his friend's wife her smile a gay word she flung him the confidence of her affection never ceased to delight him and he congratulated himself somewhat complacently because he did not envy them their happiness then an accident happened a great bank failed there was a panic on the exchange and edward barnard's father found himself a ruined man he came home one night told his wife that he was penniless and after dinner going into his study shot himself a week later edward barnard with a tired white face went to isabel and asked her to release him her only answer was to throw her arms round his neck and burst into tears don't make it harder for me sweet he said do you think i can let you go now i love you how can i ask you to marry me the whole thing's hopeless your father would never let you i haven't a cent what do i care i love you he told her his plans he had to earn money at once and george braunschmidt an old friend of his family had offered to take him into his own business he was a south sea merchant and he had agencies in many of the islands of the pacific he had suggested that edward should go to tahiti for a year or two where under the best of his managers he could learn the details of that varied trade and at the end of that time he promised the young man a position in chicago it was a wonderful opportunity and when he had finished his explanations isabel was once more all smiles you foolish boy why have you been trying to make me miserable his face lit up at her words and his eyes flashed isabel you don't mean to say you'll wait for me 
Don't you think you're worth it? She smiled. Ah, don't laugh at me now. I beseech you to be serious. It may be for two years. Have no fear. I love you, Edward. When you come back, I will marry you. Edward's employer was a man who did not like delay, and he had told him that if he took the post, he offered he must sail that day, week from San Francisco. Edward spent his last evening with Isabel. It was after dinner that Mr. Longstaff, saying he wanted a word with Edward, took him into the smoking room. Mr. Longstaff had accepted good-naturedly the arrangement which his daughter had told him of, and Edward could not imagine what mysterious communication he had now to make. He was not a little perplexed to see that his host was embarrassed. He faltered. He talked of trivial things. At last he blurted it out. "'I guess you've heard of Arnold Jackson,' he said, looking at Edward with a frown. Edward hesitated. His natural truthfulness obliged him to admit a knowledge he would gladly have been able to deny. "'Yes, I have. But it's a long time ago. I guess I didn't pay very much attention. There are not many people in Chicago who haven't heard of Arnold Jackson, said Mr. Longstaff bitterly, and if there are, they'll have no difficulty in finding someone who'll be glad to tell them. Did you know he was Mrs. Longstaff's brother? Yes, I knew that. Of course, we've had no communication with him for many years. He left the country as soon as he was able to, and I guess the country wasn't sorry to see the last of him. We understand he lives in Tahiti. My advice to you is to give him a wide berth, but if you do hear anything about him, Mrs. Longstaff and I would be very glad if you'd let us know. Sure. That was all I wanted to say to you. Now, I dare say you'd like to join the ladies. There are a few families that have not among their members one whom, if their neighbors permitted, they would willingly forget, and they are fortunate when the lapse of a generation or two has invested his vagaries with a romantic glamour. But when he is actually alive, if his peculiarities are not of the kind that can be condoned by the phrase, he is nobody's enemy but his own, a safe one when the culprit has no worse to answer for than alcoholism or wandering affections. The only possible course is silence. And it was this which the Longstaffs had adopted towards Arnold Jackson. They never talked of him. They would not even pass through the street in which he had lived. Too kind to make his wife and children suffer for his misdeeds, they had supported them for years, but on the understanding that they should live in Europe. They did everything they could to blot out all recollection of Arnold Jackson, and yet were conscious that the story was as fresh in the public mind as when first the scandal burst upon a gaping world. Arnold Jackson was as black a sheep as any family could suffer from. A wealthy banker, prominent in his church, a philanthropist, a man respected by all, not only for his connections, in his veins ran the blue blood of Chicago, but also for his upright character. He was arrested one day on a charge of fraud, and the dishonesty which the trial brought to light was not of the sort which could be explained by sudden temptation. It was deliberate and systematic. Arnold Jackson was a rogue. When he was sent to the penitentiary for seven years, there were few who did not think he had escaped, likely. When at the end of this last evening the lovers separated, it was with many protestations of devotion. Isabel, all tears, was consoled a little by her certainty of Edward's passionate love. It was a strange feeling that she had. It made her wretched to part from him, and yet she was happy because he adored her. This was more than two years ago. He had written to her by every mail since, twenty-four letters in all, for the mail went but once a month, and his letters had been all that a lover's letter should be. They were intimate and charming, humorous sometimes, 
especially of late, and tender. At first they suggested that he was homesick. They were full of his desire to get back to Chicago and Isabel. And, a little anxiously, she wrote begging him to persevere. She was afraid that he might throw up his opportunity and come racing back. She did not want her lover to lack endurance, and she quoted to him the lines, quote, I could not love thee, dear, so much, loved I not honor more. Unquote. But presently he seemed to settle down, and it made Isabel very happy to observe his growing enthusiasm to introduce American methods into that forgotten corner of the world. But she knew him, and at the end of the year, which was the shortest time he could possibly stay in Tahiti, she expected to have to use all her influence to dissuade him from coming home. It was much better that he should learn the business thoroughly, and if they had been able to wait a year, there seemed no reason why they should not wait another. She talked it over with Bateman Hunter, always the most generous of friends. During those first few days after Edward went, she did not know what she would have done without him and they decided that Edward's future must stand before everything. It was with relief that she found as the time passed that he made no suggestion of returning. "'He's splendid, isn't he?' she exclaimed to Bateman. "'He is white, through and through. "'Reading between the lines of his letter, I know he hates it over there, but he's sticking it out because—' She blushed a little, and Bateman— with the grave smile which was so attractive in him, finished the sentence for her. Because he loves you. It makes me feel so humble, she said. You're wonderful, Isabel. You're perfectly wonderful. But the second year passed, and every month Isabel continued to receive a letter from Edward, and presently it began to seem a little strange that he did not speak of coming back. He wrote as though he were settled definitely in Tahiti, and what was more, comfortably settled. She was surprised. Then she read his letters again, all of them, several times, and now, reading between the lines, indeed, she was puzzled to notice a change which had escaped her. The later letters were as tender and as delightful as the first, but the tone was different. She was vaguely suspicious of their humor. She had the instinctive mistrust of her sex for that unaccountable quality, and she discerned in them now a flippancy which perplexed her. She was not quite certain that the Edward who wrote to her now was the same Edward that she had known. One afternoon, the day after a mail had arrived from Tahiti, when she was driving with Bateman, he said to her, Did Edward tell you when he was sailing? No. He didn't mention it. I thought he might have said something to you about it. Not a word. You know what Edward is, she laughed in reply. He has no sense of time. If it occurs to you next time, you write. You might ask him when he's thinking of coming. Her manner was so unconcerned that only Bateman's acute sensitiveness could have discerned in her request a very urgent desire. He laughed lightly. Yes, I'll ask him. I can't imagine what he's thinking about. A few days later, meeting him again, she noticed that something troubled him. They had been much together since Edward left Chicago. They were both devoted to him, and each in his desire to talk of the absent one found a willing listener. The consequence was that Isabel knew every expression of Bateman's face, and his denials now were useless against her keen instinct. Something told her that his harassed look had to do with Edward, and she did not rest till she had made him confess. The fact is, he said at last, I heard in a roundabout way that Edward was no longer working for Braunschmidt and Company, and yesterday I took the opportunity to ask Mr. Braunschmidt himself. Well, Edward left his employment with them nearly a year ago. How strange! He should have said nothing about it. Bateman hesitated, but he had gone so far now that he was obliged to tell the rest. 
It made him feel dreadfully embarrassed. He was fired. In heaven's name, what for? It appears they warned him once or twice, and at last they told him to get out. They say he was lazy and incompetent. Edward? They were silent for a while, and then he saw that Isabel was crying. Instinctively, he seized her hand. Oh, my dear, don't, don't, he said. I can't bear to see it. She was so unstrung that she let her hand rest in his. He tried to console her. It's incomprehensible, isn't it? It's so unlike Edward. I can't help feeling there must be some mistake. She did not say anything for a while, and when she spoke, it was hesitatingly. Has it struck you that there was anything queer in his letters lately? She asked, looking away, her eyes all bright with tears. He did not quite know how to answer. I have noticed a change in them, he admitted. He seems to have lost that high seriousness which I admired so much in him. One would almost think that the things that matter, well, don't matter. Isabel did not reply. She was vaguely uneasy. Perhaps in his answer to your letter he'll say when he's coming home. All we can do is to wait for that. Another letter came from Edward for each of them, and still he made no mention of his return. But when he wrote, he could not have received Bateman's inquiry. The next mail would bring them an answer to that. The next mail came, and Bateman brought Isabel the letter he had just received. But the first glance of his face was enough to tell her that he was disconcerted. She read it through carefully, and then, with slightly tightened lips, read it again. It's a very strange letter, she said. I don't quite understand it. One might almost think that he was joshing me, said Bateman, flushing. It reads like that, but it must be unintentional. That's so unlike Edward. He says nothing about coming back. If I weren't so confident of his love, I should think. I hardly know what I should think. It was then that Bateman had broached the scheme which, during the afternoon, had formed itself in his brain. The firm, founded by his father, in which he was now a partner, a firm which manufactured all manner of motor vehicles, was about to establish agencies in Honolulu, Sydney, and Wellington, and Bateman proposed that himself should go instead of the manager who had been suggested. He could return by Tahiti. In fact, traveling from Wellington, it was inevitable to do so, and he could see Edward. There's some mystery, and I'm going to clear it up. That's the only way to do it. Oh, Bateman, how can you be so good and kind? she exclaimed. You know there's nothing in the world I want more than your happiness, Isabel. She looked at him, and she gave him her hands. You're wonderful, Bateman. I didn't know there was anyone in the world like you. How can I ever thank you? I don't want your thanks. I only want to be allowed to help you. She dropped her eyes and flushed a little. She was so used to him that she had forgotten how handsome he was. He was as tall as Edward and well-made, but he was dark and pale of face, while Edward was ruddy. Of course she knew he loved her. It touched her. She felt very tenderly towards him. It was from this journey that Bateman Hunter was now returned. The business part of it took him somewhat longer than he expected, and he had much time to think of his two friends. He had come to the conclusion that it could be nothing serious that prevented Edward from coming home. A pride, perhaps, which made him determined to make good before he claimed the bride he adored. But it was a pride that must be reasoned with. Isabel was unhappy. Edward must come back to Chicago with him and marry her at once. A position could be found for him in the works of the Hunter Motor Traction and Automobile Company. Bateman, with a bleeding heart, exulted at the prospect 
of giving happiness to the two persons he loved best in the world at the cost of his own he would never marry he would be godfather to the children of edward and isabel and many years later when they were both dead he would tell isabel's daughter how long long ago he had loved her mother bateman's eyes were veiled with tears when he pictured this scene to himself meaning to take edward by surprise he had not cabled to announce his arrival and when at last he landed at tahiti he allowed a youth who said he was the son of the house to lead him to the hotel de la fleur he chuckled when he thought of his friend's amazement on seeing him the most unexpected of visitors walk into his office by the way he asked as they went along can you tell me where i shall find mr edward barnard barnard said the youth i seem to know the name he's an american a tall fellow with light brown hair and blue eyes he's been here over two years of course now i know who you mean you mean mr jackson's nephew whose nephew mr arnold jackson i don't think we're speaking of the same person answered bateman frigidly he was startled it was queer that arnold jackson known apparently to all and sundry should live here under the disgraceful name in which he had been convicted but bateman could not imagine whom it was that he had passed off as his nephew mrs longstaff was his only sister and he had never had a brother the young man by his side talked volubly in an english that had something in it of the intonation of a foreign tongue and bateman with a sidelong glance saw what he had not noticed before that there was in him a good deal of native blood a touch of hauteur involuntarily entered into his manner they reached the hotel when he arranged about his room bateman asked to be directed to the premises of braunschmidt and company they were on the front facing the lagoon and glad to feel the solid earth under his feet after eight days at sea he sauntered down the sunny road to the water's edge having found the place he sought bateman sent in his card to the manager and was led through a lofty barn-like room half store and half warehouse to an office in which sat a stout spectacled bald-headed man can you tell me where i shall find mr edward barnard i understand he was in this office for some time that is so i don't know just where he is but i thought he came here with a particular recommendation from mr braunschmidt i know mr braunschmidt very well the fat man looked at bateman with shrewd suspicious eyes he called to one of the boys in the warehouse say henry where's barnard now do you know he's working cameron's i think came the answer from someone who did not trouble to move the fat man nodded if you turn to your left when you get out of here you'll come to cameron's in about three minutes bateman hesitated i think i should tell you that edward barnard is my greatest friend i was very much surprised when i heard he'd left braunschmidt and company the fat man's eyes contracted till they seemed like pinpoints and their scrutiny made bateman so uncomfortable that he felt himself blushing i guess braunschmidt and company and edward barnard didn't see eye to eye on certain matters he replied bateman did not quite like the fellow's manner so he got up not without dignity and with an apology for troubling him bade him good day he left the place with a singular feeling that the man he had just interviewed had much to tell him but no intention of telling it he walked in the direction indicated and soon found himself at cameron's it was a trader's store such as he had passed half a dozen of on his way and when he entered the first person he saw in his shirt sleeves measuring out a length of trade cotton was edward he gave him a start to see him engaged in so humble an occupation but he had scarcely appeared when edward looking up caught sight of him and gave a joyful cry of surprise bateman who ever thought of seeing you here 
he stretched his arm across the counter and wrung bateman's hand there was no self-consciousness in his manner and the embarrassment was all on bateman's side just wait till i've wrapped this package with perfect assurance he ran his scissors across the stuff folded it made it into a parcel and handed it to the dark-skinned customer pay at the desk please then smiling with bright eyes he turned to bateman how did you show up here gee i am delighted to see you sit down old man make yourself at home we can't talk here come along to my hotel i suppose you can get away this he added with some apprehension of course i can get away we're not so businesslike as all that in tahiti he called out to a chinese who was standing behind the opposite counter ah ling when the boss comes tell him a friend of mine's just arrived from america and i've gone out to have a drain with him ah light said the chinese with a grin edward slipped on a coat and putting on his hat accompanied bateman out of the store bateman attempted to put the matter facetiously i didn't expect to find you selling three and a half yards of rotten cotton to a greasy nigger he laughed Braunschmidt fired me you know and i thought that would do as well as anything else edward's candor seemed to bateman very surprising but he thought it indiscreet to pursue the subject i guess you won't make a fortune where you are he answered somewhat dryly i guess not but i earn enough to keep body and soul together and i'm quite satisfied with that you wouldn't have been two years ago we grow wiser as we grow older retorted edward gaily part two of the fall of edward bateman by w somerset mom reading my memoir bateman took a glance at him edward was dressed in a suit of shabby white ducks none too clean and a large straw hat of native make he was thinner than he had been deeply burned by the sun and he was certainly better looking than ever but there was something in his appearance that disconcerted bateman he walked with a new jauntiness there was a carelessness in his demeanour a gaiety about nothing in particular which bateman could not precisely blame but which exceedingly puzzled him i'm blessed if i can see what he's got to be so darn cheerful about he said to himself they arrived at the hotel and sat on the terrace a chinese boy brought them cocktails edward was most anxious to hear all the news of chicago and bombarded his friend with eager questions his interest was natural and sincere but the odd thing was that it seemed equally divided among a multitude of subjects he was as eager to know how bateman's father was as what isabel was doing he talked of her without a shade of embarrassment but she might just as well have been his sister as his promised wife and before bateman had done analyzing the exact meaning of edward's remarks he found that the conversation had drifted to his own work and the buildings his father had lately erected he was determined to bring the conversation back to isabel and was looking for the occasion when he saw edward wave his hand cordially a man was advancing towards them on the terrace, but Bateman's back was turned to him, and he could not see him. "'Come and sit down,' said Edward gaily. The newcomer approached. He was a very tall, thin man, in white ducks, with a fine head of curly white hair. His face was thin, too, long, with a large hooked nose and a beautiful, expressive mouth. "'This is my old friend Bateman Hunter.' i've told you about him said edward his constant smile breaking on his lips i'm pleased to meet you mr hunter i used to know your father the stranger held out his hand and took the young man's in a strong friendly grasp it was not till then that edward mentioned the other's name mr arnold jackson bateman turned white and he felt his hands grow cold this was the forger the convict this was isabel's uncle he did not know what to say 
he tried to conceal his confusion arnold jackson looked at him with twinkling eyes i dare say my name is familiar to you bateman did not know whether to say yes or no and what made it more awkward was that both jackson and edward seemed to be amused it was bad enough to have forced on him the acquaintance of the one man on the island he would rather have avoided but worse to discern that he was being made a fool of perhaps however he had reached this conclusion too quickly for jackson without a pause added i understand you're very friendly with the longstaffs mary longstaff is my sister now bateman asked himself if arnold jackson could think him ignorant of the most terrible scandal that chicago had ever known but jackson put his hand on edward's shoulder i can't sit down teddy he said i'm busy but you two boys had better come up and dine tonight that'll be fine said edward it's very kind of you mr jackson said bateman frigidly but i'm here for so short a time my boat sails tomorrow you know i think if you'll forgive me i won't come oh nonsense i'll give you a native dinner my wife's a wonderful cook teddy will show you the way come early so as to see the sunset i can give you both a shakedown if you like of course we'll come said edward there's always the devil of a row in the hotel on the night a boat arrives and we can have a good yarn up at the bungalow i can't let you off mr hunter jackson continued with the utmost cordiality i want to hear all about chicago and mary he nodded and walked away before bateman could say another word we don't take refusals in tahiti laughed edward besides you'll get the best dinner on the island what did he mean by saying his wife was a good cook i happen to know his wife's in geneva that's a long way off for a wife isn't it said edward and it's a long time since he saw her i guess it's another wife he's talking about for some time bateman was silent his face was set in grave lines but looking up he caught the amused look in edward's eyes and he flushed darkly arnold jackson is a despicable rogue he said i greatly fear he is answered edward smiling i don't see how any decent man can have anything to do with him perhaps i'm not a decent man end of part one of the fall of edward bernard by w somerset mom part two of the fall of edward bernard by w somerset mom this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt perard do you see much of him edward yes quite a lot he's adopted me as his nephew bateman leaned forward and fixed edward with his searching eyes do you like him very much but don't you know doesn't everybody doesn't everyone here know that he's a forger and that he's been a convict he ought to be hounded out of civilized society edward watched a ring of smoke that floated from his cigar into the still scented air i suppose he is a pretty unmitigated rascal he said at last and i can't flatter myself that any repentance for his misdeeds offers one an excuse for condoning them he was a swindler and a hypocrite you can't get away from it i never met a more agreeable companion he's taught me everything i know what has he taught you cried bateman in amazement how to live bateman broke into ironical laughter <laughs> a fine master 
is it owing to his lessons that you lost the chance of making a fortune and earn your living now by serving behind a counter in a ten-cent store he has a wonderful personality said edward smiling good-naturedly perhaps you'll see what i mean tonight i'm not going to dine with him if that's what you mean nothing would induce me to set foot within that man's house come to oblige me bateman we've been friends for so many years you won't refuse me a favor when i ask it edward's tone had in it a quality new to bateman its gentleness was singularly persuasive if you put it like that edward i'm bound to come he smiled bateman reflected moreover that it would be as well to learn what he could about arnold jackson it was plain that he had a great ascendancy over edward and if it was to be combated it was necessary to discover in what exactly it consisted the more he talked with edward the more conscious he became that a change had taken place in him he had an instinct that it behooved him to walk warily and he made up his mind not to broach the real purport of his visit till he saw his way more clearly he began to talk of one thing and another of his journey and what he had achieved by it of politics in chicago of this common friend and that of their days together at college at last edward said he must get back to his work and proposed that he should fetch bateman at five so that they could drive out together to arnold jackson's house by the way i rather thought you'd be living at this hotel said bateman as he strolled out of the garden with edward i understand it's the only decent one here not i laughed edward it's a deal too grand for me i rent a room just outside the town it's cheap and clean if i remember right those weren't the points that seemed most important to you when you lived in chicago chicago i don't know what you mean by that edward it's the greatest city in the world i know said edward bateman glanced at him quickly but his face was inscrutable when are you coming back to it i often wonder smiled edward this answer and the manner of it staggered bateman but before he could ask for an explanation edward waved to a half-caste who was driving a passing motor give us a ride down charlie he said he nodded to bateman and ran after the machine that had pulled up a few yards in front bateman was left to piece together a mass of perplexing impressions edward called for him in a rickety trap drawn by an old mare and they drove along a road that ran by the sea on each side of it were plantations coconut and vanilla and now and then they saw a great mango its fruit yellow and red and purple among the massy green of the leaves now and then they had a glimpse of the lagoon smooth and blue with here and there a tiny islet graceful with tall palms arnold jackson's house stood on a little hill and only a path led to it so they unharnessed the mare and tied her to a tree leaving the trap by the side of the road to bateman it seemed a happy-go-lucky way of doing things but when they went up to the house they were met by a tall handsome native woman no longer young with whom edward cordially shook hands he introduced bateman to her this is my friend mr hunter we're going to dine with you lavina all right she said with a quick smile arnold ain't back yet we'll go down and bathe let us have a couple of pareos the woman nodded and went into the house who is that asked bateman oh that's lavina she's arnold's wife bateman tightened his lips but said nothing in a moment the woman returned with a bundle which she gave to edward and the two men scrambling down a steep path made their way to a grove of coconut trees on the beach they undressed and edward showed his friend how to make the strip of red trade cotton which is called a pareo into a very neat pair of bathing drawers soon they were splashing in the warm shallow water edward was in great spirits he laughed and shouted and sang 
He might have been fifteen. Bateman had never seen him so gay, and afterwards, when they lay on the beach, smoking cigarettes, in the limpid air, there was such an irresistible light-heartedness in him that Bateman was taken aback. "'You seem to find life mighty pleasant,' said he. "'I do.' They heard a soft movement, and looking round, saw that Arnold Jackson was coming towards them. "'I thought I'd come down and fetch you two boys back,' he said. "'Did you enjoy your bath, Mr. Hunter?' "'Very much,' said Bateman. Arnold Jackson, no longer in spruce ducks, wore nothing but a pareo round his loins and walked barefoot. His body was deeply browned by the sun. With his long, curling white hair and his ascetic face, he made a fantastic figure in the native dress, but he bore himself without a trace of self-consciousness. "'If you're ready, we'll go right up,' said Jackson. "'I'll just put on my clothes,' said Bateman. Why, Teddy, didn't you bring a pareo for your friend? I guess he'd rather wear clothes, smiled Edward. I certainly would, answered Bateman grimly, as he saw Edward gird himself in the loincloth and stand ready to start before he himself had got his shirt on. Won't you find it rough walking without your shoes? he asked Edward. It struck me the path was a trifle rocky. Oh, I'm used to it. It's a comfort to get into a pareo when one gets back from town, said Jackson. If you were going to stay here, I should strongly recommend you to adopt it. It's one of the most sensible costumes I have ever come across. It's cool, convenient, and inexpensive. They walked up to the house, and Jackson took them into a large room with whitewashed walls and an open ceiling in which a table was laid for dinner. Bateman noticed that it was set for five. "'Eva, come and show yourself to Teddy's friend, and then shake us a cocktail,' called Jackson. Then he led Bateman to a long, low window. "'Look at that,' he said, with a dramatic gesture. "'Look well.' Below them, coconut trees tumbled down steeply to the lagoon, and the lagoon, in the evening light, had the color, tender and varied, of a dove's breast. On a creek, at a little distance, were the clustered huts of a native village, and towards the reef was a canoe, sharply silhouetted, in which there were a couple of natives fishing. Then, beyond, you saw the vast calmness of the Pacific, and twenty miles away, airy and unsubstantial like the fabric of a poet's fancy, the unimaginable beauty of the island, which is called Murea. It was all so lovely that Bateman stood abashed. "'I've never seen anything like it,' he said at last. Arnold Jackson stood staring in front of him, and in his eyes was a dreamy softness. His thin, thoughtful face was very grave. Bateman, glancing at it, was once more conscious of its intense spirituality. "'Beauty,' murmured Arnold Jackson. You seldom see beauty face to face. Look at it well, Mr. Hunter, for what you see now you will never see again, since the moment is transitory, but it will be an imperishable memory in your heart. You touch eternity. His voice was deep and resonant. He seemed to breathe forth the purest idealism, and Bateman had to urge himself to remember that the man who spoke was a criminal and a cruel cheat. But Edward, as though he heard a sound, turned round quickly. Here is my daughter, Mr. Hunter. Bateman shook hands with her. She had dark, splendid eyes and a red mouth tremulous with laughter, but her skin was brown, and her curling hair, rippling down her shoulders, was coal black. She wore but one garment, a mother hubbard of pink cotton. Her feet were bare, and she was crowned with a wreath of white-scented flowers. She was a lovely creature. She was like a goddess of the Polynesian spring. She was a little shy, but not more shy than Bateman, to whom the whole situation was highly embarrassing, and it did not put him at his ease to see this sylph-like thing take a shaker and with a practiced hand mix three cocktails. 
Let us have a kick in them, child, said Jackson. She poured them out and, smiling delightfully, handed one to each of the men. Bateman flattered himself on his skill in the subtle art of shaking cocktails, and he was not a little astonished, on tasting this one, to find that it was excellent. Jackson laughed proudly when he saw his guest's involuntary look of appreciation. Not bad, is it? I taught the child myself, and in the old days, in Chicago, I considered that there wasn't a bartender in the city that could hold a candle to me. When I had nothing better to do in the penitentiary, I used to amuse myself by thinking out new cocktails. But when you come down to brass tacks, there's nothing to beat a dry martini. Bateman felt as though someone had given him a violent blow on the funny bone, and he was conscious that he turned red and then white. But before he could think of anything to say, a native boy brought in a great bowl of soup, and the whole party sat down to dinner. Arnold Jackson's remark seemed to have aroused in him a train of recollections, for he began to talk of his prison days. He talked quite naturally, without malice, as though he was relating his experiences at a foreign university. He addressed himself to Bateman, and Bateman was confused and then confounded. He saw Edward's eyes fixed on him, and there was in them a flicker of amusement. He blushed scarlet, for it struck him that Jackson was making a fool of him, and then because he felt absurd, and knew there was no reason why he should, he grew angry. Arnold Jackson was impudent, there was no other word for it, and his callousness, whether assumed or not, was outrageous. The dinner proceeded. Bateman was asked to eat sundry messes, raw fish, and he knew not what, which only his civility induced him to swallow, but which he was amazed to find very good eating. Then an incident happened which to Bateman was the most mortifying experience of the evening. There was a little circlet of flowers in front of him, and for the sake of conversation he has a remark about it. It's a wreath that Eva made for you, said Jackson, but I guess she was too shy to give it to you. Bateman took it up in his hand and made a polite little speech of thanks to the girl. You must put it on, she said, with a smile and a blush. I? I don't think I'll do that. It's the charming custom of the country, said Arnold Jackson. There was one in front of him, and he placed it on his hair. Edward did the same. I guess I'm not dressed for the part, said Bateman, uneasily. Would you like a pareo? said Eva, quickly. I'll get you one in a minute. No, thank you. I'm quite comfortable as I am. Show him how to put it on, Eva said Edward. At that moment, Bateman hated his greatest friend. Eva got up from the table, and with much laughter, placed the wreath on his black hair. It suits you very well, said Mrs. Jackson. Don't it suit him, Arnold? Of course it does. Bateman sweated at every pore. Isn't it a pity it's dark, said Eva. We could photograph you all three together. Bateman thanked his stars it was. He felt that he must look prodigiously foolish in his blue serge suit and high collar, very neat and gentlemanly, with that ridiculous wreath of flowers on his head. He was seething with indignation, and he had never in his life exercised more self-control than now when he presented an affable exterior. He was furious with that old man, sitting at the head of the table, half-naked, with his saintly face and the flowers on his handsome white locks. The whole position was monstrous. The dinner came to an end, and Eva and her mother remained to clear away while the three men sat on the veranda. It was very warm, and the air was scented with the white flowers of the night. The full moon, sailing across an unclouded sky, made a pathway on the broad sea that led to the boundless realms of forever. Arnold Jackson began to talk. His voice was rich and musical. He talked now of the natives and of the old legends of the country. He told strange stories of the past, 
stories of hazardous expeditions into the unknown, of love and death, of hatred and revenge. He told of the adventurers who had discovered those distant islands, of the sailors who, settling in them, had married the daughters of great chieftains, and of the beachcombers who had led their varied lives on those silvery shores. Bateman, mortified and exasperated, at first listened sullenly, but presently some magic in the words possessed him, and he sat entranced. The mirage of romance obscured the light of common day. Had he forgotten that Arnold Jackson had a tongue of silver, a tongue by which he had charmed vast sums out of the credulous public, a tongue which very nearly enabled him to escape the penalty of his crimes? No one had a sweeter eloquence, and no one had a more acute sense of climax. Suddenly he rose. "'Well, you two boys haven't seen one another for a long time. I shall leave you to have a yarn. Teddy will show you your quarters when you want to go to bed.' "'Oh, I wasn't thinking of spending the night, Mr. Jackson,' said Bateman. "'You'll find it more comfortable. We'll see that you're called in good time. Then, with a courteous shake of the hand, stately as though he were a bishop in canonicals, Arnold Jackson took leave of his guest. "'Of course I'll drive you back to Papite, if you like,' said Edward, "'but I advise you to stay. It's bully driving in the early morning.' For a few minutes neither of them spoke. Bateman wondered how he should begin on the conversation, which all the events of the day made him think more urgent. "'When are you coming back to Chicago?' he asked suddenly. For a moment. Edward did not answer. Then he turned rather lazily to look at his friend and smiled. I don't know. Perhaps never. What in heaven's name do you mean? cried Bateman. I'm very happy here. Wouldn't it be folly to make a change? Man alive, you can't live here all your life. This is no life for a man. It's a living death. Oh, Edward, come away at once before it's too late. I felt that something was wrong. You're infatuated with the place. You've succumbed to evil influences, but it only requires a wrench, and when you're free from these surroundings, you'll thank all the gods there be. You'll be like a dope fiend when he's broken from his drug. You'll see that for two years you've been breathing poisoned air. You can't imagine what a relief it will be when you fill your lungs once more with the fresh, pure air of your native country. He spoke quickly, the words tumbling over one another in his excitement, and there was in his voice sincere and affectionate emotion. Edward was touched. It is good of you to care so much, old friend. Come with me tomorrow, Edward. It was a mistake that you ever came to this place. This is no life for you. You talk of the sort of life in that. How do you think a man gets the best out of life? Why, I should have thought there could be no two answers to that. By doing his duty, by hard work, by meeting all the obligations of his state and station. And what is his reward? His reward is the consciousness of having achieved what he set out to do. It all sounds a little portentous to me, said Edward and in the lightness of the night bateman could see that he was smiling i'm afraid you'll think i've degenerated sadly there are several things i think now which i dare say would have seemed outrageous to me three years ago have you learnt them from arnold jackson said bateman scornfully you don't like him perhaps you couldn't be expected to i didn't when i first came i had just the same prejudice as you is a very extraordinary man. You saw for yourself that he makes no secret of the fact that he was in a penitentiary. I do not know that he regrets it, or the crimes that led him there. The only complaint he ever made in my hearing was that when he came out his health was impaired. I think he does not know what remorse is. He is completely unmoral. He accepts everything, and he accepts himself as well. He is generous and kind. 
He always was, interrupted Bateman, on other people's money. I found him a very good friend. Is it unnatural that I should take a man as I find him? The result is that you lose the distinction between right and wrong. No, they remain just as clearly divided in my mind as before. But what has become a little confused in me is the distinction between the bad man and the good one. Is Arnold Jackson a bad man who does good things, or a good man who does bad things? It's a difficult question to answer. Perhaps we make too much of the difference between one man and another. Perhaps even the best of us are sinners, and the worst of us are saints. Who knows? You will never persuade me that white is black, and that black is white, said Bateman. I'm sure I shan't, Bateman. Bateman could not understand why the flicker of a smile crossed Edward's lips when he thus agreed with him. Edward was silent for a minute. When I saw you this morning, Bateman, he said then, I seemed to see myself as I was two years ago. The same collar, and the same shoes, the same blue suit, the same energy, the same determination. By God, I was energetic. The sleepy methods of this place made my blood tangle. I went about, and everywhere I saw possibilities for development and enterprise. There were fortunes to be made here. It seemed to me absurd that the copra should be taken away from here in sacks and the oil extracted in America. It would be far more economical to do all that on the spot, with cheap labor and save freight, and I saw already the vast factories springing up on the island. Then the way they extracted it from the coconut seemed to me hopelessly inadequate, and I invented a machine which divided the nut and scooped out the meat at the rate of two hundred and forty an hour. The harbor was not large enough. I made plans to enlarge it, then to form a syndicate to buy land, put up two or three large hotels, and bungalows for occasional residents. I had a scheme for improving the steamer service in order to attract visitors from California. In twenty years, instead of this half-French, lazy little town of Papit, I saw a great American city with ten-story buildings and streetcars, a theater and an opera house, a stock exchange and a mayor. But go ahead, Edward, cried Bateman, springing up from the chair in excitement. You've got the ideas and the capacity. Why, you'll become the richest man between Australia and the States. Edward chuckled softly. <laughs> but I don't want to, he said. Do you mean to say you don't want money, big money, money running into millions? Do you know what you can do with it? Do you know the power it brings? And if you don't care about it for yourself, think what you can do, opening new channels for human enterprise, giving occupation to thousands. My brain reels at the visions your words have conjured up. Sit down, then, my dear Bateman, laughed Edward. My machine for cutting the coconuts will always remain unused, and so far as I'm concerned, streetcars shall never run in the idle streets of Papit. Bateman sank heavily into his chair. I don't understand you, he said. It came upon me little by little. I came to like the life here, with its ease and its leisure, and the people with their good nature and their happy, smiling faces. I began to think. I'd never had time to do that before. I began to read. You always read. I read for examinations. I read in order to be able to hold my own in conversation. I read for instruction. Here I learned to read for pleasure. I learned to talk. Do you know that conversation is one of the greatest pleasures in life? But it wants leisure. I'd always been too busy before, and gradually all the life that had seemed so important to me began to seem rather trivial and vulgar. What is the use of all this hustle and this constant 
striving. I think of Chicago now, and I see a dark gray city, all stone, it is like a prison, and a ceaseless turmoil. And what does all that activity amount to? Does one get there the best out of life? Is that what we come into the world for, to hurry to an office and work hour after hour till night, then hurry home and dine and go to a theater? Is that how I must spend my youth? Youth lasts so short a time, Bateman. And when I am old, what have I to look forward to? To hurry from my home in the morning to my office and work hour after hour till night and then hurry home again and dine and go to a theater that may be worth while if you make a fortune i don't know it depends on your nature but if you don't is it worth while then i want to make more out of my life than that bateman what do you value in life then i'm afraid you'll laugh at me beauty truth and goodness don't you think you can have those in chicago some men can perhaps but not i edward sprang up now i tell you when i think of the life i led in the old days i am filled with horror he cried violently i tremble with fear when i think of the danger i have escaped i never knew i had a soul till i found it here if i had remained a rich man i might have lost it for good and all i don't know how you can say that cried bateman indignantly we often used to have discussions about it yes i know they were about as effectual as the discussions of deaf mutes about harmony i shall never come back to chicago bateman and what about isabel edward walked to the edge of the veranda and leaning over looked intently at the blue magic of the night there was a slight smile on his face when he turned back to bateman isabel is infinitely too good for me i admire her more than any woman i have ever known she has a wonderful brain and she's as good as she's beautiful i respect her energy and her ambition she was born to make a success of life I am entirely unworthy of her. She doesn't think so. But you must tell her so, Bateman. I, cried Bateman, I'm the last person who could ever do that. Edward had his back to the vivid light of the moon, and his face could not be seen. Is it possible that he smiled again? It's no good your trying to conceal anything from her, Bateman with her quick intelligence she'll turn you inside out in five minutes you'd better make a clean breast of it right away i don't know what you mean of course i shall tell her i've seen you bateman spoke in some agitation honestly i don't know what to say to her tell her that i haven't made good tell her that i'm not only poor but that i'm content to be poor tell her i was fired from my job because i was idle and inattentive tell her all you've seen tonight and all i've told you the idea which on a sudden flashed through bateman's brain brought him to his feet and in uncontrollable perturbation he faced edward man alive don't you want to marry her edward looked at him gravely I can never ask her to release me. If she wishes to hold me to my word, I will do my best to make her a good and loving husband. Do you wish me to give her that message, Edward? Oh, I can't. It's terrible. It's never dawned on her for a moment that you don't want to marry her. She loves you. How can I inflict such a mortification on her? Edward smiled again. Why don't you marry her? yourself bateman you've been in love with her for ages you're perfectly suited to one another you'll make her very happy don't talk to me like that i can't bear it i resign in your favor bateman you are the better man there was something in edward's tone that made bateman look up quickly 
but Edward's eyes were grave and unsmiling. Bateman did not know what to say. He was disconcerted. He wondered whether Edward could possibly suspect that he had come to Tahiti on a special errand. And though he knew it was horrible, he could not prevent the exultation in his heart. What will you do if Isabel writes and puts an end to her engagement with you? He said slowly. Survive, said Edward. Bateman was so agitated that he did not hear the answer. I wish you had ordinary clothes on, he said, somewhat irritably. It's such a tremendously serious decision you're taking. That fantastic costume of yours makes it seem terribly casual. I assure you, I can be just as solemn in a pareo and a wreath of roses as in a high hat and a cutaway coat. Then another thought struck Bateman. Edward, it's not for my sake you're doing this. I don't know, but perhaps this is going to make a tremendous difference to my future. You're not sacrificing yourself for me. I couldn't stand for that, you know. No, Bateman, I have learned not to be silly and sentimental here. I should like you and Isabel to be happy, but I have not the least wish to be unhappy myself. The answer somewhat chilled Bateman. It seemed to him a little cynical. He would not have been sorry to act a noble part. Do you mean to say you're content to waste your life here? It's nothing less than suicide. When I think of the great hopes you had when we left college, it seems terrible that you should be content to be no more than a salesman in a cheap john store oh i'm only doing that for the present and i'm gaining a great deal of valuable experience i have another plan in my head arnold jackson has a small island in the pomotas about a thousand miles from here a ring of land round a lagoon he's planted coconut there he's offered to give it to me why should he do that asked bateman because if Isabel releases me, I shall marry his daughter. You? Bateman was thunderstruck. You can't marry a half-caste. You wouldn't be so crazy as that. She's a good girl, and she has a sweet and gentle nature. I think she would make me very happy. Are you in love with her? I don't know, answered Edward, reflectively. I'm not in love with her as I was in love with Isabel. I worshipped Isabel. I thought she was the most wonderful creature I had ever seen. I was not half good enough for her. I don't feel like that with Eva. She's like a beautiful, exotic flower that must be sheltered from bitter winds. I want to protect her. No one ever thought of protecting Isabel. I think she loves me for myself and not for what I may become. Whatever happens to me, I shall never disappoint her. She suits me. Bateman was silent. You must turn out early in the morning, said Edward at last. It's really about time we went to bed. Then Bateman spoke, and his voice had in it a genuine distress. I'm so bewildered. I don't know what to say i came here because i thought something was wrong i thought you hadn't succeeded in what you set out to do and were ashamed to come back when you'd failed i never guessed i should be faced with this i'm so desperately sorry edward i'm so disappointed i hoped you would do great things it's almost more than i can bear to think of you wasting your talents and your youth and your chance in this lamentable way don't be grieved old friend said edward i haven't failed i've succeeded you can't think with what zest i look forward to life how full it seems to me and how significant sometimes when you are married to isabel you will think of me i shall build myself a house on my coral island and i shall live there looking after my trees, getting the fruit out of the nuts in the same old way that they have done for unnumbered years. I shall grow all sorts of things in my garden, and I shall fish. 
There will be enough work to keep me busy, and not enough to make me dull. I shall have my books and Eva, children, I hope, and above all, the infinite variety of the sea and the sky, the freshness of the dawn and the beauty of the sunset and the rich magnificence of the night. I shall make a garden out of what so short a while ago was a wilderness. I shall have created something. The years will pass insensibly, and when I am an old man, I hope that I shall be able to look back on a happy, simple, peaceful life. In my small way, I too shall have lived in beauty. Do you think it is so little to have enjoyed contentment? We know that it will profit a man little if he gain the whole world and lose his soul. I think I have won mine. Edward led him to a room in which there were two beds, and he threw himself on one of them. In ten minutes, Bateman knew by his regular breathing, peaceful as a child's, that Edward was asleep. But for his part, he had no rest. He was disturbed in mind, and it was not till the dawn crept into the room, ghost-like and silent, that he fell asleep. Bateman finished telling Isabel his long story. He had hidden nothing from her except what he thought would wound her, or what made himself ridiculous. He did not tell her that he had been forced to sit at dinner with a wreath of flowers round his head, and he did not tell her that Edward was prepared to marry her uncle's half-caste daughter the moment she set him free. But perhaps Isabel had keener intuitions than he knew, for as he went on with his tale, her eyes grew colder, and her lips closed upon one another more tightly. Now and then she looked at him closely, and if he had been less intent on his narrative, he might have wondered at her expression. What was the girl like? she asked, when he finished. Uncle Arnold's daughter. Would you say there was any resemblance between her and me? Bateman was surprised at the question. It never struck me. You know, I've never had eyes for anyone but you, and I could not think that anyone was like you. Who could resemble you? Was she pretty? said Isabel, smiling slightly at his words. I suppose so. I dare say some men would say she was very beautiful. Well, it's of no consequence. I don't think we need give her any more of our attention. What are you going to do, Isabel? he asked them. Isabel looked down at the hand which still bore the ring Edward had given her on their betrothal. I wouldn't let Edward break our engagement because I thought it would be an incentive to him. I wanted to be an inspiration to him. I thought if anything could enable him to achieve success, it was the thought that I loved him. I have done all I could. It's hopeless. It would only be weakness on my part not to recognize the facts. Poor Edward. He's nobody's enemy but his own. He was a nice, dear fellow, but there was something lacking in him. I suppose it was backbone. I hope he'll be happy. She slipped the ring off her finger and placed it on the table. Bateman watched her with a heart beating so rapidly that he could hardly breathe. You're wonderful, Isabel. You're simply wonderful. She smiled, and standing up, held out her hand to him. How can I ever thank you for what you've done for me? She said. You've done me a great service. I knew I could trust you. He took her hand and held it. She had never looked more beautiful. Oh, Isabel, I would do so much more for you than that. You know that I only ask to be allowed to love and serve you. You're so strong, Bateman, she sighed. It gives me such a delicious feeling of confidence. Isabel, I adore you. He hardly knew how the inspiration had come to him, but suddenly he clasped her in his arms, and she, all unresisting, smiled into his eyes. Isabel, you know I wanted to marry you the very first day I saw you, he cried passionately. Then why on earth didn't you ask me? she replied. She loved him. He could hardly believe it was true. 
she gave him her lovely lips to kiss, and as he held her in his arms, he had a vision of the works of the Hunter Motor Traction, an automobile company, growing in size and importance till they covered a hundred acres, and of the millions of motors they would turn out, and of the great collection of pictures he would form, which should be anything they had in New York. He would wear horn spectacles, and she, with the delicate pressure of his arms about her, sighed with happiness, for she thought of the exquisite house she would have, full of antique furniture, and of the concerts she would give, and of the fait des ans, and the dinners, to which only the most cultured people would come. Bateman should wear horn spectacles. Poor Edward, she sighed. End of Part 2 of The Fall of Edward Bernard by W. Somerset Maugham The Diary of a Dangerous Child by Lydia Steptoe This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. The Diary of a Dangerous Child, which should be of interest to all those who want to know how women get the way they are. September 1st. Today I am 14. Time flies. Women must grow old. Today I have done my hair in a different way and asked myself a question. What shall be my destiny? Because today I have placed my childhood behind me and have faced the realities. My uncle from Glasgow with the square whiskers and the dull voice, is bringing pheasants for my mother. I shall sit in silence during the meal and think. Perhaps someone, sensitive to growth, will ask in a tense voice, What makes you look thoughtful, Olga? If this should be the case, I shall tell. Yes, I shall break the silence. For sooner or later they must know that I am become furtive. By this I mean that I am debating within myself whether I shall place myself in some good man's hands and become a mother or if I shall become wanton and go out in the world and make a place for myself. Somehow, I think I shall become a wanton. It is more to my taste. At least, I think it is. I have tried to curb this inner knowledge by fighting down that bright look in my eyes as I stand before the mirror. But not ten minutes later, I have been cutting into lemons for my freckles. Ah, woman, thy name, etc. September 3rd. I could not write in my diary yesterday. My hands trembled, and I started at every little thing. I think this shows that I am going to be anemic just as soon as I'm old enough to afford it. This is a good thing. I shall get what I want. Yes, I am glad that I tremble early. Perhaps I am getting introspective. One must not look inward too much while the inside is yet tender. I do not wish to frighten myself until I can stand it. I shall think more about this tonight when Mother puts the light out and I can eat a cream slowly. Some of my best thoughts have come to me this way. Ah, uh, what ideas have I not had eating cream slowly, luxuriously? September 10th. Many days have passed. I have written nothing. Can it be that I have changed? I will hold this thought solitary for a day. September 11th. Yes, I have changed. I found that I owed it to the family. I will explain myself. Father is a lawyer. Mother is in society. Imagine how it might look to the outer world if I should go around looking as if I held a secret. If the human eye were to fall upon this page, I might be so easily misunderstood. What shame I might bring down upon my father's head, on my mother's too, if you want to take the whole matter in a large sweeping way, just by my tendency to precocity. I should be an idiot for their sakes. I will be. October 4th. I have succeeded. No one guesses that my mind teems. No one suspects that I have come into my own, as they say. But I have. I came into it this afternoon when the diplomat from Brazil called. My childhood is but a memory. His name is Don Paso's Dilemma. He has great intelligence in one eye. The other is preoccupied with a monocle. He has comfortable spaces between his front teeth, and he talks in a soft drawl that makes one want to wear satin dresses. He is courting my sister. My sister is an extremely ordinary girl, older than I, it is true but her spirit has no access to those things that I almost stumble over. She is not bad-looking, but it is a vulgar beauty compared to mine. 
there is something timeless about me, whereas my sister is utterly ephemeral. I was sitting behind the Victrola when he came in. I was reading Three Lives. Of course, he did not see me. Alas for him, poor fellow. My sister was there, too. She kept walking up and down in the smallest sort of space, twisting her fan. He must have kissed her, because she said, Oh, and then he must have kissed her more intensely, because she said, Oh, again, and drew her breath in, and in a moment she said softly, You are a dangerous man. With that I sprang up and said in a loud and firm voice, Hurrah! I love danger. But nobody understood me. I am to be put to bed on bread and milk. Never mind. My room in which I sleep overlooks the garden. October 7th. I have been too excited to make any entry in my diary for a few days. Everything has been going splendidly. I have succeeded in becoming subterranean. I have done something delightfully underhand. I bribed the butler to give a note to Don Paso's dilemma, and I frightened the groom into placing at my disposal a saddled horse, and I have a silver-handled whip under my bed. God help all men. This is what I intend to do. I am going to meet Don Paso's dilemma at midnight at the end of the arbor, and give him a whipping. For two reasons. One, because he deserves it. Second, because it is Russian. After this I shall wash my hands of him, but the psychology of the family will have been raised one whole tone. I'm sure of this. Yes, at the full of the moon, Don Paso's dilemma will be expecting me. His evil mind has already pictured me falling into his arms, a melting bit of tender and green youth. Instead, he will have a virago on his hands. How that word makes me shiver. There's only one other word that affects me as strongly. Vixen. These are my words. Oh, to be a virago at fourteen. What other woman has accomplished it? No woman. October 8th. Last night arrived, but let me tell it as it happened. The moon rose at a very early hour and hung, a great cycle in the heavens. Its light fell upon the laburnum bushes and lemon trees and gave me a sense of ice up and down my spine. I thought thoughts of Duse and how she had suffered on balconies a good deal. At least I gathered that she did from most of her pictures. I too stood on the balcony and suffered side face. The silver light glided over the smooth balustrade and swam in the pool of goldfishes. In one hand I held the silver-mounted whip. On my head was a modish glazed riding hat with a single loose feather falling sideways. I could hear the tiny enamel clock on my ivory mantle ticking away the minutes. I began striking the welt of my riding boot softly. A high-strung woman must remember her duties to the malicious. I bit my under lip and thought of what I had yet to do. I leaned over the balcony and looked into the garden. There stood the stable boy in his red flannel shirt, and beside him the fiery mare. I tried to become agitated, but my bosom refused to heave. Perhaps I am too young. I shall leap from the balcony onto the horse's back. I whistled to the boy. He looked up, nodding. In a moment the mare was beneath my window. I looked at my wristwatch. It lacked two minutes to twelve. I jumped. I must have miscalculated the shortness of the distance, or the horse must have moved. I landed in the stable boy's arms. Oh well, from stable boy to prince, such has been the root of all fascinating women. I struck my heels into the horse's side, and was gone like the wind. I can feel it yet, the night air on my cheeks, the straining of the great beast's muscles, the smell of autumn, the gloom, the silence, my own transcendent nature, I was coming to the man I hated hated with a household hate he who had kissed my sister he who had never given me a second thought until this evening and yet who was now all eagerness yes counting the minutes with thick wicked middle-aged poundings of a southern heart when one is standing between life and death any moment might have been my last they say one reviews one's whole childhood one's mind is said to go back over every little detail anyways mine went back the distance being so short it went back and forth I thought of the many happy hours I had spent with my youngest sister, putting spiders down her back, pulling her hair, and making her eat my crusts. I thought of the hours I had lain in the dust beneath the sofa, reading Petronius and Rousseau and Glynn. I thought of my father, a great grim fellow, standing six feet two in his socks, but mostly sitting in the Morris chair. Then I remembered the day I was fourteen, only a little over a month ago. How old one becomes, and how suddenly— I grew old on horseback, between twelve and twelve-one. 
for at twelve one precisely i saw the form of don paso's dilemma in the shadow of the trees and my heart stopped beating and i could feel all the childish uncertainties i had suffered become hard and firm and i knew that i should never again be a child i could scarcely see how the betrayer was dressed but i sensed that he had tricked himself out for the occasion had i been challenged i should have wagered that he had perfumed himself behind the ears and under the chin that's the kind of trick those foreign men are always up to i read that somewhere in a book such men plan downfalls they are so to speak connoisseurs of treachery they are the virtuosi of viciousness i drew rein on the full four strokes of my horse's hoofs i raised my silver mounted whip i threw back my head a laugh rang out in the stillness of midnight it was my laugh high drenched with the scorn of life and love and men it was a good laugh i brought the whip down october twenty seventh i have changed my mind yes i have quite changed my mind i am neither going to give myself into the hands of some good man and become a mother nor am i going to go out into the world and become a wanton i am going to run away and become a boy for this spaniard this brazilian this don paso's dilemma scorned my challenge the fine haughty challenge of a girl of youth and vigour he scorned it and cringing behind my mother as it were left me to face disillusion and chagrin at a late hour at night when no nice girl should be out much less facing anything for as you may have guessed it was not don passos who wrote to meet me it was my mother wearing his long spanish cloak november third in another year i shall be fifteen a woman must grow young again i have cut off my hair and i am asking myself nothing absolutely nothing end of the diary of a dangerous child by lydia steptoe A Legend of the Dawn by Lord Dunsany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. When the worlds and all began, the gods were stern and old, and they saw the beginning from under eyebrows hoar with years all but Inzana, their child, who played with the golden ball. Inzana was the child of all the gods, and the law before the beginning and thereafter was that all should obey the gods, yet hither and thither went all Pagana's gods to obey the dawn child, because she loved to be obeyed. It was dark all over the world, and even in Pagana where dwell the gods it was dark, when the child Inzana, the dawn, first found her golden ball then running down the stairway of the gods with tripping feet chalcedony onyx chalcedony onyx step by step she cast her golden ball across the sky the golden ball went bounding up the sky and the dawn child with her flaring hair stood laughing upon the stairway of the gods and it was day so gleaming fields below saw the first of all the days that the gods have destined but towards evening certain mountains afar and aloof conspired together to stand between the world and the golden ball and to wrap their crags about it and to shut it from the world and all the world was darkened with their plot and the dawn child up in pagana cried for her golden ball then all the gods came down the stairway right to pagana's gate to see what ailed the dawn child and to ask her why she cried then inzana said that her golden ball had been taken away and hidden by mountains black and ugly far away from pagana all in a world of rocks under the rim of the sky and she wanted her golden ball and could not love the dark thereat umboradam whose hound was the thunder took his hound in leash and strode away across the sky after the golden ball until he came to the mountains afar and aloof there did the thunder put his nose to the rocks and bay along the valleys and fast at his heels followed umboradam and the nearer the hound the thunder came to the golden ball the louder did he bay but haughtily and silent stood the mountains whose plot had darkened the world all in the dark among the crags in the mighty cavern guarded by two twin peaks at last they found the golden ball for which the dawn child wept 
then under the world went umborodom with his thunder panting behind him and came in the dark before the morning from underneath the world and gave the dawn child back her golden ball and inzana laughed and took it in her hands and umborodom went back into pagana and at its threshold the thunder went to sleep again the dawn child tossed the golden ball far up into the blue across the sky and the second morning shone upon the world on lakes and oceans and on drops of dew but as the ball went bounding on its way the prowling mists and the rain conspired together and took it and wrapped it in their tattered cloaks and carried it away and through the rents in their garments gleamed the golden ball but they held it fast and carried it right away and underneath the world then on an onyx step and zanna sat down and wept who could no more be happy without her golden ball and again the gods were sorry and the south wind came to tell her tales of the most enchanted islands to whom she listened not nor yet to the tales of temples in lone lands that the east wind told her who had stood beside her when she flung her golden ball but from far away the west wind came with news of three gray travelers wrapped round with battered cloaks that carried away between them a golden ball then up leapt the north wind he who guards the pole and drew his sword of ice out of his scabbard of snow and sped away along the road that leads across the blue and in the darkness underneath the world he met the three gray travelers and rushed upon them and drove them far before him smiting them with his sword till their gray cloaks streamed with blood and out of the midst of them as they fled with flapping cloaks all red and gray and tattered he leapt up with the golden ball and gave it to the dawn child again inzana tossed the ball into the sky making the third day and up and up it went and fell towards the fields and as inzana stooped to pick it up she suddenly heard the singing of all the birds that were all the birds in the world were singing all together and also all the streams and inzana sat and listened and thought of no golden ball nor ever of chalcedony and onyx nor of all her fathers the gods but only of all the birds then in the woods and meadows where they had all suddenly sung they suddenly ceased and inzana looking up found that her ball was lost and all alone in the stillness one owl laughed when the gods heard inzana crying for her ball they clustered together on the threshold and peered into the dark but saw no golden ball and leaning forward they cried out to the bat as he passed up and down bat that seest all things where is the golden ball and though the bat answered none heard and none of the winds had seen it nor any of the birds and there were only the eyes of the gods in the darkness peering for the golden ball then said the gods thou hast lost thy golden ball and they made her a moon of silver to roll about the sky and the child cried and threw it upon the stairway and chipped and broke its edges and asked for the golden ball and Limpang Tung, the lord of music, who was least of all the gods, because the child cried still for her golden ball, stole out of Pagana and crept across the sky, and found the birds of all the world sitting in trees and ivy and whispering in the dark. He asked them one by one for news of the golden ball. Some had last seen it on a neighboring hill, and others in trees, though none knew where it was. A heron had seen it lying in a pond, but a wild duck in some reeds had seen it last as she came home across the hills, and then it was rolling very far away. At last the cock cried out that he had seen it lying beneath the world. There Limpang Tung sought it, and the cock called to him through the darkness as he went, until at last he found the golden ball. Then Limpang Tung went up into Pagana and gave it to the dawn child, who played with the moon no more. And the cock and all his tribe cried out, We found it! We found the golden ball! Again, Inzana tossed the ball afar, laughing with joy to see it, her hands stretched upwards, her golden hair afloat, and she carefully watched it as it fell. But, alas! it fell with a splash into the great sea and gleamed and shimmered as it fell until the waters became dark above it and could be seen no more 
and the men on the world said how the dew has fallen and how the mist set in with breezes from the streams but the dew was the tears of a dawn child and the mists were her sighs when she said there will no more come a time when i play with my ball again for now it is lost for ever and the gods tried to comfort inzana as she played with her silver moon but she would not hear them and went in tears to slid where he played with gleaming sails and in his mighty treasury turned over gems and pearls and lorded it over the sea and she said o oh, slid whose soul is in the sea bring back my golden ball and slid stood up swarthy and clad in seaweed and mightily dived from the last chalcedony step out of pagana's threshold straight into the ocean there on the sand among the battered navies of the nautilus and broken weapons of the swordfish hidden by dark water he found the golden ball and coming up in the night all green and dripping he carried it gleaming to the stairway of the gods and brought it back to inzana from the sea and out of the hands of slid she took it and tossed it far and wide over his sails and sea and far away it shone on lands that knew not slid till it came to its zenith and dropped towards the world but ere it fell the eclipse dashed out from his hiding and rushed at the golden ball and seized it in his jaws when inzana saw the eclipse bearing her plaything away she cried aloud to the thunder who burst from pagana and fell howling upon the throat of the eclipse who dropped the golden ball and let it fall towards earth but the black mountains disguised themselves with snow and as the golden ball fell down towards them they turned their peaks to ruby crimson and their lakes to sapphires gleaming amongst silver and inzana saw a jewelled casket into which her plaything fell but when she stooped to pick it up again she found no jewelled casket with rubies silver or sapphires but only wicked mountains disguised in snow that had trapped her golden ball and then she cried because there was none to find it for the thunder was far away chasing the eclipse and all the gods lamented when they saw her sorrow and limpang tung who was least of all the gods was yet the saddest at the dawn child's grief and when the gods said play with your silver moon he stepped lightly from the rest and coming down the stairway of the gods playing an instrument of music went out towards the world to find the golden ball because inzana wept and into the world he went till he came to the nether cliffs that stand by the inner mountains in the soul and heart of the earth where the earthquake dwelleth alone asleep but astir as he sleeps breathing and moving his legs and grunting aloud in the dark then in the ear of the earthquake limpang tung said a word that only the gods may say and the earthquake started to his feet and flung the cave away the cave wherein he slept between the cliffs and shook himself and went galloping abroad and overturned the mountains that hid the golden ball and bit the earth beneath them and hurled their crags about and covered himself with rocks and fallen hills and went back ravening and growling into the soul of the earth and there lay down and slept again for a hundred years and the golden ball rolled free passing under the shattered earth and so rolled back to pagana and limpang tung came home to the onyx step and took the dawn child by the hand and told not what he had done but said it was the earthquake and went away to sit at the feet of the gods but inzana went and patted the earthquake on the head for she said it was dark and lonely in the soul of the earth thereafter returning step by step chalcedony onyx chalcedony onyx up the stairway of the gods she cast again her golden ball from the threshold afar into the blue to gladden the world and the sky and laughed to see it go and far away tragul upon the utter rim turned a page that was numbered six in a cipher that none might read and as the golden ball went through the sky to gleam on lands and cities there came the fog towards it stooping as he walked with his dark brown cloak about him and behind him slunk the night and as the golden ball rolled past the fog suddenly night snarled and sprang upon it and carried it away hastily enzana gathered the gods and said 
the night hath seized my golden ball and no god alone can find it now for none can say how far the night may roam who prowls all round us and out beyond the worlds at the entreaty of their dawn-child all the gods made themselves stars for torches and far away through all the sky followed the tracks of night as far as he prowled abroad and at one time slid with the pleiades in his hand came nigh to the golden ball and at another johannes lahaya holding orion for a torch but lastly limpang tung bearing the morning star found the golden ball far away under the world near to the lair of night and all the gods together seized the ball and night turning smote out the torches of the gods and thereafter slunk away and all the gods in triumph marched up the gleaming stairway of the gods all praising little limpang tung who through the chase had followed night so close in search of the golden ball then far below on the world a human child cried out to the dawn child for the golden ball and anzana ceased from her play that illumined world and sky and cast the ball from the threshold of the gods to the little human child that played in the fields below and would one day die and the child played all day long with the golden ball down in the little fields where the humans lived and went to bed at evening and put it beneath his pillow and went to sleep and no one worked in all the world because the child was playing and the light of the golden ball streamed up from under the pillow and out through the half-shut door and shone in the western sky and johannes lahaya in the night-time tiptoed into the room and took the ball gently for he was a god away from under the pillow and brought it back to the dawn child to gleam on an onyx step but some day night shall seize the golden ball and carry it right away and drag it down to his lair and slid shall dive from the threshold into the sea to see if it be there and coming up when the fishermen draw their nets shall find it not nor yet discover it among the sails limpang tongue shall seek among the birds and shall not find it when the cock is mute and up the valley shall go umboradom to seek among the crags and the hound the thunder shall chase the eclipse and all the gods go seeking with their stars but never find the ball and men no longer having light of the golden ball shall pray to the gods no more who having no worship shall be no more the gods these things be hidden even from the gods end of a legend of the dawn by lord Dunsany. Chalcedony Onyx, Chalcedony Onyx, Chalcedony Onyx, Chalcedony Onyx. The Vengeance of Men by Lord Dunsany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Ere the beginning, the gods divided earth into waste and pasture. Pleasant pastures they made to be green over the face of earth, orchards they made in valleys and heather upon hills. But Harza they doomed, predestined and foreordained to be a waste for ever. When the world prayed at evening to the gods, and the gods answered prayers, they forgot the prayers of all the tribes of Arim. Therefore the men of Arim were assailed with wars, and driven from land to land, and yet would not be crushed. And the men of Arim made them gods for themselves, appointing men as gods, until the gods of Pagana should remember them again. And their leaders, Yath and Haneth, played the part of gods and led their people on though every tribe assailed them at last they came to harza where no tribes were and at last had rest from war and yoth and haneth said the work is done and surely now pagana's gods will remember and they built a city in harza and tilled the soil and the green came over the waste as the wind comes over the sea and there were fruit and cattle in harza and the sounds of a million sheep there they rested from the flight from all the tribes and builded fables out of all their sorrows till all men smiled in harza and children laughed then said the gods earth is no place for laughter 
thereat they strode to pagana's outer gate to where the pestilence lay curled asleep and waking him up they pointed toward harza and the pestilence leapt forward howling across the sky that night he came to the fields near harza and stalking through the grass sat down and glared at the lights and licked his paws and glared at the lights again but the next night unseen through laughing crowds the pestilence crept into the city and stealing into the houses one by one peered into the people's eyes looking even through their eyelids so that when morning came men stared before them crying out that they saw the pestilence whom the others saw not and thereafter died because the green eyes of the pestilence had looked into their souls chill and damp was he yet there came heat from his eyes that parched the souls of men then came the physicians and the men learned in magic and made the sign of the physicians and the sign of the men of magic and cast blue water upon herbs and chanted spells but still the pestilence crept from house to house and still he looked into the souls of men and the lives of the people streamed away from harza and whither they went is set in many books but the pestilence fed on the light that shines in the eyes of men which never appeased his hunger chiller and damper he grew and the heat from his eyes increased when night by night he galloped through the city going by stealth no more then did men pray in harza to the gods saying high gods show clemency to harza and the gods listened to their prayers but as they listened they pointed with their fingers and cheered the pestilence on and the pestilence grew bolder at his master's voice and thrust his face close up before the eyes of men he could be seen by none saving those he smote at first he slept by day lying in misty hollows but as his hunger increased he sprang up even in sunlight and clung to the chests of men and looked down through their eyes into their souls that shriveled until almost he could be dimly seen even by those he smote not adro the physician sat in his chamber with one light burning making a mixing in a bowl that should drive the pestilence away when through his door there blew a draught that set the light a flickering then because the draught was cold the physician shivered and went and closed the door but as he turned again he saw the pestilence lapping at his mixing who sprang and set one paw upon adro's shoulder and another upon his cloak while with two he clung to his waist and looked him in the eyes two men were walking in the street one said to the other upon the morrow i will sup with thee and the pestilence grinned a grin that none beheld baring his dripping teeth and crept away to see whether upon the morrow those men should sup together a traveller coming in said this is harza here will i rest but his life went further than harza upon that day's journey all feared the pestilence and those that he smote beheld him but none saw the great shapes of the gods by starlight as they urged their pestilence on then all men fled from harza and the pestilence chased dogs and rats and sprang upward at the bats as they sailed above him who died and lay in the streets but soon he returned and pursued the men of harza where they fled and sat by rivers where they came to drink away below the city then back to harza went the people of harza pursued by the pestilence still and gathered in the temple of all the gods save one and said to the high prophet what may now be done who answered all the gods have mocked at prayer this sin must now be punished by the vengeance of men and the people stood in awe the high prophet went up to the tower beneath the sky whereupon beat the eyes of all the gods by starlight there in the sight of the gods he spake in the ear of the gods saying high gods ye have made mock of men know therefore that it is writ in ancient lore and found by prophecy that there is an end that waiteth for the gods who shall go down from pagana in galleons of gold all down the silent river and into the silent sea and there their galleons shall go up in mist and they shall be gods no more and men shall gain harbour from the mocking of the gods at last in the warm moist earth but to the gods shall no ceasing ever come from being the things that were the gods 
when time and worlds and death are gone away naught shall then remain but worn regrets and things that were once gods in the sight of the gods in the ear of the gods then the gods shouted all together and pointed with their hands at the high prophet's throat and the pestilence sprang long since the high prophet is dead and his words are forgotten by men but the gods know not yet whether it be true that the end is waiting for the gods and him who might have told them they have slain and the gods of pagana are fearing the fear that hath fallen upon the gods because of the vengeance of men for they know not when the end shall be or whether it shall come end of the vengeance of men by Lord Dunsany. Miss Tempe's Watchers by Sarah Orne Jewett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recordings by Lindsay Philbrook, Salem, Massachusetts, 2014. The time of the year was April. The place was a small farming town in New Hampshire, remote from any railroad. One by one the lights had been blown out in the scattered houses near Miss Tempe Dents. But as her neighbors took a last look out of doors, their eyes turned with instinctive curiosity toward the old house where a lamp burned steadily. They gave a little sigh. Poor Miss Tempe, said more than one bereft acquaintance for the good woman lay dead in her north chamber, and the light was a watcher's light. The funeral was set for the next day, at one o'clock. The watchers were two of the oldest friends, Mrs. Crow and Sarah Ann Vinson. They were sitting in the kitchen, because it seemed less awesome than the unused best room, and they beguiled the long hours by steady conversation. One would think that neither topics nor opinions would hold out, at that rate, all through the long spring night. But there was a certain degree of excitement just then, and the two women had risen to an unusual level of expressiveness and confidence. Each had already told the other more than one fact that she had determined to keep secret. They were again and again tempted into statements that either would have found impossible by daylight. Mrs. Crow was knitting a blue yarn stocking for her husband. The foot was already so long that it seemed as if she must have forgotten to narrow it at the proper time. Mrs. Crow knew exactly what she was about, however. She was of a much cooler disposition than Sister Binson, who made futile attempts at some sewing, only to drop her work into her lap whenever the talk was most engaging. Their faces were interesting, of the dry, shrewd, quick-witted New England type, with thin hair twisted neatly back out of the way. Mrs. Crow could look vague and benignant, and Miss Binson was, to quote her neighbors, a little too sharp-set, but the world knew that she had to be, with the load she must carry, of supporting an inefficient widowed sister and six unpromising and unwilling nieces and nephews. The eldest boy was at last placed with a good man to learn the mason's trade. Sarah Ann Binson, for all her sharp, anxious aspect, never defended herself when her sister whined and fretted. She was told every week of her life that the poor children never would have had to lift a finger if their father had lived, and yet she had kept her steadfast way with the little farm, and patiently taught the young people many useful things, for which, as everybody said, they would live to thank her. However pleasurelessness her life appeared to outward view, it was brimful of pleasure to herself. Mrs. Crow, on the contrary, was well-to-do her husband being a rich farmer and an easy-going man. She was a stingy woman, but for all that she looked kindly, and when she gave away anything or lifted a finger to help anybody, it was thought a great piece of beneficence, and a compliment indeed, which the recipient accepted with twice as much gratitude as double the gift that came from a poorer and more generous acquaintance. Everybody liked to be on good terms with Mrs. Crow. Socially, she stood much higher than Sarah Ann Vincent. They were both old schoolmates and friends of Temperance Den, who had asked them one day, not long before she died, if they would come together and look after the house and manage everything when she was gone. She may have had some hope that they might become closer friends in this period of intimate partnership, 
and that the richer woman might better understand the burdens of the poor they had not kept the house the night before they were too weary with the care of their old friend whom they had not left until all was over there was a brook which ran down the hillside very near the house and the sound of it was much louder than usual when there was silence in the kitchen the busy stream had a strange insistence in its wild voice as if it tried to make the watchers understand something that related to the past i declare i can't begin to sorrow for tempy yet i am so glad to have her at rest whispered mrs crow it is strange to set here without her but i can't make it clear that she has gone i feel as if she had got easy and dropped off to sleep and i am more scared about waking her up than knowing any other feeling yes said sarah ann it's just like that ain't it but i tell you we are gonna miss her worse than we expect she helped me through with many a trial has temperance i ain't the only one who says same neither these words were spoken as if they were a third person listening somebody beside mrs crow the watchers could not rid their minds of the feeling that they were being watched themselves the spring wind whistled in the window crack now and then and buffeted the little house in a gusty way that had a sort of companionable effect yet on the whole it was a very still night and the watchers spoke in half a whisper she was the freest handed woman that i ever knew said mrs crow decidedly according to her means she gave away more than anybody i used to tell her twasn't right i used really be afraid she went without too much for we have a duty to ourselves sister benson looked up in a half amused unconscious way and then recollected herself mrs crow met her with a serious face it ain't so easy for me to give as it is for some she said simply but with an effort that was made possible only by the occasion i should like to say while tempy is laying here yet in her own house that she has been a constant lesson to me folks are too kind and shame me with thanks for what i do i ain't such a generous woman as poor tempy was for all she had nothing to do with as one may say sarah binson was much moved at this confession she was even pained and touched by the unexpected humility you have a good many calls on you she began and left her kind a little compliment half finish yes yes but i've got means enough my disposition's more of a cross to me as i grow older and i made up my mind this morning that tempy's example should be my pattern henceforth she began to knit faster than ever ain't no use to get morbid that's what tempy used to say herself said sarah ann after a minute's silence ain't it strange to say used to say and her own voice choked a little she never did like to hear folks get going about themselves twas only because they're apt to do it so other folks will say twasn't so and praise em up humbly replied mrs crow and that ain't my object there wasn't a child but what tempy set herself to work to see what she couldn't do to please it one time my brother's folks had been stopping in here the summer from massachusetts the children was all little and they broke up a sight of toys and left em when they were going away tempy come right after they rode by to see if she couldn't help me set the house to rights and she caught me just as i was going to fling some of the clutter into the stove i was kind of tired out starting em off in season oh give me them says she real pleading and she roped em up and took em home with her when she went and she mended em up and stuck em together and made some young one or other happy with every blessed one you thought i'd done her the biggest favour no thanks to me i should have burnt em tempy says i some of em came to our house i know said miss benson she'd take a lot of trouble to please a child stead of shovin out of the way like the rest of us when we're drove i can tell you the biggest thing she ever done and i don't know there's anybody left to tell it but me i don't want to forget sarah benson went on looking up at the clock to see how the night was going it was that pretty-looking trevor girl who taught the corner school and married so well afterwards out in new york state you remember her i dare say certain said miss crow with an air of interest she was a splendid scholar folks said and give the school a great start but she'd overdone herself getting her education and working to pay for it and she all broke down one spring and tempy made her come and stop with her a while you remember that well she had an uncle 
her mother's brother out in chicago who was well off and friendly and used to write to lizzie trevor and i dare say make her some presents but he was a lively driving man and didn't take the time to stop and think about his folks he hadn't seen her since she was a little girl poor lizzie was so pale and weakly that she just got through the term of school she looked as if she was just going straight off in a decline tempy she cosseted her up a while and then next thing folks knew she was tellin round how miss trevor had gone to see her uncle and meant to visit niagary falls in the way and stop overnight now i happen to know in ways i don't dwell on to explain that the poor girl was in debt for her schooling when she come here and her last quarter's pay had just squared it off at last and left her without a cent ahead hardly but it had fretted her thinking of it so she paid it all they might have done her that she owed it to and i taxed tempy about that girl's going off on such a journey till she owned up rather than have lizzie blamed that she'd given her sixty dollars same as if she was rollin in riches and sent her off to have a good rest and vacation sixty dollars exclaimed mrs crow tempy only had ninety dollars a year that came into her rest of her livin she got by helpin about with what she raised off this little piece of ground sand on one side and clay on the other and how often i've heard her tell years ago that she'd rather see niagary than any other sight in the world the women looked at each other in silence the magnitude of the generous sacrifice was almost too great for their comprehension she was just poor enough to do that declared mrs crow at last in an abandonment of feeling say what you may i feel humbled to the dust and her companion ventured to say nothing she never had given away sixty dollars at once but it was simply because she never had it to give it came to her very lips to say in explanation tempy was so situated but she checked herself in time for she would not betray her own loyal guarding of a dependent household folks say a great deal of generosity and this one's being public-spirited and that one free-handed about giving said mrs crow who was a little nervous in the silence i suppose we can't tell the sorrow it would be to some folks not to give same's it would be to me not to save i seem kind of made for that as if it was what i'd got to do i should feel sights better about it if i could make it evident what i'm saving for if i had a child now sarah ann and her voice was a little husky if i had a child i should think i was heaping of it up because he was the one trained by the lord to scatter it again for good but here's mr crow and me we can't do anything with money and both of us like to keep things same as they've always been now priscilla dance was talking away like a mill clapper week before last she'd think i would go right off and get one of them new-fashioned gilt and white papers for the best room and some new furniture and a marble top table and i look at her all struck up why i says priscilla that nice old velvet paper ain't hurt a mite i shouldn't feel it was my best room without it dan'l says it's the first thing he can remember rubbin his little baby fingers on to it and how splendid he thought them red roses was i maintain continued mrs crow stoutly that folks wastes sights o good money doin just such foolish things tearin out the insides o meetin houses and fixin the pews different wasn't good as it was with mendin and then times come and they want to put it all back the same ways it was before this touched upon an exciting subject to active members of that parish miss binson and mrs crow belonged to opposite parties and had at one time come as near hard feelings as they could and yet escape them each hastened to speak of other things to show her untouched friendliness i do agree with you said sister binson that few of us know what use to make of money beyond everyday necessities you've seen more of the world than i have and know what's expected when it comes to taste and judgment about such things i ought to defer to others and with this modest avowal the critical moment passed when there might have been an improper discussion in the silence that followed the fact of their presence in a house of death grew more clear than before there was something disturbing in the noise of a mouse gnawing at the dry boards of a closet wall near by 
both the watchers looked up anxiously at the clock it was almost the middle of the night and the whole world seemed to have left them alone with their solemn duty only the brook was awake perhaps we might give a look upstairs now whispered mrs crow as if she hoped to hear some reason against their going just then to the chamber of death but sister binson rose with a serious and yet satisfied countenance and lifted the small lamp from the table she was much more used to watching than mrs crow and much less affected by it they opened the door into a small entry with a steep stairway they climbed the creaking stairs and entered the cold upper room on tiptoe mrs crow's heart began to beat very fast as the lamp was put on a high bureau and made long fixed shadows about the walls she went hesitatingly toward the solemn shape under its white drapery and felt a sense of remonstrance as sarah ann gently but in a business-like way turned back the thin sheet seems to me she looks pleasanter and pleasanter whispered sarah ann binson impulsively as they gazed at the white face with its wonderful smile to-morrow twill all have faded out i do believe they kind of wake up a day or two after they die and it's then they go she replaced the light covering and they both turned quickly away there was a chill in this upper room tis a great thing for anybody to have got through ain't it said mrs crow softly as she began to go down the stairs on tiptoe the warm air from the kitchen beneath met them with a sense of welcome and shelter i don't know why it is but i feel as near again to tempe down here as i do up there replied sister benson i feel as if the air was full of her kind of i can sense things now and then that she seems to say now i never was one to take up with no nonsense of spirits and such but i declare i felt as if she told me just now to put some more wood into the stove mrs crow preserved a gloomy silence she had suspected before this that her companion was of a weaker and more credulous disposition than herself tis a great thing to have got through she repeated ignoring definitely all that had last been said i suppose you know as well as i that tempy was one that always feared death well it's all put behind her now she knows what it is mrs crow gave a little sigh and sister binson's quick sympathies were stirred towards this other old friend who also dreaded the great change i never like to forget almost those last words tempy spoke plain to me she said gently like the comforter she truly was she looked at me once or twice that last afternoon after i come to set by her and let miss owen go home and i says can i do anything to ease you tempy and the tears come into my eyes so i couldn't see what kind of nod she give me no sarah ann you can't dear says she and then she got her breath again and says she looking at me real meanin i'm only a gettin sleepier and sleeper that's all there is says she and smiled up at me kind of wishful and shut her eyes i knew well enough all she meant she'd been looking out for a chance to tell me and i don't know she's ever said much afterward mrs crow was not knitting she had been listening too eagerly yes will be a comfort to think of that sometimes she said in acknowledgment i know that old dr prince said once in evening meetin that he'd watched by many a dying bed as we well knew and enough o oh, his sick folks had been scared o dying their whole lives through but when they come to the last he'd never seen one but was willin and most were glad to go tis as natural as bein born or livin on he said i don't know what had moved him to speak that night you know he wasn't in the habit of it and it was the monthly concert of prayer for foreign missions anyways said sarah ann but was a great stay to the mind to listen to his words of experience there never was a better man responded mrs crow in a really cheerful tone she had recovered from her feeling of nervous dread the kitchen was so comfortable with lamplight and firelight and just then the old clock began to tell the hour of twelve with leisurely whirring strokes sister binson laid aside her work and rose quickly and went to the cupboard we'd better take a little to eat she explained the night will go faster after this i want to know if you went and made some o your nice cupcake while you was home to-day she asked in a pleased tone 
and mrs crow acknowledged such a gratifying piece of thoughtfulness for this humble friend who denied herself all luxuries sarah ann brewed a generous cup of tea and the watchers drew their chairs up to the table presently and quelled their hunger with good country appetites sister binson put a spoon into a small old-fashioned glass of preserved quince and passed it to her friend she was most familiar with the house and played the part of hostess spread some of this on your bread and butter she said to mrs crow tempy wanted me to use some three or four times but i never felt to i know she'd like to have us comfortable now and would urge us to make a good supper poor dear what excellent preserves she did make mourned mrs crow none of us has got her light hand at doing things tasty she made the most of everything too now she only had that one quince tree down in the far corner of the piece but she'd go out in the spring and tend to it and look at it so pleasant and kind of expect the old thorny thing into bloomin she was just the same with folks said sarah ann and she never get more'n a little apron full o quinces but she'd have every mite o goodness out of those and set the glasses up on to her best room closet shelf so pleased twa'n't but a week ago to-morrow mornin i fetched her a little taste o jelly in a teaspoon and she says thank ye and took it and the minute she tasted it she looked up at me worried as could be oh i don't want to eat that says she i always keep that in case o sickness you're goin to have the good o one tumbler yourself says i i'd just like to know who's sick now if you ain't and she couldn't help laughin i spoke up so smart oh dear me how i shall miss talkin things over with her she always sensed things and got just the point you meant she didn't begin to age until two or three years ago did she asked mrs crow i never saw anybody keep her looks as tempy did she looked young long after i began to feel like an old woman the doctor used to say it was her young heart and i don't know but what he was right how she did do so for other folks there was one spell she wasn't at home a day to a fortnight she got most of her livin so and that made her own potatoes and things last her through none o the young folks could get married without her and all the old ones was disappointed if she wasn't around when they was down with sickness and had to go and cleanin or tailorin for boys or rug hookin there wasn't nothin but what she could do as handy as most i do love to work ain't you heard her say that twenty times a week sarah ann binson nodded and began to clear away the empty plates we may want a taste o something more towards mornin she said there's plenty in the closet here and in case some comes from a distance to the funeral we'll have a little table spread after we get back to the house yes i was busy all morning i've cooked up a sight o things to bring over said mrs crow i felt was the last thing i could do for her they drew their chairs near the stove again and took up their work sister binson's rocking chair creaked as she rocked the brook sounded louder than ever it was more lonely when nobody spoke and presently mrs crow returned to her thoughts of growing old yes tempy aged all of a sudden i remember i asked her if she felt as well as common one day and she laughed at me good there when mr crow began to look old i couldn't help feeling as if something ailed him and like as not was something he was going to get right over and i dosed him for it stiddy half of one summer how many things we shall be wanting to ask tempy exclaimed sarah ann binson after a long pause i can't make up my mind to doin without her i wish folks could come back just once and tell us how it is where they've gone seems then we could do without em better the brook hurried on the wind blew about the house now and then the house itself was a silent place and the supper the warm fire and an absence of any new topics for conversation made the watchers drowsy sister binson closed her eyes first to rest them for a minute and mrs crow glanced at her compassionately with a new sympathy for the hard-working little woman she made up her mind to let sarah ann have a good rest while she kept watch alone but in a few minutes her own knitting was dropped and she too fell asleep overhead the pale shape of tempe dent the outworn body of that generous loving-hearted simple soul slept on also in its white raiment perhaps tempy herself stood near and saw her own life and its surroundings 
with new understanding. Perhaps she herself was the only watcher. Later, by some hours, Sarah Ann Benson woke up with a start. There was a pale light of dawn outside the small windows. Inside the kitchen, the lamp burned dim. Mrs. Crow awoke, too. I think Tempe'd be the first to say it was just as well we both had some rest, she said, not without a guilty feeling. Her companion went to the outer door and opened it wide. The fresh air was none too cold, and the brook's voice was not nearly so loud as it had been in the midnight darkness. She could see the shapes of the hills and the great shadows that lay across the lower country. The east was fast growing bright. It will be a beautiful day for the funeral she said, and turned again, with a sigh, to follow Mrs. Crow up the stairs. End of Miss Tempe's Watchers by Sarah Orne Jewett Helping the Poor by T. S. Arthur This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Roger Moline. Helping the Poor by T. S. Arthur I'm on a begging expedition, said Mr. Jonas, as he came bustling into the counting room of a fellow merchant named Prescott. And as you are a benevolent man, I hope to get at least five dollars here in aid of a family in extremely indigent circumstances. My wife heard of them yesterday, and the little that was learned has strongly excited our sympathies. So I am out on a mission for supplies. I want to raise enough to buy them a ton of coal, a barrel of flour, a bag of potatoes, and a small lot of groceries. Do you know anything of the family for which you propose this charity? inquired Mr. Prescott, with a slight coldness of manner. I only know that they are in want, and that this is the first duty of humanity to relieve them, said Mr. Jonas quite warmly. I will not question your inference, said Mr. Prescott. To relieve the wants of our suffering fellow creatures is an unquestionable duty. But there is another important consideration connected with poverty and its demands upon us. What is that, pray? inquired Mr. Jonas, who felt considerably fretted by so unexpected a damper to his benevolent enthusiasm. "'How it shall be done,' answered Mr. Prescott calmly. "'If a man is hungry, give him bread. If he is naked, clothe him,' said Mr. Jonas. "'There is no room for doubt or question here. This family, I learn, are suffering for all the necessaries of life.' and I can clearly see the duty to supply their wants. "'Of how many does the family consist?' asked Mr. Prescott. "'There is a man and his wife and three or four children. "'Is the man sober and industrious?' "'I don't know anything about him. "'I've had no time to make inquiries. "'I only know that hunger and cold are in his dwelling.' or at least were in his dwelling yesterday. Then you have already furnished relief? Temporary relief. I shouldn't have slept last night after what I heard without just sending them a bushel of coal and a basket of provisions. For which I honor your kindness of heart, Mr. Jonas. So far you acted right but I am by no means so well assured of the wisdom and humanity of your present action in the case. The true way to help the poor is to put it into their power to help themselves. The mere bestowal of alms is, in most cases, an injury. Either encouraging idleness and vice, or weakening self-respect and virtuous self-independence. There is an innate strength in everyone. Let us seek to develop this strength in the prostrate, rather than hold them up by a temporary application of our own powers, to fall again, inevitably, when the sustaining hand is removed. This, depend upon it, is not true benevolence. 
everyone has ability to serve the common good and society renders back sustenance for bodily life as the reward of this service but suppose a man cannot get work said mr jonas how is he to serve society for the sake of a reward true charity will provide employment for him rather than bestow alms but if there is no employment to be had mr prescott you make a very extreme case for all who are willing to work in this country there is employment i am by no means ready to admit this assertion well we'll not deal in general propositions because anything can be assumed or denied let us come direct to the case in point and thus determine our duty towards the family whose needs we are considering which will be best for them to help them in the way you propose or to encourage them to help themselves all i know about them at present replied mr jonas who was beginning to feel considerably worried is that they are suffering for the common necessaries of life it is all very well to tell a man to help himself but if his arm be paralyzed or he have no key to open the provision shop he will soon starve under that system of benevolence feed and clothe a man first and then set him to work to help himself he will have life in his heart and strength in his hands this sounds all very fair mr jonas and yet there is not so much true charity involved there as appears on the surface it will avail little however for us to debate the matter now your time and mine are both of too much value during business hours for useless discussion i cannot give understandingly in the present case and so must disappoint your expectations in this quarter good morning then said mr jonas bowing rather coldly good morning pleasantly responded mr prescott as his visitor turned and left his door all a mean excuse for not giving said mr jonas to himself as he walked rather hurriedly away i don't believe much in the benevolence of your men who are so particular about the whys and wherefores so afraid to give a dollar to a poor starving fellow creature lest the act encourage vice or idleness the next person upon whom mr jonas called happened to be very much of mr prescott's way of thinking and the next chanced to know something about the family for whom he was soliciting aid a lazy vagabond set exclaimed the individual when mr jonas mentioned his errand who would rather want than work they may starve before i give them a shilling is this true asked mr jones in surprise certainly it is i've had their case stated before in fact i went through the sleet and rain one bitter cold night to take them provisions so strongly had my sympathies in regard to them been excited let them go to work but can the man get work inquired mr jonas other poor men who have families dependent on them can get work where there's a will there's a way downright laziness is the disease in this case and the best cure for which is a little wholesome starvation so take my advice and leave this excellent remedy to work out a cure mr jonas went back to his store in rather a vexed state of mind all his fine feelings of benevolence were stifled he was angry with the indigent family and angry with himself for being the fool to meddle with any business but his own catch me on such an errand again said he indignantly i'll never seek to do a good turn again as long as i live just as he was saying this his neighbor prescott came into his store where does the poor family live of whom you were speaking to me 
he inquired. "'Oh, don't ask me about them!' exclaimed Mr. Jonas. "'I've just found them out. They're a lazy vagabond set.' "'You are certain of that?' "'Morally certain. Mr. Caddy says he knows them like a book, and they'd rather want than work. With him, I think a little wholesome starvation will do them good.' Notwithstanding this rather discouraging testimony, Mr. Prescott made a memorandum of the street and number of the house in which the family lived, remarking as he did so, "'I have just heard where the services of an able-bodied man are wanted. Perhaps Gardiner, as you call him, may be glad to obtain the situation.' "'He won't work. That's the character I have received of him,' replied Mr. Jonas whose mind was very much roused against the man. The pendulum of his impulses had swung from a light touch to the other extreme. "'A dollar earned is worth two received in charity,' said Mr. Prescott, "'because the dollar earned corresponds to service rendered, and the man feels that it is his own, that he has an undoubted right to its possession.' It elevates his moral character, inspires self-respect, and prompts to new efforts. Mere almsgiving is demoralizing for the opposite reason. It blunts the moral feelings, lowers the self-respect, and fosters inactivity and idleness, opening the way for vice to come in and sweep away all the foundations of integrity. Now, true charity to the poor is for us to help them to help themselves. Since you left me a short time ago, I have been thinking rather hastily over the matter, and the fact of hearing about the place for an able-bodied man, as I just mentioned, has led me to call around and suggest your making interest thereof in behalf of Gardner. Helping him in this way will be true benevolence. It's no use replied Mr. Jonas, in a positive tone of voice. He's an idle, good-for-nothing fellow, and I'll have nothing to do with him. Mr. Prescott urged the matter no farther, for he saw that to do so would be useless. On his way home, on leaving his store, he called to see Gardiner. He found, in two small, meagerly furnished rooms, a man, his wife, and three children. Everything about them indicated extreme poverty, and, worse than this, lack of cleanliness and industry. The woman and children had a look of health, but the man was evidently the subject of some wasting disease. His form was light, his face thin and rather pale, and his languid eyes deeply sunken. He was very far from being the able-bodied man Mr. Prescott had expected to find. As the latter stepped into the miserable room where they were gathered, the light of expectation, mingled with the shadows of mute suffering, came into their countenances. Mr. Prescott was a close observer and saw, at a glance, the assumed sympathy-exciting face of the mendicant in each. "'You look rather poor here,' said he, as he took a chair, which the woman dusted with her dirty apron before handing it to him. "'Indeed, sir, we are miserably off,' replied the woman, in a half-whining tone. "'John there hasn't done a stroke of work now for three months, and—' "'Why not?' interrupted Mr. Prescott. "'My health is very poor.' said the man. I suffer much from pain in my side and back, and am so weak most of the time that I can hardly creep about. That is bad, certainly, replied Mr. Prescott. Very bad. And as he spoke, he turned his eyes to the woman's face, and then scanned the children very closely. Is that boy of yours doing anything? he inquired. "'No, sir,' replied the mother. 
He's too young to be of any account. He's thirteen, if my eyes do not deceive me. Just a little over thirteen. Does he go to school? No, sir. He has no clothes fit to be seen in at school. Bad, bad, said Mr. Prescott. Very bad. The boy might be earning two dollars a week, instead of which he is growing up in idleness, which surely leads to vice. Gardner looked slightly confused at this remark, and his wife evidently did not feel very comfortable under the steady, observant eyes that were on her. "'You seem to be in good health,' said Mr. Prescott, looking at the woman. "'Yes, sir, thank God. And if it wasn't for that, I don't know what we should all have done. Everything has fallen upon me since John there has been ailing.' Mr. Prescott glanced around the room, and then remarked, a little pleasantly, "'I don't see that you make the best use of your health and strength.' The woman understood him, for the color came instantly to her face. "'There is no excuse for dirt and disorder,' said the visitor, more seriously. "'I once called to see a poor widow, in such a state of low health, that she had to lie in bed nearly half of every day. She had two small children, and supported herself and them by fine embroidery, at which she worked nearly all the time. I never saw a neater room in my life than hers, and her children, though in very plain and patched clothing, were perfectly clean. How different is all here! And yet, when I entered, you all sat idly amid this disorder, and, shall I speak plainly, filth? The woman, on whose face the color had deepened while Mr. Prescott spoke, now rose up quickly and commenced bustling about the room, which, in a few moments, looked far less in disorder. That she felt his rebuke, the visitor regarded as a good sign. Now said he as the woman resumed her seat let me give you the best maxim for the poor in the english language one that if lived by will soon extinguish poverty or make it a very light thing god helps those who help themselves to be very plain with you it is clear to my eyes that you do not try to help yourselves such being the case, you need not expect gratuitous help from God. Last evening you received some coal and a basket of provisions from a kind-hearted man who promised more efficient aid today. You have not yet heard from him, and what is more, will not hear from him. Someone to whom he applied for a contribution happened to know more about you than he did and broadly pronounced you a set of idle vagabonds. Just think of bearing such a character. He dropped the matter at once, and you will get nothing from him. I am one of those upon whom he called. Now, if you are all disposed to help yourselves, I will try to stand your friend. If not, I shall have nothing to do with you. I speak plainly. It is better. There will be less danger of apprehension. That oldest boy of yours must go to work and earn something. And your daughter can work about the house for you very well while you go out to wash or scrub and thus earn a dollar or two or three every week. There will be no danger of starvation on this income and you will then eat your bread in independence. Mr. Gardner can help some, I do not in the least doubt. And Mr. Prescott looked inquiringly at the man. If I was only able-bodied, said Gardner, in a half-reluctant tone and manner. But you are not. Still, there are many things you may do. If by a little exertion you can earn the small sum of two or three dollars a week, it will be far better, even for your health, than idleness. 
two dollars earned every week by your wife two by your boy and three by yourself would make seven dollars a week and if i am not very much mistaken you don't see half that sum in a week now indeed sir and you speak the truth there said the woman very well it's plain then that work is better than idleness but we can't get work the woman fell back upon this strong assertion don't believe a word of it i can tell you how to earn half a dollar a day for the next four or five days at least so there's a beginning for you put yourself in the way of useful employment and you will have no difficulty beyond what kind of work sir inquired the woman we are about moving into a new house, and my wife commences the work of having it clean tomorrow morning. She wants another assistant. Will you come? The woman asked the number of his residence and promised to accept the offer of work. Very well. So far, so good, said Mr. Prescott, cheerfully as he arose. You shall be paid at the close of each day's work and that will give you the pleasure of eating your own bread, a real pleasure, you may depend upon it, for a loaf of bread earned is sweeter than the richest food bestowed by charity, and far better for the health. But about the boy, sir, said Gardiner, whose mind was becoming active with more independent thoughts. All in good time, said Mr. Prescott, smiling. Rome was not built in a day, you know. First, let us secure a beginning. If your wife goes tomorrow, I shall think her in earnest, as willing to help herself, and therefore worthy to be helped. All the rest will come in due order. But you may rest assured that if she does not come to work, it is the end of the matter as far as I am concerned. So, good evening to you. Bright and early came Mrs. Gardiner on the next morning, far tidier in appearance than when Mr. Prescott saw her before. She was a stout, strong woman, and knew how to scrub and clean paint as well as the best. When fairly in the spirit of work, she worked on with a sense of pleasure. Mrs. Prescott was well satisfied with her performance, and paid her the half dollar earned when her day's toil was done on the next day and the next she came doing her work and receiving her wages on the evening of the third day mr prescott thought it time to call upon the gardeners well this is encouraging said he with an expression of real pleasure as he gazed around the room which scarcely seemed like the one he had visited before. All was clean and everything in order, and what was better still, the persons of all, though poorly clad, were clean and tidy. Mrs. Gardiner sat by the table mending a garment. Her daughter was putting away the supper dishes, while the man sat teaching a lesson in spelling to their youngest child. The glow of satisfaction that pervaded the bosom of each member of the family, as Mr. Prescott uttered these approving words, was a new and higher pleasure than had for a long time been experienced, and caused the flame of self-respect and self-dependence, rekindled once more, to rise upwards in a steady flame. "'I like to see this,' continued Mr. Prescott. "'It does me good.' you have fairly entered the right road walk on steadily courageously unweariedly there is worldly comfort and happiness for you at the end i think i have found a very good place for your son where he will receive a dollar and a half a week to begin with in a few months if all things suit he will get two dollars the work is easy and the opportunities for improvement good I think there is a chance for you also, Mr. Gardiner. 
I have something in my mind that will just meet your case. Light work, and not over five or six hours application each day. The wage is four dollars a week to begin with, and a prospect of soon having them raised to six or seven dollars. What do you think of that? Sir, exclaimed the poor man, in whom personal pride and a native love of independence were again awakening. If you can do this for me, you will be indeed a benefactor. It shall be done, said Mr. Prescott, positively. Did I not say to you that God helps those who help themselves? It is even thus. No one in our happy country who is willing to work need be in want, and money earned by honest industry buys the sweetest bread. It required a little watching and urging and admonition on the part of Mr. and Mrs. Prescott to keep the gardeners moving on steadily in the right way, Old habits and inclinations had gained too much power easily to be broken, and but for this watchfulness on their part, idleness and want would again have entered the poor man's dwelling. The reader will hardly feel surprise when told that in three or four years from the time Mr. Prescott so wisely met the case of the indigent gardeners, they were living in a snug little house of their own, nearly paid for out of the united industry of the family, every one of which was now well clad, cheerful, and in active employment. As for Mr. Gardner, his health has improved instead of being injured by light employment. Cheerful, self-approving thoughts and useful labor have temporarily renovated a fast sinking constitution. Mr. Prescott's way of helping the poor is the right way. They must be taught to help themselves. Mere almsgiving is but a temporary aid, and takes away, instead of giving, that basis of self-dependence on which all should rest. Help a man up and teach him to use his feet so that he can walk alone. This is true benevolence. End of Helping the Poor by T. S. Arthur. This recording by Roger Moline. Mrs. Packletide's Tiger by Saki. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit. LibriVox.org. This recording is read by Hilary Hugh. It was Mrs. Packletide's pleasure and intention that she should shoot a tiger. Not that the lust to kill had suddenly descended on her, or that she felt that she would leave India safe and more wholesome than she had found it, with one fraction less of wild beast per million of inhabitants. The compelling motive for her sudden deviation towards the footsteps of Nimrod was the fact that Luna Bimberton had recently been carried eleven miles in an airplane by an Algerian aviator and talked of nothing else. Only a personally procured tiger skin and a heavy harvest of press photographs could successfully counter that sort of thing. Mrs. Packletide had already arranged in her mind the lunch she would give at her house in Curzon Street, ostensibly in Lula Bimberton's honour, with a tiger skin rug occupying most of the foreground and all of the conversation she had also already designed in her mind the tiger claw brooch that she was going to give luna bimberton on her next birthday in a world that is supposed to be chiefly swayed by hunger and by love mrs packletide was an exception her movements and motives were largely governed by dislike of luna bimberton circumstances proved prefacious mrs packletide had offered a thousand rupees for the opportunity of shooting a tiger without over much risk or exertion and it so happened that a neighbouring village could boast of being the favoured rendezvous of an animal of respectable antecedents which had been driven by the increasing infirmities of age to abandon game-killing and confine its appetite to the smaller domestic animals 
the prospect of earning the thousand rupees had stimulated the sporting and commercial instinct of the villagers children were posted night and day on the outskirts of the local jungle to head the tiger back in the unlikely event of his attempting to roam away to fresh hunting grounds and the cheaper kind of goats were left about with elaborate carelessness to keep him satisfied with his present quarters the one great anxiety was lest he should die of old age before the date appointed for the memsahib's shoot mothers carrying their babies whom through the jungle after the day's work in the fields hushed their singing lest they might curtail the restful sleep of the venerable herd robber the great night duly arrived moonlit and cloudless a platform had been constructed in a comfortable and conveniently placed tree and thereon crouched mrs packletide and her paid companion miss mebbin a goat gifted with a particularly persistent bleat such as even a partially deaf tiger might be reasonably expected to hear on a still night was tethered at correct distance with an accurately sighted rifle and a thumbnail pack of patience cards the sportswoman awaited the coming of the quarry i suppose we are in some danger said miss mebbin she was not actually nervous about the wild beast but she had a morbid dread of performing an atom more service than she had been paid for nonsense said mrs packletide it's a very old tiger it couldn't spring up here even if it wanted to if it's an old tiger i think you ought to get it cheaper a thousand rupees is a lot of money louisa mebbin adopted a protective elder sister attitude towards money in general irrespective of nationality or denomination her energetic intervention had saved many a rubble from dissipating itself in tips in some moscow hotel and francs and centimes clung to her instinctively under circumstances which would have driven them headlong from less sympathetic hands her speculations as to the market depreciation of tiger remnants were cut short by the appearance on the scene of the animal itself as soon as it caught sight of the tethered goat it lay flat on the earth seemingly less from a desire to take advantage of all available cover than for the purpose of snatching a short rest before commencing the grand attack i believe it's ill said louisa mebbin loudly in hindustani for the benefit of the village headman who was in ambush in a neighbouring tree hush said mrs packletide and at the moment the tiger commenced ambling towards his victim now now urged miss mebbin with some excitement if it doesn't touch the goat we needn't pay for it the bait was an extra the rifle flashed out with a loud report and the great tawny beast sprang to one side and then rolled over in the stillness of death in a moment a crowd of excited natives had swarmed on to the scene and their shouting speedily carried the glad news of the village where a thumping of tom-toms took up the chorus of triumph and their triumphant rejoicing found a ready echo in the heart of mrs packletide already the luncheon party in curzon street seemed immeasurably nearer it was louisa mebbin who drew attention to the fact that the goat was in death throes from a mortal bullet wound while no trace of the rifle's deadly work could be found on the tiger evidently the wrong animal had been hit and the beast of prey had succumbed to heart failure caused by the sudden report of the rifle accelerated by senile decay mrs packletide was probably annoyed at the discovery but at any rate she was the possessor of a dead tiger and the villagers anxious for their thousand rupees gladly connived at the fiction that she had shot the beast and miss mebbin was a paid companion therefore did mrs packletide face the cameras with a light heart and her pictured frame reached from the pages of the texas weekly snapshot to the illustrated monday supplement of the novo brema as for luna bimberton she refused to look at an illustrated paper for weeks and her letter of thanks for the gift of a tiger claw brooch was a model of repressed emotions the luncheon party she declined there are limits beyond which repressed emotions become dangerous 
From Curzon Street, the tiger skin rug travelled down to the manor house and was duly inspected and admired by the country, and it seemed a fitting and appropriate thing when Mrs. Packletide went to the country costume ball in the character of Diana. She refused to fall in, however, with Clovis's tempting suggestion of a primeval dance party at which everyone should wear the skins of beasts they had recently slain. I should be in rather a baby bunting condition confessed clovis with a miserable rabbit skin or two to wrap up in but then he added with a rather malicious glance at diana's proportions my figure is quite as good as that russian dancing boy's how amused everyone would be if they knew what really happened said louisa mebbin a few days after the ball what do you mean asked mrs packletide quickly harry shot the goat and frightened the tiger to death said miss mebbin with her disagreeably pleasant laugh no one would believe it said mrs packletide her face changing colour as rapidly as though it were going through a book of patterns before post time luna bimbotin would said miss mebbin mrs packletide's face settled on an unbecoming shade of greenish white you surely wouldn't give me away she asked i've seen a vacant cottage near dorking that i should rather like to buy said miss mebbin with seeming irrelevance six hundred and eighty freehold quite a bargain only i don't happen to have the money louisa mebbin's pretty weekend cottage christened by her lay forbs and gay in summer time with its garden borders of tiger lilies is the wonder and admiration of her friends it is a marvel how louisa manages to do it is the general verdict mrs packletide indulges in no more big game shooting the incidental expenses are so heavy she confides in to inquiring friends end of mrs packletide's tiger by saki a luncheon party by maurice baring this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit please visit librivox.org reading by matt Perard. A Luncheon Party by Maurice Baring Part 1 Mrs. Bergmann was a widow. She was American by birth and marriage, and English by education and habits. She was a fair, beautiful woman, with large eyes and a white complexion. Her weak point was ambition, and ambition with her took the form of luncheon parties. It was one summer afternoon that she was seized with the great idea of her life, it consisted in giving a luncheon party which should be more original and amusing than any other which had ever been given in london the idea became a mania it left her no peace it possessed her like venom or like madness she could think of nothing else she racked her brains in imagining how it could be done but the more she was harassed by this aim the further off its realization appeared to her to be at last it began to weigh upon her she lost her spirits and her appetite her friends began to remark with anxiety on the change in her behaviour and in her looks she herself felt that the situation was intolerable and that success or suicide lay before her one evening towards the end of june as she was sitting in her lovely drawing-room in her house in mayfair in front of her tea-table on which the tea stood untasted brooding over the question which unceasingly tormented her she cried out half aloud i'd sell my soul to the devil if he would give me what i wish at that moment the footman entered the room and said there was a gentleman downstairs who wished to speak with her what is his name asked mrs bergmann the footman said he had not caught the gentleman's name, and he handed her a card on a tray. She took the card. On it was written, Mr. Nicholas L. Satan, 1 Pandemonium Terrace, Burning Marl, Hell, Telephone, Number 1, Central. Show him up, said Mrs. Bergman, quite naturally, as though she had been expecting the visitor. She wondered at her own behavior, and seemed to herself to be acting inevitably, as one does in dreams. Mr. Satan was shown in. He had a professional air about him. 
but not of the kind that suggests needy or even learned professionalism he was dark his features were sharp and regular his eyes keen his complexion pale his mouth vigorous and his chin prominent he was well dressed in a frock coat black tie and patent leather boots he would never have been taken for a conjurer or a shop walker but he might have been taken for a slightly depraved art photographer who had known better days he sat down near the tea-table opposite mrs bergmann holding his top hat which had a slight mourning band round it in his hand i understand madam he spoke with an even american intonation you wish to be supplied with a guest who will make all other luncheon parties look so to speak like thirty cents yes that is just what i want answered mrs bergmann who continued to be surprised at herself well i reckon there's no one living who'd suit said mr satan and i'd better supply you with a celebrity of a former generation he then took out a small pocket-book from his coat pocket and quickly turning over its leaves he asked in a monotonous tone would you like a philosopher anaxagoras aristotle aurelius m oh no answered mrs bergmann with decision they would ruin any luncheon a saint suggested mr satan antony ditto of padua athanasius augustine anselm good heavens no said mrs bergmann a theologian good arguer asked mr satan aquinas t no interrupted mrs bergmann for heaven's sake don't always give me the a's or we shall never get on to anything you'll be offering me adam and abel next i beg your pardon said mr satan latimer laud historic interest church and politics combined he added quickly i don't want a clergyman artist said mr satan andrea del sarto angelo im appel you're going back to the a's interrupted mrs bergmann bellini benvenito Cellini, botticelli he continued imperturbably what's the use of them when i can get sergeant every day asked mrs bergmann a man of action perhaps alexander bonaparte caesar j cromwell o oh, hannibal too heavy for luncheon she answered they would do for dinner plain statesman Bismarck, Count. Chatham, Lord. Franklin, B. Richelieu, Cardinal. That would make the members of the cabinet feel uncomfortable, she said. A monarch? Alfred. Beg pardon, he's an A. Richard III. Peter the Great. Louis the Eleventh. Nero? No, said Mrs. Bergmann. I can't have a royalty. It would make it too stiff i have it said mr satan a highwayman dick turpin or a housebreaker jack shepherd or charles peace oh no said mrs bergmann they might steal the sevres a musician bach or beethoven he suggested he's getting into the bees now thought mrs bergmann no she said aloud we should have to ask him to play and he can't play wagner i suppose and musicians are so touchy i think i have it said mr satan a wit dr johnson sheridan sydney smith we should probably find their jokes dull now said mrs bergmann thoughtfully miscellaneous inquired mr satan and turning over several leaves of his notebook he rattled out the following names Alcibiades kind of statesman beau brummel fop cagliostro conjurer robespierre politician charles stuart pretender warwick kingmaker borgia a pope ditto c toxicologist wallenstein mercenary bacon roger man of science ditto 
F. Dishonest official. Tell. W. Patriot. Jones. Paul. Pirate. Lucullus. Glutton. Simon Stylitis. Eccentric. Casanova. Loose liver. Casa Bianca. Cabin boy. Chico. Jester. Sayers. T. Prize fighter. Cook. Captain. Tourist. Nebuchadnezzar. Food fattest. Juan. D. Lover. Foiza. War correspondent. Julian. Apostate. Don't you see, said Mrs. Bergman, we must have someone everybody has heard of. David Garrick, actor and wit, suggested Mr. Satan. It's no good having an actor nobody has seen act, said Mrs. Bergman. What about a poet, asked Mr. Satan. Homer, Virgil, Dante, Byron, Shakespeare? Shakespeare, she cried out, the very thing. Everybody has heard of Shakespeare, more or less, and I expect he'd get on with everybody, and wouldn't feel offended if I asked Alfred Austin or some other poet to meet him. Can you get me Shakespeare? Certainly, said Mr. Satan. Day and date? It must be Thursday fortnight, said Mrs. Bergman. And what are uh, er, your terms? The usual terms, he answered in return for supernatural service rendered you during your lifetime your soul reverts to me at your death mrs bergmann's brain began to work quickly she was above all things a practical woman and she immediately felt she was being defrauded i cannot consent to such terms she said surely you recognize the fundamental difference between this proposed contract and those which you concluded with others with faust for instance they sold the full control of their soul after death on condition of your putting yourself at their entire disposal during the whole of their lifetime whereas you asked me to do the same thing in return for a few hours service the proposal is preposterous mr satan rose from his chair in that case madam he said i have the honour to wish you a good afternoon stop a moment said mrs bergmann i don't see why we shouldn't arrive at a compromise i am perfectly willing that you should have the control over my soul for a limited number of years i believe there are precedents for such a course let us say a million years ten million said mr satan quietly but firmly in that case answered mrs bergmann we will take no notice of leap year and we will count three hundred and sixty-five days in every year certainly said mr satan with an expression of somewhat ruffled dignity we always allow leap year but of course thirteen years will count as twelve of course said mrs bergmann with equal dignity then perhaps you will not mind signing the contract at once, said Mr. Satan, drawing from his pocket a typewritten page. Mrs. Bergman walked to the writing table and took the paper from his hand. Over the stamp, please, said Mr. Satan. Must I um, sign it in blood? asked Mrs. Bergman hesitatingly. You can if you like said mr satan but i prefer red ink it is quicker and more convenient he handed her a stylograph pen must it be witnessed she asked no he replied these kind of documents don't need a witness in a firm bold handwriting mrs bergmann signed her name in red ink across the sixpenny stamp she half expected to hear a clap of thunder and to see mr satan disappear but nothing of the kind occurred. Mr. Satan took the document, folded it, placed it in his pocket book, took up his hat and gloves, and said, Mr. William Shakespeare will call to luncheon on Thursday week. At what hour is the luncheon to be? One thirty, said Mrs. Bergman. He may be a few minutes late, answered Mr. Satan. Good afternoon, madam. And he bowed and withdrew. Mrs. Bergman chuckled to herself when she was alone. I have done him, 
she thought to herself, because ten million years in eternity is nothing. He might just as well have said one second as ten million years, since anything less than eternity in eternity is nothing. It is curious how stupid the devil is in spite of all his experience. Now I must think about my invitations. Part 2 The morning of Mrs. Bergman's luncheon had arrived. She had asked thirteen men and nine women. But an hour before luncheon an incident happened which nearly drove Mrs. Bergman distracted. One of her guests, who was also one of her most intimate friends, Mrs. Lockton, telephoned to her saying she had quite forgotten, but she had asked on that day a man to luncheon whom she did not know, and who had been sent to her by Walford, the famous professor. She ended the message by saying she would bring the stranger with her. "'What is his name?' asked Mrs. Bergman, not without intense irritation, meaning to put a veto on the suggestion. "'His name is—' And at that moment the telephone communication was interrupted, and in spite of desperate efforts, Mrs. Bergman was unable to get on to Mrs. Lockton again. She reflected that it was quite useless for her to send a message saying that she had no room at her table, because Angela Lockton would probably bring the stranger all the same. Then she further reflected that in the excitement caused by the presence of Shakespeare, it would not really much matter whether there was a stranger there or not. A little before half-past one, the guests began to arrive. Lord Pantry of Aswan the famous soldier, was the first comer. He was soon followed by Professor Morgan, an authority on Greek literature, Mr. Peebles, the ex-Prime Minister, Mrs. Hubert Baldwin, the immensely popular novelist, the fascinating Mrs. Rupert Duncan, who was lending her genius to one of Ibsen's heroines at that moment, Miss Medea Train, one of the latest American beauties, Corporal, the portrait painter, Richard Giles, critic and man of letters, Herward Blenheim, a young and rising politician, who, before the age of thirty, had already risen higher than most men of sixty, Sir Horace Sylvester, K.C.M.G., the brilliant financier, with his beautiful wife, Lady Irene, Professor Leo Newcastle, the eminent man of science, Lady Hyacinth Gloucester, and Mrs. Milden, who were well known for their beauty and charm, Osmond Hall, the paradoxical playwright, Monsieur Faubert, the psychological novelist, Count Ciara, an Italian nobleman about fifty years old, who had written a history of the popes, and who was now staying in London, Lady Herman, the beauty of a former generation, still extremely handsome, and Wilmot, the successful actor-manager. They were all assembled in the drawing-room upstairs, talking in knots and groups, and pervaded by a feeling of pleasurable excitement and expectation, so much so that conversation was intermittent, and nearly everybody was talking about the weather. The Right Honourable John Lockton, the eminent lawyer, was the last guest to arrive. "'Angela will be here in a moment,' he explained, she asked me to come on first. Mrs. Bergmann grew restless. It was half-past one, and no Shakespeare. She tried to make her guests talk with indifferent success. The expectation was too great. Everybody was absorbed by the thought of what was going to happen next. Ten minutes passed thus, and Mrs. Bergmann grew more and more anxious. At last the bell rang, and soon Mrs. Lockton walked upstairs, leading with her a quite insignificant, ordinary-looking, middle-aged, rather portly man with shiny black hair, bald on the top of his head, and a blank, good-natured expression. "'I'm so sorry to be so late, Louise, dear,' she said. "'Let me introduce Mr. to you.' And whether she had forgotten the name or not, Mrs. Bergmann did not know or care at the time, but it was mumbled in such a manner that it was impossible to catch it. Mrs. Bergmann 
shook hands with him absent-mindedly and looking at the clock saw that it was ten minutes to two i have been deceived she thought to herself and anger rose in her breast like a wave at the same time she felt the one thing necessary was not to lose her head or let anything damp the spirits of her guests we'll go down to luncheon directly she said i'm expecting someone else but he probably won't come till later she led the way and everybody trooped downstairs to the dining-room feeling that disappointment was in store for them mrs bergmann left the place on her right vacant she did not dare fill it up because in her heart of hearts she felt certain shakespeare would arrive and she looked forward to a coup de theatre which would be quite spoilt if his place was occupied on her left sat count ciara the unknown friend of angela lockton sat at the end of the table next to wilmot the luncheon started haltingly angela lockton's friend was heard saying in a clear voice that the dust in london was very trying have you come from the country asked m faubourg i myself am just returned from oxford where i once more admired your admirable english lawns vos pelouses seculaires yes said the stranger i only came up to town to-day because it seems indeed a waste and a pity to spend the finest time of the year in london count ciara who had not uttered a word since he had entered the house turned to his hostess and asked her whom she considered after herself to be the most beautiful woman in the room lady irene lady hyacinth or mrs milden mrs milden he went on has the smile of la gioconda and hands and hair for leonardo to paint lady gloucester he continued leaving out the christian name is english like one of shakespeare's women desdemona or imogen and lady irene has no nationality she belongs to the dream worlds of shelley and d'annunzio she is the guardian lady of shelley's sensitiva the vision of the lily quale un vaso liturgico di argento and you madame you take away all my sense of criticism vous me troublez trop pour que je définisse votre genre de beauté mrs milden was soon engaged in a deep tete-a-tete -tete with mr peebles who was heard every now and then to say quite quite miss tring was holding forth to sylvester on french sculpture and sylvester now and again said oh really in the tone of intense interest which his friends knew indicated that he was being acutely bored lady hyacinth was discussing socialism with osmond hall lady herman was discussing the theory of evolution with professor newcastle mrs lockton the question of the french church with faubourg and blenheim was discharging molten fragments of embryo exordiums and perorations on the subject of the stage to wilmot in fact there was a general buzz of conversation have you been to see antony and cleopatra asked wilmot of the stranger yes said the neighbor i went last night many authors have treated the subject and the version i saw last night was very pretty i couldn't get a program so i didn't see who i think my version interrupted wilmot with pride is admitted to be the best ah it is your version said the stranger i beg your pardon i think you treated the subject very well yes said wilmot it is ungrateful material but i think i made something fine of it no doubt no doubt said the stranger do tell us mrs baldwin was heard to ask m faubert across the table what the young generation are doing in france who are the young novelists there are no young novelists worth mentioning answered m faubert miss tring broke in and said she considered le visage émerveille by comtesse de noailles to be the most beautiful book of the century with the exception perhaps of the tagebuch einer very 
but from the end of the table blenheim's utterance was heard preponderating over that of his neighbors he was making a fine speech on the modern stage comparing an actor-manager to napoleon and commenting on the campaigns of the latter in detail quite heedless of this mr wilmot was carrying on an equally impassioned but much slower monologue on his conception of the character of cyrano de bergerac which he said he intended to produce cyrano he said has been maligned by coquelin coquelin is a great artist but he did not understand cyrano cyrano is a dreamer a poet he is a martyr of thought like tolstoy a sacrifice to wasted useless action like hamlet he is a moliere come too soon a bayard come too late a john the baptist of the stage calling out in vain in the wilderness of bricks and mortar he is misunderstood an enigma an anachronism a premature herald a false dawn count ciara was engaged in a third monologue at the head of the table he was talking at the same time to mrs bergmann lady irene and lady hyacinth about the devil a qui j'aime la diable he was saying in low tender tones the devil who creates your beauty to lure us to destruction the devil who puts honey into the voice of the siren the dolce sarina che i marinara in mezzo di marga and he hummed this line in a sing-song two or three times over the devil who makes us dream in doubt and who made life interesting by persuading eve to eat the silver apple what would life have been if she had not eaten the apple we should all be in the silly trees of the garden of eden and i should be sitting next to you he said to mrs bergmann without knowing that you were beautiful que vous êtes belle et que vous êtes désirable que vous êtes puissant et galine que je vais naufrage dans une mer de mort elle est et il naufrage me est dolce en questo mare en un mot que je vous ami life outside the garden of eden has many drawbacks said mrs bergmann who although she was inwardly pleased by count Ciara's remarks saw by lady irene's expression that she thought he was mad aucun drawback answered Ciara. ne galerait celui de contempler le divine contour feminine sans un frisson pensé donc si madame bergmann count Ciara interrupted mrs bergmann terrified of what was coming next do tell me about the book you are writing in venice mrs lockton was at that moment discussing portraiture in novels with m faubourg and during a pause miss tring was heard to make the following remark it isn't true m faubourg that cecile in la mauvaise bonte is a portrait of someone you once loved and who treated you very badly m faubourg a little embarrassed said that a creative artist made a character out of many originals then seeing that nobody was saying a word to his neighbor he turned round and asked him if he had been to the academy yes answered the stranger it gets worse every year doesn't it but mr corporal's pictures are always worth seeing said faubourg i think he paints men better than women said the stranger he doesn't flatter people but of course his pictures are very clever at this moment the attention of the whole table was monopolized by osmond hall who began to discuss the scenario of a new play he was writing my play he began is going to be called the king of the north pole i have never been to the north pole and i don't mean to go there it's not necessary to have first-hand knowledge of technical subjects in order to write a play people say that shakespeare must have studied the law because his allusions to the law are frequent and accurate that does not prove that he knew law any more than the fact that he put a c in bohemia proves that he did not know geography it proves he was a dramatist he wanted a c in bohemia he wanted lawyer's shop i should do just the same thing myself i wrote a play about doctors knowing nothing about medicine i asked a friend to give me the necessary information 
Shakespeare, I expect, asked his friends to give him the legal information he required. Every allusion to Shakespeare was a stab to Mrs. Bergman. Shakespeare's knowledge of the law is very thorough, broke in Lockton. Not so thorough as the knowledge of medicine which is revealed in my play, said Hall. Shakespeare knew law by intuition, murmured Wilmot, but he did not guess what the modern stage would make of his plays. Let us hope not, said Giles. Shakespeare, said Faubourg, was a psychologue. He had the power. I cannot say it in English. De devenir ce qu'il ne savait pas in puissant dans le fond et le tréfond de son ami. Gammon, said Hall. He had the power of asking his friends for the information he required. Do you really think, asked Giles, that before he wrote, time delves the parallel on beauty's brow, he consulted his lawyer as to a legal metaphor suitable for a sonnet? And do you think, asked Mrs. Duncan, that he asked his female relations what it would feel like to be jealous of Octavia if one happened to be Cleopatra? Shakespeare was a married man, said Hall and if his wife found the manuscript of his sonnets lying about, he must have known a jealous woman. Shakespeare evidently didn't trouble his friends for information on natural history, not for a playwright, said Hall. I myself should not mind what liberty I took with the cuckoo, the bee, or even the basilisk. I should not trouble you for accurate information on the subject. I should not even mind saying the cuckoo lays eggs in its own nest if it suited the dramatic situation. The whole of this conversation was torture to Mrs. Bergman. Shakespeare, said Lady Hyacinth, had a universal nature. One can't help thinking he was almost like God. That's what people will say of me a hundred years hence, said Hall. Only it is to be hoped they'll leave out the almost. Shakespeare understood love, said Lady Herman, in a loud voice. He knew how a man makes love to a woman. If Richard III had made love to me as Shakespeare describes him doing it, I'm not sure that I could have resisted him. But the finest of all Shakespeare's men is Othello. That's a real man. Desdemona was a fool. It's not wonderful that Othello didn't see through Iago, but Desdemona ought to have seen through him. The stupidest woman can see through a clever man like him, but of course Othello was a fool, too. Yes, broke in Mrs. Lockton, if Napoleon had married Desdemona, he would have made Iago marry one of his sisters. I think Desdemona is the most pathetic of Shakespeare's heroines, said Lady Hyacinth. Don't you think so, Mr. Hall? It's easy enough to make a figure pathetic who is strangled by a nigger, answered Hall. Now, if Desdemona had been a negress, Shakespeare would have started fair. If only Shakespeare had lived later, sighed Wilmot, and understood the condition of the modern stage, he would have written quite differently. If Shakespeare had lived now, he would have written novels, said Faubert. Yes, said Mrs. Baldwin. I feel sure you are right there. If Shakespeare had lived now, said Ciara to Mrs. Berkman, we shouldn't notice his existence. He would be just on Monsieur comme tout le monde, like that Monsieur sitting next to Faubert, he added in a low voice. The problem about Shakespeare, broke in Hall, is not how he wrote his plays. I could teach a poodle to do that in half an hour. But the problem is what made him leave off writing just when he was beginning to know how to do it. It is as if I had left off writing plays ten years ago. Perhaps, said the stranger, hesitatingly and modestly, he had made enough money by writing plays to retire on his earnings and live in the country. Nobody took any notice of this remark. If Bacon was really the playwright, said Lockton, the problem is a very different one. 
if bacon had written shakespeare's plays said sylvester they wouldn't have been so bad there seems to me to be only one argument said professor morgan in favor of the bacon theory and that is that the range of mind displayed in shakespeare's plays is so great that it would have been child's play for the man who wrote shakespeare's plays to have written the works of bacon yes said hall but because it would be child's play for the man who wrote my plays to have written your works and those of professor newcastle which it would it doesn't prove that you wrote my plays bacon was a philosopher said wilmot and shakespeare was a poet a dramatic poet but shakespeare was also an actor an actor manager and only an actor manager could have written the plays what do you think of the bacon theory asked fulbert of the stranger i think said the stranger that we shall soon have to say eggs and shakespeare instead of eggs and bacon this remark caused a slight shudder to pass through all the guests and mrs bergmann felt sorry that she had not taken decisive measures to prevent the stranger's intrusion shakespeare wrote his own plays said ciara and i don't know if he knew law but he knew le coeur de la femme cleopatra bids her slave find out the color of octavia's hair that is just what my wife my angelica would do if i were to marry someone in london while she was at rome mr gladstone used to say broke in lockton that dante was inferior to shakespeare because he was too great an optimist dante was not an optimist said ciara about the future life of politicians but i think they were both of them pessimists about man and both optimists about god shakespeare began blenheim but he was interrupted by mrs duncan who cried out i wish he were alive now and would write me a part a real woman's part the women have so little to do in shakespeare's plays there's juliet but one can't play juliet till one's forty and then one's too old to look fourteen there's lady macbeth but she's got nothing to do except walk in her sleep and say out damned spot there were not actresses in his days and of course it was no use writing a woman's part for a boy you should have been born in france said faubourg racine's women are created for you to play ah you've got sarah said mrs duncan who don't want anyone else i think racine's boring said mrs lockton he's so artificial oh don't say that said giles racine is the most exquisite of poets so sensitive so acute and so harmonious i like rostand better said mrs lockton rostand exclaimed miss tring in disgust he writes such bad verses du calchoc he's so vulgar it is true said wilmot he's an amateur he has never written professionally for his bread but only for his pleasure but in that sense said giles god is an amateur i confess said peebles that i cannot appreciate french poetry i can read rousseau with pleasure and bossuet but i cannot admire corneille and racine everybody writes plays now said faubourg with a sigh i have never written a play said lord pantry nor i said lockton but nearly everyone at this table has said faubourg mrs baldwin has written matilda mr giles has written a tragedy called queen Swaffler. i wrote a play in my youth my le mentrier de parme i'm sure corporal has written a play count ciara must have written several have you ever written a play he said turning to his neighbor the stranger yes answered the stranger i once wrote a play called hamlet you were courageous with such an original before you said faubert severely yes said the stranger the original was very good but i think he added modestly that i improved upon it encore un facture de paradoxes murmured faubert 
to himself in disgust. In the meantime, Wilmot was giving Professor Morgan the benefit of his views on Greek art, punctuated with allusions to tariff reform and devolution for the benefit of Blenheim. Luncheon was over and cigarettes were lighted. Mrs. Bergman had quite made up her mind that she had been cheated, and there was only one thing for which she consoled herself, and that was that she had not waited for luncheon, but had gone down immediately, since so far all her guests had kept up a continuous stream of conversation, which had every now and then become general, though they still every now and then glanced at the empty chair and wondered what the coming attraction was going to be mrs milden had carried on two almost interrupted tete-a-tetes first with one of her neighbors then with the other in fact everybody had talked except the stranger who had hardly spoken and since faubourg had turned away from him in disgust nobody had taken any further notice of him Mrs. Baldwin, remarking this, good-naturedly leant across the table and asked him if he had come to London for the Wagner cycle. No, he answered, I came for the horse show at Olympia. At this moment, Count Ciara, having finished his third cigarette, turned to his hostess and thanked her for having allowed him to meet the most beautiful women of London, in the most beautiful house in London, and in the house of the most beautiful hostess in london je vous je vous he said le lys argent et la rose blanche mais vous et la rose écarlate la rose de mort dont le parfum vivra dans mon coeur comme un poison d'or and here he hummed in a sing-song le son cantable le son dolce serein adieu dolce serein then he suddenly and abruptly got up, kissed his hostess's hand vehemently three times, and said he was very sorry, but he must hasten to keep a pressing engagement. He then left the room. Mrs. Bergman got up and said, Let us go upstairs. But the men had, most of them, to go, some to the House of Commons, others to fulfill various engagements. The stranger thanked Mrs. Bergman, for her kind hospitality and left and the remaining guests seeing that it was obvious that no further attraction was to be expected now took their leave reluctantly and went feeling that they had been cheated angela lockton stayed a moment who were you expecting louise dear she asked only an old friend said mrs bergmann whom you would all have been very glad to see only as he doesn't want anybody to know he's in london i couldn't tell you all who he was but tell me now said mrs lockton you know how discreet i am i promise not to dearest angela she answered and by the way what was the name of the man you brought with you didn't i tell you how stupid of me said mrs lockton it's a very easy name to remember shakespeare William Shakespeare End of A Luncheon Party by Maurice Baring A Stroke of Genius by Thomas Thursday This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Braymiller A Stroke of Genius by Thomas Thursday Those chaps, Samuel Langhorne Barker and Ellis Butler Swain, are just as humorous as a coal famine. Why, when I read Barker's Finnish Huckleberries, all that I needed to make me cry was a little soft music and some low lights. And, say, every time I think of Swain's pigs as pork, I get as weepy as a two-weeks-old widow. And the public eats so much of that stuff that they get indigestion of the brain and wonder what's the matter with them. Why, they tell me that the editors just wear out their auto-tires chasing after those fellows. 
I tell you, Jim, the only way for a new writer to get a story published nowadays is either to buy a magazine outright or marry the editor's pet stenographer. Believe me, I never brag, but you know yourself that my stories have got that bunch of millionaire scribes beaten to a fair you well. This explosive criticism occurred one night while Jeff and I were furnished rooming together out in Cleveland, Calachusetts. Regular pals, you know. Wore each other's shirts, socks, suits, and during hard times took turns at the overcoat. At that time we were both employed in the assembling department of the Irrational Crookometer Company. The salary to start was twelve fifty per, and apparently it was about the same to finish. We had been working there for nearly a year, but up to that time the firm had not even raised a window. Jeff, being the more ambitious of the two, decided to write humorous stories for the magazines. Being a failure at almost everything else, he figured that he ought to be a whirlwind at the writing game. Wasn't that the way most of the big guns of the profession started? He believed it was. Otherwise, he couldn't account for the successful authors. I, of course, was perfectly willing to listen to his assorted ravings, which was almost as tedious as composing them. Desirous of starting business in the proper literary fashion, we purchased a typewriter on the Chasem plan one dollar down and two bell rings per week. Jeff, his full name was Jefferson, named after the famous Thomas, you know, wasted a ream of perfectly good bond paper in his efforts to master the vagaries of the keyboard, bill for said wastage amounting to one dollar and ten cents. However, after about three months' practice, he managed to typewrite in a semi-readable manner three of his best literary efforts. They were The Learned Lunatic, The Speed of a Snail, and the strength of senator garlic rest assured we read and re-read polished and repolished that trinity of literary gems from every possible angle we would pet them at breakfast hug them at lunch and use them as dessert at dinner how could any editor possessing at least a spoonful of brains reject such rare humor not a chance in the world we had visions of smoke tanks, divisions of gold, and revisions of our living habits, all rolled up into one glorious nightmare. 2. Our next move was to discover the hiding place of the nearest magazine, owing to the new postage rates. To get the proper address of such periodicals, we delved into the mysteries of Jeff's newly acquired book entitled, One Thousand Places to Sell Stories, or Why Work for a Living? On page 23, we were pleased to learn that one of the largest magazines in the country, the Flipperino Weekly, was published right here in Cleveland. Fine. Under such favorable conditions, Jeff figured that if the editor dared to purloin or plagiarize his pearly masterpieces, he could easily dash around to the office and declare war. Wasn't he, at one time, a special officer in a baseball park? He surely was. That evening the three stories were mailed to the unsuspecting editor of the Flipperino Weekly. Neither of us got much sleep that night. About 3 a.m., Jeff, who had been silent for at least 15 minutes, poked me in the ribs wishing to know what we were going to do about the motion picture rights. Would the editor get all the gravy? What would the MP folks pay for stories like his? Raved out, Jeff finally passed into the land of restless dreams. 3. Didn't I tell you that a new writer doesn't stand a chance of charging through an editor's barbed wire entanglements? That's all the thanks a fella gets for writing stories that appeal to the people instead of some dyspeptic editor. You guessed it. The gems came back, and Jeff was just as peeved as a tailless cow trying to chase hungry flies off her back. The editor, however, was not altogether heartless, for he requested Jeff to revise the Senator Garlic yarn and submit it again. Can you imagine a goop like that? raved Jeff, quivering like a bowl of gelatin on an old-fashioned ferry boat. He picks out the worst of the three and wants it revised. What'll we do about it, Jim? he asked, calming down about twenty degrees. Just what the editor requests, I replied emphatically. Personally, I figured that a nibble was just as good as a catch, provided the hook was baited in the proper manner on the next cast-out. Anyway, it showed that there were fish in the editorial waters somewhere, and all it required to hook them was a little patience on Jeff's part. It's a mystery to me why he selected that garlic story, continued Jeff. The other two were hummers, believe me. Well, you see what boobs get the editorial jobs. 4. 
during the next few days jeff and i disguised the strength of senator garlic in such a way that we didn't recognize it after the job of revision was done jeff's method of promoting thought was to pace up and down the room like a candidate awaiting election returns he had read somewhere that robert louis stevedore and arthur conan sherlock were inclined to indulge in several choice fits before writing a masterpiece jeff was following the approved methods of thought stimulus all right and it would not be his fault if the strength of senator garlic didn't appeal strongly enough now to the mind of the editor what do the flipperino people pay for a three thousand word story inquired jeff sticking the pen behind his ear about two cents a word to new writers i guess i replied two cents eh well now let's see that would land us sixty bones wouldn't it yep say jim can't we stretch senator garlic into five hundred dollars asked the enterprising jeff certainly not you can't turn a short story into a three hundred page novel i answered impatiently i can't eh i guess you don't read some of the best sellers jim why, some of those bathrobed scribes can write a four-hundred-page novel in such a manner that you couldn't find enough plot in it to make a decent short story. Fellows like that ought to come under federal supervision during wartime for wasting paper and good ink. And the funny thing about it is that all the factory fannies, Stella Stenogs, and Candy Carries go plumb nutty over such stuff. Jeff punctuated his remarks with hands, legs, and arms, without serious injury to the mirror. Why, every time some poor dub of a boss leaves his office for a little liquid refreshment, the girls yank out a George Star Cushion's latest sob entitled The Frozen Tear of Texas and forget all about the boss's interest. Jim, if it wasn't for the dear girls, about 90% of those writers would have to go back to the factory and don overalls. Stop knocking, Jeff, I chirped. They get away with it, don't they? And they own motors and live in swell hotels. Give them credit credit beans grunted he turning to finish the revision of his story five the following morning on our way to the factory we mailed the revised manuscript jeff whistled various popular and unpopular tunes during working hours as he felt assured that he would soon be able to tell the manager to hire a new boy the rest of the fellows couldn't understand what had come over jeff because hitherto he had been the prize grouch of the shop saturday night he came near to quitting the job he figured that he would soon receive a check for sixty dollars which would put him on velvet until he could write his next masterpiece luckily i persuaded him to wait a while as jobs were scarce it was a good thing he heeded my warning because the same evening a letter from the editor awaited him at home it read like this dear mr sweeney you will be pleased to learn that your story the strength of senator garlic has been accepted by this magazine and will appear in an early issue enclosed we send you check for two dollars and fifty cents which sum is our regular rate of payment for a story like yours i trust that you will become a regular contributor from now on yours sincerely hicks baldome editor well sir or ma'am when jeff got the full gist of that editorial bullet into his sensitive and vainglorious noodle I thought that he'd required the service of a straitjacket. Get a cop, he howled, pacing up and down like a New York thermometer. What does that goop think I live on? Donut holes and air wafers? Take it easy, Jeff. Maybe the editor made a mistake, I said soothingly. Mistake, he glared. I should say he did make a mistake. No sleep that night. Jeff tossed around like a Mexican jumping bean and growled intermittently in a most uncanny manner. Poor Jeff. He was all in. 6. On the level, Jim, don't you think my story outshines all the rest of that sickly-looking bunch in this magazine? asked Jeff, passing me the latest issue of the Flipperino Weekly, which contained his story. To be perfectly candid, Jeff's yarn did loom up far ahead of all the rest, and I told him so. Say, I've got an idea that will make that editor feel as cheap as a dime in front of a barrel of sugar, he said confidently. Shoot, was my request. Listen, he began, we'll frame up some fake letters of praise and send them to our friends in different parts of the country. The scheme is to have them rewrite them and send them to the editor signing their own name. Some idea, eh? I agreed that it was a corker, if it worked. 
now i learned in after life that letters of praise to an editor are just as welcome as a revolution to a grade a bolshevikist such epistles you understand are a means that a poor editor has of knowing the pulse of his clientele but the letters often rub the editorial fur in the wrong direction perchance the editor will receive five hundred letters praising a certain story and one howling that said story was hopelessly bad then it's a ten to one shot that the editor will agree with the minority communication letters are bully things for the editor but let the author beware neither jeff nor i understood editorial psychology at that time seven during the next half hour jeff busied himself with the frame-up letters the composing of them delighted him to the core he was at his very best when it came to the manufacture of fairy tales have a slant at this jim he said as he passed me one of the finished letters it read as follows heandry vermain december five nineteen seventeen editor flipperino weekly clevelado calachusetts sir allow me to congratulate you on selecting a real story at last the strength of senator garlic was the best yarn your bone dry magazine has ever published give us some more stories by jefferson sweeney he's a genius yours truly p o box eighteen sixty one hiram fluke it's a little raw jeff isn't it i said raw your grandmother i'd put a bomb into each one if i could read the rest that the reader may have the benefit of jeff's genius i'll give two more complete samples fishhook florolina december seven nineteen seventeen editor flipperino weekly clevelado calachusetts dear sir has the magazine changed hands recently it certainly looks that way because i found a live story in your last issue prior to this number all the stories appeared to me as if the writers had dyspepsia or rheumatism of the brain if you wish to have your magazine continue to have a healthy circulation in these parts why you'd better give jefferson sweeney a contract for life his garlic story was so comical that my ever hungry brother postponed his breakfast to read it yours for the change p o box seventeen seventy maud chewing here's the other take a look washington december four nineteen seventeen ed flipperino weekly clevelado calachusetts dear ed when i read the strength of senator garlic by jefferson sweeney in your last issue i was obliged to turn to the title page to see if it was the same magazine well 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 you woke up at last why heretofore your stories were so sad that our minister used to take them for his sunday sermon text now if you will promise to give us some more of mr sweeney's tales i will take a year's subscription and pay for it out of my own pocket this time the present subscription was a christmas present given to me by a veteran of the civil war yours sincerely p o box fourteen ninety two philip o'can eight i'll be back in a few minutes jim just going over to the post office and mail the letters said jeff putting on his cap and overcoat how many are you going to send i asked seven this time more in a few days he replied as he breezed out of the room left alone i tried to vision the learned editor's conduct after reading jeff's strategical correspondence i couldn't imagine that gentleman otherwise than taking it all to heart and immediately forwarding jeff a life contract fifteen minutes later jeff returned excited and out of breath did i leave one of the letters here he asked panting i don't see it i replied after searching around the room well i bought stamps for seven but when i started to stick them on i discovered that one letter was missing maybe you lost it whom was it addressed to to an old friend tom kelly out in florafina merryware he answered scratching his head it'll be all right i guess possibly some conscientious person may find it stick on a stamp and shoot it into the mailbox i remarked philosophically for the next few weeks jeff promenaded around with one of those don't touch me i'm holy walks figuring on the blessed day when he would be able to discard his overalls forever and of course i humored him in his whim believing that eventually i would be the same to him as monsieur bourrienne was to napoleon bonaparte 
Knowing somewhat of the life of Jack London and Oliver Goldsmith, I was imaginative enough to dream that Jeff was capable of attaining the same literary eminence. Wasn't he struggling for recognition in much the same manner as those chaps? He surely was, in my opinion. 9. Looks like another letter from the editor, I remarked one evening as we entered the house. That's the stuff, said Jeff as we dashed up to the room. I'll bet it's a contract, said I enthusiastically. Oh boy, it's the bacon all right, was his joyous return. Bet you can't leave it on the desk five minutes without opening it, I said. No bet, I'm going to open that letter just as soon as I take my mitts off, he answered excitedly. Well, sir, or ma'am, when Jeff read that epistle of supposed to be joy, he changed so much that he wouldn't have had a chance to pass the physical examination of a wooden army. The game's up, he gasped, dropping into a chair. What's the matter? Bad news? I asked solicitously. Worse than that. Something went wrong. Read it for yourself. I did. Surely it was a twenty-four carat knockout wallop. Listen to the innocent editor. Mr. Jefferson Sweeney, 13 Luck Avenue, Clevelado, Calachusetts. Dear Mr. Sweeney, I take this opportunity of informing you that I would be pleased to give you a life contract, provided, of course, that your future stories are guaranteed to be just half as humorous as your art and method of correspondence. No offense, please. Yours pleasantly. Hicks Baldome, Editor. What is your guess? that the editor found Jeff's lost letter? Something like that. He did not find it, but the office boy did. How could he? Too easy. The office boy lived next door to us, it turned out upon investigation. Did he open it? Oh, boy. And did he hot foot to the editor with it? He did. Tough luck? It was. My, but you are a good guesser. End of A Stroke of Genius Nearly Over by Thomas Thursday This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Braymiller Nearly Over by Thomas Thursday a setback only had the effect of making Sweeney try harder than ever to smash into print with one of his marvelous stories. In fact, after his distasteful work was finished for the day at the Crookometer factory, he would dash back to the room and proceed to hatch out new plots by the score. No trouble at all. He became also an expert typewriter player, and, after only six months' practice, managed to reel off a full sheet of paper without making more than ten or fifteen mistakes. Not bad, eh? Of course, you must bear in mind that Jeff used only two fingers, one on each hand, while other stenogs had to use all. He assured me that he had the new noiseless touch system down pat, but, unfortunately, the goop that camped in the next room didn't appreciate the noiseless part of the system, because one night he shouted through the keyhole, Why don't you guys bring up a hand organ? I'm tired of hearing that pile-driving machine of yours. Play on something else for a change. Jeff paid no attention to the poor chap's raving, and kept right on banging away until he had finished his new story. And it was some story. Personally, I thought, well, here's what Jeff thinks about it. I'll admit, Jim, that in writing The Mender of Broken Hearts, I'm catering to the taste and appetites of girls under twenty and those over forty. But we can use a little coin, can't we? I figured it all out, and I'm dead sure that I've written one of the greatest mush stories ever attempted. It's on the style of that guy Harold Ding Dong left, and there's enough tears in it to promote a miniature ocean, believe me. You know that I don't care to lower myself to scribble stuff like that. But since 90% of the girls are not happy unless they have something to cry over, far be it from me to stop them enjoying themselves. What magazine do you think will pay the highest price for it, Jim? I'd advise you to shoot it to the Eversob Monthly. That's just about their speed, I think. How much do they slip you? I don't know, Jeff. They ought to pay at least two cents a word for a story like that. It's a novelette, isn't it? 
Yeah, I guess you could call it that and get away with it. It's about 100 typewritten pages, and there's a little over 25,000 words mixed up in it. What's the difference between a novelette and a novel, Jeff? Well, in my opinion, Jim, novelettes are always started with the idea of writing a novel, but the goop that's writing it runs dry in the middle. The only thing he can do then is throw in some kind of reasonable finish and label it novelette. And what would you call a novel? As a rule, a novel is a thin short story that's fattened with about 60,000 words used in the descriptions of trees, moonlight, and the hair of the leading dame. Then what's a short story? That's a cinch to answer. A short story is nothing but the scenario of a novel. Jeff yawned a little and made arrangement to place his feet in a more comfortable position upon the bureau. By the way, Jeff, Mrs. Snickers told me this morning that the typewriter man was around looking for some dough, I said, changing the subject. Well, he'll get paid just as soon as some of those dyspeptic editors slip me some coin. It won't be the first bill he's muffed in his lifetime, believe me, he replied in a bored manner. You see, we had purchased a typewriter on the hide-and-seek plan, and Mrs. Snickers, our landlady, told me very politely that she didn't care to have the good name of her boarding-house embarrassed by having a choice assortment of installment collectors wear out the doorbell. Say, Jim, where's the Eversob Monthly published? Out in Minicago, Idaconson, I informed him. Good night. That's extra postage, isn't it? Well, it's only a few cents more, but think of the coin you're going to get for it, I shot back enthusiastically. All right, then. I'll give that bird the first crack at it. And he did. 2. Two weeks later, the editor of the Eversob Monthly gave Jeff an opportunity to test his lungs in the approved manner. Listen to Jeff. Believe me, Jim, the only thing that separates that editor from a crepe-colored eye is about fifteen dollars worth of railroad fare. Take it from me, if that goop had his office here in Clevelado, I'd be in jail long ago. He thinks he's funny, don't he? Well, believe me, the day will come when he'll wear out the knees of his pants begging for some of my stuff. Just wait. Now, if you don't think Jeff was justified in howling like that, read this. My dear Sweeney, your enclosed one hundred sheets of paper would have been very acceptable to this magazine, had you left them blank. Yours, etc. Hilary Felix, Editor. On the level. Wouldn't that take the heart out of the Sphinx? How the editor ever muffed the mender of broken hearts is to Jeff the eighth, ninth, and tenth wonder of the world. I say, Jeff, maybe if you read a little more, you'd get what they call style. You know that you don't read much besides the Clevelado Evening Guesser, I told Jeff, trying to help him. Forget it, Jim, forget it. You don't have to know anything to write stories. Why, there isn't one story out of a hundred that's printed the way the guy wrote it. That's what an editor's for. And talk about reading. Believe me, Jim, nothing gets by me. Absolutely nothing. Why, I've read all the classics, such as Slick Starter, Old Queen Grady, The Statue Boys of 76, and a bunch of them work-and-lose tales. Of course, when I was a young chap and didn't know any better, I used to read lowbrow stuff like Less Misery by that Frenchy fellow, Victor e. Hugo. I also skimmed over a lot of stuff by those old Greek hack writers like Eris Plato, Sincero, and Periodicals. Of course, all that stuff died long ago. Take $20,000 Under the Ocean by Julius Verne, for example. Why, in order to keep that alive, they had to put it out as a moving picture. And say, talk about poetry. Remember that small-time poem by old Jack Milton called Paradise Missing? And that infernal affair by Dante on theory? Well, I read all that dope before I ever met you, Jim. Now doesn't that prove to you that there's something wrong with a country that allows a genius like Jeff to wear out his young life in a suit of overalls? Although I knew he was pretty well educated and all that, I didn't know that he had waded through all that stuff. By the way, Jeff, when did you leave school? I asked. I didn't leave, Jim. You see, it was this way. I had been going to school for about two years when one day the goop that sat next to me dropped his bean shooter on the floor. Well, I swiped the blame thing and decided to practice on the kid sitting directly in front of the teacher. Now, I never was a good shot with a thing like that, so I muffed the kid, and the paper bullet hit the teacher plumb on the nose. I haven't been to school since, Jeff concluded with a faraway look in his eyes. Too bad, I remarked, 
and it sure was. Poor Jeff was one of those fellows who never have any luck anyway. Three days later he bought seven of the latest magazines and promptly voiced his disapproval of the bunch. However, when I looked them over, I discovered something that might interest him. Say, Jeff, did you notice that that chap, Chauncey Crackers, has one of his stories in all these magazines except the Tenderfoot Weekly? What did you say the goop's name was? asked he, interested. Crackers, I repeated. Crackers? No wonder the girls eat up his brand of stuff. If I had a name like Crackers, I'd write advertisements for the Leatherine Biscuit Company. Listen, Jim, I've got an idea. Suppose I frame up a story and sign Chauncey Cracker's name to it, and shoot it to the editor of the Tenderfoot. I figure that the poor dub will faint from joy when he discovers that Chauncey has lowered himself to send him some of his work. How about it? Great, Jeff, great, I exclaimed enthusiastically. Leave it to Sweeney to frame up the big idea. On the level, isn't he some genius? So far as nerve is concerned, Jeff was still about ten laps ahead of the Kaiser. During the next few days, he wrote the greatest yarn of his career. 3. Say, Jim, I think we'd better blow from this camp. That flossy hemp dame gets me nervous. Did you hear her chatter at the table tonight? She sounded like one of those new squeak-a-lot talking machines. And there I was trying to scheme up a new plot with that chick tittering like a canary bird. Why, she knocked twenty pounds of good thoughts plumb out of my noodle. She was all right until she got that job with the Flicker department store. But since then, I guess she hollers, Cash! in her sleep. It's fierce. Anyway, he went on, I'm getting sick of the grub old lady Snickers is passing out lately. Did you taste that hash? Some mystery. Take it from me. I'll bet ten to one that the cat passed it up. I don't mind Hooverizing to help win the war, but old Snickers is just a little too patriotic to suit me. What does she take us for? Birds? And say, don't that pickle supply of hers ever run out? I bet if you walked into the dining room at three o'clock in the morning, you'd find a gang of pickles on the table. She must be Heinz's fifty-seventh cousin. If she thinks I'm going to slip her six bones a week for stuff like that, she's plumb nutty. Remember the breakfast? Why, there was enough water in the oatmeal to make a good-sized fish feel at home. And listen, did you taste that egg that she passed out? I don't want to knock or anything like that. But I bet the hen that manufactured that egg of mine died two years ago. Take it from me, Jim. I'm through. When it came to criticizing Mrs. Snicker's war-portioned meals, Jeff hit the nail right on the bean. The only time the dear old dame paid any attention to her victims was when they failed to hand her the weekly bankroll. In that event, she would rap gently on the door and converse about the weather until you slipped her the coin. Jeff claims that she makes at least ninety percent on her original investment. After growling a while longer, Jeff settled on the bed in disgust and placed his feet upon the pillow. "'Cheer up, Jeff,' I said, trying to make him feel better. "'Just finish your new cracker story, and you'll feel great when the coin rolls in.' "'Cheer up, beans,' he raved. "'How can a guy write in a joint like this?' Jeff was surely developing a temperament, just like those regular writers. "'What's the name of the new story?' I inquired, trying to get him separated from his grouch. He brightened up at once and replied, I named it The End of Tilly Finish, and it's got a laugh in every line. I'll wind it up just as soon as I can forget about that hash. However, Jeff didn't forget about that hash, because the following day at the Crookometer factory, he had a grand smash-up with the superintendent and was promptly fired. But maybe Jeff didn't tell that fellow something on his way out. Oh, boy. When Jeff had finished, the boss looked like nothing ever seen before. Jeff told me about it the same evening. Take it from me, Jim. I'm glad I'm out of it. How can a man like me get along with a bunch of roughnecks that don't know anything about literature? Why, they're so far out of my class they can't even see me when I breeze by. They never heard of guys like Shakespeare and Rudy or Doyle or any of those fellows. Well, I don't care. I've got enough coin to hold out a month, and I'm going to sit down and write my head off. That's the spirit, Jeff. Even if your coin does run out, I'm still working, you know. I won't forget that, Jim, and when I do get there, you'll be the only guy I'll recognize, believe me. I couldn't help liking Jeff Sweeney. Personally, I wouldn't care if he failed to work for a year. I felt quite sure that it would be only a short time when he would have all the editors winded from chasing after him. Somehow, though, he didn't make a hit with the girls. In fact, Flossie Hemp thought he had some kind of dyspepsia. 
but I guess she was sore because Jeff didn't fall for her line of beauty. He wasn't a woman-hater or anything like that, but he liked to surround himself with intellectual people. Of course, poor Flossie wasn't guilty of being anything like that. Her vocabulary, consisting of cash, anything else, and thank you, was about all that her brain could handle at the time. But she knew more about chewing gum than the chap that invented it. 4. During the next week, Jeff kept himself cooped in the room like a regular hermit. Although he knew all there was to know about the art of story writing, he bought a book entitled How to Write a Short Story or Scientific Ways of Ducking an Editor's Wastebasket, just to see if the author of the book knew as much about it as he did. According to Sweeney, the author knew fifty percent less. "'How's the book, Jeff?' I inquired. "'Fierce,' was his terse reply. "'The guy that wrote it, Pendennis Hoop, must have got his dope from an iron foundry. It gets me sore when I read stuff like that. The funny part of it is that he never succeeded in having one of his own stories published. Yet he has the nerve to tell other guys just how to do it. Can you imagine that? For example, take chapter 10 on What Editors Want But Don't Get. Why, if a writer followed those instructions, he'd be placed in the madhouse for safety of the general public. I bet Pendennis is laughing yet over the two bones I slipped him. It's a ten-to-one shot that he's got a picture of Barnum hanging on the wall. It's a wise old bird that can put one over on Jeff Sweeney, I'll tell you. Say, Jeff, how's the new Cracker story getting along? I finished it this morning, Jim, and mailed it to the Tenderfoot editor. Before I sent it, I tried it out on Flossie. And what do you suppose happened? Why, the poor female started to cry before she hurdled the third chapter. And I thought I wrote the greatest humorous story on earth. I bet every time she goes to see one of those Charlie Feet comic pictures, she takes along five or six handkerchiefs to mop up the tears. She's a mystery to me. 5. Now it so happened that the seventh day following the mailing of the Cracker's story fell on Friday the 13th, but it didn't fall half as hard as Sweeney. As I entered the house, Mrs. Snickers met me in the hall and nervously informed me that she thought there was something the matter with Jeff, because she heard strange mutterings leaking via the keyhole. Flossie Hemp was quite sure that Mr. Sweeney must have broken the statue of Julius Caesar, as she was very positive that she heard an awful crash that sounded just like pieces of plaster kissing the floor. That was enough to convince me that all was not as it should be up the vicinity of Jefferson Sweeney. I dashed up to the camp and found Jeff pacing up and down the room with his hands behind his back and his hair twisted all over his head. "'What's the trouble, Jeff, old boy?' I asked anxiously. "'Nothing. Absolutely nothing. I feel just as lively as Chris Columbus.' Get out your guitar, Jim, and play me the dead march in Saul. Turn the whole world upside down and find out what's on the bottom of it. Go the limit. But, Jeff, what's the matter? I pleaded, greatly agitated. Smatter? Take a slant at the glad news on the table. I walked over to the table and beheld the rejected Cracker's story. Also a letter from the editor of the Tenderfoot Weekly. When I had finished reading that funereal epistle, I felt worse about it, I think, than Jeff did. Here it is, word for word, and gloom for gloom. Dear whoever you are, I have reported your case to Dr. Slicer of Morgue View Hospital, and he promises to look you up some day this week. In the meantime, I would suggest that you do the best to alleviate your malady by placing ice-cold towels on your head at intervals of five minutes. That's what you get for quitting the plumbing business, anyway. Did a pipe or something fall on your head lately? Sincerely yours. Rufus Hector, editor, otherwise known as Chauncey Crackers. If, reader, during your travels you chance to find yourself in the little town of Why Not, Della Hampshire, step into the city hall, and you will find the following record. Jefferson Sweeney, born January 13, Friday, 1896, son of Martha and Jerry Sweeney. End of Nearly over. Words and Music by Thomas Thursday. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Braymiller. Words and Music by Thomas Thursday. 
Chapter One Temporarily Unemployed. Take it from me, Jim. There must be something the matter with those songwriting fellows. Why, I bet I could write better songs than they do with my left hand, or even blindfolded in the dark. I pity anybody who's got to sing stuff like that. Of course, I'm not knocking, but it's a cinch that they must compose their melodies on a dishpan instead of a piano. I bought a copy of that theatrical magazine called Maudlin Melodia, and believe me, when I read the advertisements of the latest songs, I promptly decided that the song business would go into the hands of the receiver unless I get busy and help them out. On the level, Jim, don't you think I could beat those guys writing songs? Surely, Jeff, why don't you try? I chirped. I felt certain that my pal and furnished roommate could excel those regular writers, and I was willing to do everything possible to encourage him. Leave it to Jefferson Sweeney to show people the right way to do things. Although the fact that we resided in Mrs. Snicker's boarding house was a severe handicap to Jeff's art, I figured that he would be able to hurdle such minor obstacles with ease. Jeff was temporarily unemployed, but I was perfectly willing to pay his expenses and take general care of him until his volcanic genius erupted into a lava of dividends. The rent extracted by Mrs. Snickers was quite meager, likewise the portions she slipped us at the table. And since my salary had been raised to a higher altitude at the Crickometer factory, I was able to defray both our board bills with comparatively small hardship. Anyway, I believed Jeff to be an excellent investment, and that for every dollar I loaned to him, I would receive ten or more in return. Although my motive was not of a mercenary nature, Jeff insisted that he would pay me back with compound interest just as soon as the literary world awakened to the fact that he was a veritable scribe. Hitherto he had tried his hand at writing stories for the magazines, with considerable success so much so that he had succeeded in having two of his gems accepted by periodicals so large and prominent that one even claimed a circulation of more than two thousand. The mere fact that he had numerous rejections to his credit was not his fault, but rather another demonstration of the gentry who have a stranglehold on the editorial jobs when they ought to have a toehold in the plumbing business. Jeff says so, and, of course, he ought to know all of which shows that Jeff's batting average in the literary league was not so bad, especially when you take into consideration the editorial southpaws he was obliged to face. Listen, Jim, continued Jeff, on your way home from work tomorrow, stop in at Duster's bookstore and get me a copy of How to Write a Popular Song, or Making a Fortune Without Brains, by Fuller Scales. I've seen it advertised in the magazines, and maybe it will help me with my work but I guess I know all there is to know about songwriting. You don't have to know much, anyway. How much will the book cost, Jeff? One dollar and ten cents net, according to the advertisement. What does net mean, Jeff? I asked. Well, Jim, a net is something they use to catch things in, like fish. But I think it's a little raw when they use it to sell books with, though I admit that I've been caught a good many times myself. Jeff yawned and suggested that we retire for the night as it was nearing ten o'clock. Chapter 2 Inspiration and Casey About ten minutes after I slid under the sheets, I fell into a much-needed sleep which was accompanied by a terrible dream. I heard the constant crack of machine guns and numerous rifle shots. Crack, 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 just like that. Then I heard an awful shouting and awoke to find Jeff pounding away at his typewriter dressed in his pajamas. "'What are you shouting about, Jim?' he asked, grinning. "'Dreaming?' "'What are you trying to do, Jeff? Write songs at 3 a.m.?' "'Well, I got a corking idea for a song while I was half asleep, and I thought it would be a good idea to reel it off while it was still fresh in my mind. Did I wake you up?' "'I should say you did. I thought that I was somewhere in Flanders hearing machine guns spout, caused by you banging on the typewriter, I guess. I sure was scared.' and I was. Sorry, Jim, but wait until you see the song I just wrote. It's a peacherino, believe me. What's the title? I asked drowsily. It's pretty sad, Jim. I've called it When Pitcher McCarthy Hit Casey on the Bean. Take a slant at it and compare it with the stuff you hear nowadays. Jeff passed me his handiwork. Here's the chorus. 
Wanger smashed a single to the right field fence, but the way he stole second was more than immense. Speeder hit a scorcher that knocked Hookus on his ear. You can take it from me, but that crowd did cheer. Then Muffin slams the pill, way up near the moon. They didn't find the ball till the next afternoon. We needed only another run to even up the score, and the mob went wild till their voices got sore. The next three men got their base on balls, which made Manager Flipper foam like Niagara Falls. Then Casey strolled to the plate with his bat in his hand, which made all the girls exclaim, Say, ain't he grand? But such a riot of joy ne'er before was seen when pitcher McCarthy hit Casey on the bean. What do you think of it, Jim? Pretty good for three o'clock in the morning. But what happened when Mr. Casey was hit by Mr. McCarthy? I inquired, not able to understand the song's climax. What do you suppose happens, you poor goop? snapped Jeff, getting red in the face. Would you like me to give you a demonstration? Do you mean to tell me that you don't know what happens when a fellow gets cracked on the bean with a baseball? You wouldn't expect him to sing, would you? As far as I know, Jim, he either gets a place on first base or a place in the hospital. Take it from me. If all the people were like you, I'd have to have my songs illustrated. Chapter 3. Tapping Out Harmony the following evening, as soon as we had finished our meager supply of hash, onions, and near coffee, Jeff asked Flossie Hemp, the star borderess, if she would assist him to compose a melody to his song. He painted in bright colors the great chance she would have to become rich and famous via the songwriting route. Now, Jeff didn't know one note from the other, so he figured that Flossie would be able to show him a thing or two about extracting harmony from a piano. She was the only person in the house who could get any sound out of Mrs. Snicker's antique instrument, and, needless to say, she was delighted to help Jeff as much as possible. You see, Miss Hemp, explained Jeff, all you've got to do is tap out a little harmony to the words I've written, and I'll get some goop that knows something about arranging songs to do the rest. If I sell the song, which I surely will, I'll split fifty-fifty with you. Of course, I can't let you have your name on it, but if it's a hit, I'll mention your name to the actresses and actors, telling them that you helped me out. Are you satisfied? I don't care about a name, Mr. Sweeney. All I want is the coin. I saw a gorgeous new— That's the idea, interrupted Jeff. You're just like that old Turkish songwriter, Omar Kayslam, who said, Take the cash and let the credit blow. You remember reading that, don't you? Can't say as I did, replied Flossie. This didn't surprise me at all, because when a girl has to measure out ribbons all day at Flicker's department store, she hasn't got any time to delve into the squeaks of songwriters, Turkish or otherwise. Flossie started out by doing a do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, do. Hit that do key harder, Miss Hemp, said Jeff. It sounds like money. After practicing and guessing for about two hours, they succeeded in setting a certain amount of notes to when Pitcher McCarthy hit Casey on the bean. Although Jeff's voice would have been more at home selling fish up an alley, he managed to get within twenty yards or so of Flossie's notes. This piano must have been used by Pocahontas, he complained. It doesn't seem to harmonize with my voice at all. Well, my old music teacher, Professor Rumble, always said that you can't get harmony out of oatmeal, teeheed Flossie, taking a slant at Mrs. Snickers. I wish you'd whistle instead of trying to sing, Mr. Sweeney, chirped Mrs. Snickers from the corner of the room where she was trying to extract a few tears from the latest sob book. I can't read with such a racket. If you don't know how to whistle, hum. And I wish Miss Hemp wouldn't strike the keys so hard. I'm afraid she'll put the piano out of tune. No chance of doing that, answered Jeff. Paderewski's grandfather did that long ago. I'll have you understand, Mr. Sweeney, snapped the landlady, that my piano is in perfect condition. Besides, I didn't agree to furnish a piano with room and board. That's all right, Mrs. Snickers, retorted Jeff. If you can prove that Miss Hemp has broken anything that isn't already smashed, I'll pay for it. You said it, whispered Flossie. And so it went until the song was finally wedded to Flossie's best melodies, after which we dashed up to the camp. Chapter 4 Genius is genius. The old lady ought to put that piano in a glass case and hire a watchman, growled Jeff as soon as we landed in the room. Can you imagine her kicking about anybody putting it out of tune? Why, if that thing could talk, I bet it would tell you all about the Battle of Yorktown. 
Never mind, Jeff, I said soothingly. You'll be able to buy a piano for yourself pretty soon. As Jeff disrobed for the night, he threw one of his shoes at the wall just out of peevishness. Listen, Jeff, I pleaded. Please don't get any more inspirations at 3 a.m. I'd like to get a little sleep tonight. Can't be helped, Jim, he replied, pulling on a sock. Genius is genius, you know, and it's liable to hit a fellow any time. Why, only the other day I was reading a book called Private Lives of the Old Music Masters, or Why Barbers Went Hungry, by Professor Rufus Halfoff. And believe me, Jim, those fellows used to compose songs at all hours of the day and night. Why, one chap named Harmonio Pepperino used to go without sleep for a week. Another guy, Sirius D. W. Flapdoodle, used to live on three soda crackers a day before he became rich and famous. Genius is a wonderful thing, Jim, he concluded, taking a slant at himself in the mirror. But say, Jeff, why is it that inspiration don't come to a fellow in the daytime? I don't know, Jim. Maybe it's bashful or something. However, as I extinguished the light, I hoped that nothing would cause Jeff to leave the bed until morning. Chapter 5. Undoubtedly the Right Place The following Sunday, Jeff and I decided to search around the neighborhood for somebody who knew something about music. What will they soak me to arrange my song, do you know, Jim? No idea, Jeff. A couple of dollars ought to pay the bill. At 1861 Civil Avenue, we spied a sign reading, Professor Tralalar Bang, music teacher. Let's try him, Jeff suggested, leading the way up the stoop. An exceptionally pretty girl answered the bell, all of which made Jeff certain that the place was just what he was looking for. Is the professor in? asked Jeff, taking off his hat. Oh, yes, just step into the conservatory, and I'll inform Father that you have called, she replied, giving Jeff a charming smile. I guess this is the right place all right, he whispered as soon as the young lady departed. And when Jeff makes a remark like that about a lady, why, said lady must be a considerable looker, because if there ever was a misogynist, Jeff was it. The professor turned out to be a short, heavy-set man of middle age with just enough hair on his head to keep about three teeth of a comb in active service. I think your song is marvelous, he told Jeff after trying Flossie's notes on the piano. Thanks, returned Jeff, flushed. How much will you charge to arrange it? Well, now, ahem, <laughs> considering the fact that you are not a wealthy man, I should think that ten dollars would be a fair price. The professor turned an innocent-looking face upon Jeff and ran his fingers through at least three of his half a dozen hairs. Jeff gasped. Ditto yours truly. What will we do about it, Jim? he asked, scratching his ear. Let the professor go ahead and arrange it, I replied, figuring that if the song turned out to be a hit, a little thing like ten bones would be a mere nothing. All right, professor, go to it, said Jeff. When will it be finished? I'll complete it by tomorrow night, and have my daughter deliver it to you, replied the professor as he led us to the door. As soon as we arrived home, Jeff got busy with his typewriter and started to hatch out some more song lyrics. I interrupted several times to ask how he was getting along, but for a reply he placed his finger to his lips, which meant that he was in deep concentration. Chapter 6. A Postponed Order It is with a heavy heart that I record this chapter in the life of Jefferson Sweeney. Although he finds consolation in the fact that great masters of literature, like Rupert Blues, Governor Saab, and John Hendrick Bing, had their ups and downs before buying villas on the Hudson. I refused to be cheered by the successes of less talented scribes than Jeff. However, he now admits that he made a slight mistake in supposing that all publishers were capable of recognizing genius as soon as it poked its head above the horizon of a mediocre world. It had cost him ten dollars, of my money, to have Professor Bang arrange the song, and when it drifted back after two weeks from the first publisher to which he sent it, Jeff was as peeved as a hungry elephant after muffing a misdirected peanut. And when he had read the letter that accompanied its rejection, he dashed around the room like a Kansas cyclone out upon a practice spin. Here's the letter. Dear Mr. Sweeney, Whatever the enclosed is supposed to be, we thank you for submitting the same. We publish songs, not riddles. 
it may interest you to learn that the two basic principles of popular songs are as follows first words second music since your effort lacks both those essential features we are obliged to return it to you very truly bow fiddle and string by delancey guff rather sarcastic anent this affair jeff commented as follows believe me jim those fellows must have glass eyes and wooden heads why they don't know song hits when they see them i'll leave it to anybody with a spoonful of brains to judge whether or not my stuff isn't far ahead of those regular writers flossie of course was heartbroken over the whole business she had left a deposit on a new gown at madame de murphy's maison parisienne with full expectations of paying the balance from the proceeds of the songs however as soon as flossie was appraised of the sad news she immediately asked madame to hold the gown for a few days more chapter seven a brilliant plan listen jim jeff said later in a calmer manner i've decided to change my name maybe they think that a fellow with a name like mine can't write songs do names count jeff i inquired wondering if it was so i should say they do that's why i'm going to take one of those hide-and-seek names myself just look at the fancy names on the songs and novels to make sure that he would adopt a fitting name jeff delved into a volume entitled aristocrats of the old world or who used to be who by baron deliverous light knob due to the fact that he found such a vast assortment of noble sounding names he cogitated long and ponderously before making a selection i guess algernon st cyr just about fits my talent he decided throwing the book upon the bureau sounds rather elite and distinctive i affirmed and it surely did jeff sent out the song again this time to the jazzerino music company and the name of the author and composer was not jefferson sweeney now but algernon st cyr but the title remained the same when pitcher mccarthy hit casey on the bean chapter eight prunes on the side a week passed, during which time Jeff gave his brain a much-needed rest by staying as far away from the camp as possible. He would tramp the streets for hours at a time with a notebook in hand, jotting down anything that impressed him as being good song material. He had visions of Ava Tangleway, Grace Ledoux, and Harry Lauder singing his song gem before great and enthusiastic audiences. Flossie, in turn, cared nothing for fame and less for the applause of the multitudes. But that gown, would Madame de Murphy wait just a little longer? She would. Flossie's anxiety was caused more or less by the rapidly approaching ball to be given by the Big Noise Social Club, of which she was an honorary member. And maybe she wouldn't make Tilly giggle jealous when that glove-counter expert piped her new regalia. Well and then a few days more of anxious waiting a little more anticipation and the world was theirs the sun shone the birds sang and the moon beamed just for flossie and jeff soon as i had arrived home from work accompanied by a certain amount of grease and grime i was appraised of the glad news the song was bought and paid for not a word was enclosed with the fifty dollar check just pay to the order of algernon st cyr etc letters don't count jim jeff informed me although the price paid for my song is pretty low it's all right for a starter anyway it proves that there is at least one publisher in the country with brains enough to appreciate a song hit when he sees it as soon as mrs snickers had cashed the check jeff gave flossie her share and that young lady immediately dashed out and brought back the cherished gown much to the admiration of the landlady "'Ain't it just gorgeous?' she asked the assembled company, displaying her heart's desire. "'It looks great, Miss Hemp. Great!' chirped Jeff. "'Stick to me, and you'll soon be owning motors and yachts.' Much joy in the house that night. The landlady even went so far as to give us an extra portion of prunes, and enough butter to cover sufficiently at least three slices of bread. Jeff was obliged to admit that she could be human if she tried.' That night Jeff slept as calmly as Rip Van Winkle was supposed to have slept. Not a murmur, not a twist, not a sign of restlessness was noticeable during the entire slumber period. Chapter 9 Business Skill 
the following morning a slight tap on the door was accompanied by a letter that mrs snickers slipped under the crack jeff was the first to read it and then bang like a bolt from the sky his hopes and dreams were dashed to oblivion luck apparently was not twin to genius or even a distant relation here's the letter mr algernon st cyr thirteen luck avenue clevelado calachusetts dear sir Recently we sent you our check for fifty dollars. In doing this, our bookkeeper, in a manner that is still puzzling us, made a grievous mistake. Check should have been sent to another person. Be kind enough to rectify his error by returning the aforementioned sum as soon as convenient. Your song is under consideration. Yours truly, Jazzerino Music Company, by Octavio Flat. Well, maybe Jeff wasn't peeved boy he ran his fingers through his own wealth of red hair in a manner that betokened no great love for a certain music publisher believe me jim this world is all wrong he complained how does that goop expect me to return money that i already spent can they have me arrested he suddenly asked his face turning from a red to a whitish hue i don't know jeff i replied not knowing anything about the law on that point Jeff, for the next few minutes, paced around the room like a caged wild cat, and then, getting a sudden inspiration, exclaimed, I'm going to take a chance, Jim. I'll teach those birds a lesson. Take it from me. He dashed over to the typewriter and yanked off the cover. His face regaining its fiery color, Jeff proceeded to assault that innocent piece of mechanism in an extremely vicious manner. He walloped the commas, banged the semicolons, and pounded the periods. Take a slant at this, Jim, he said, passing me the following letter. Mr. Octavio Flat, care of Jazzerino Music Company, Bedlam, Orifornia. My dear Mr. Flat, you said it. Take it from me. Mistake is the correct word. If you can show me how to return money that I've already spent, you might have a chance of getting back your coin. Hereafter, count your change before leaving the post box, and give my regards to the bookkeeper. He's my idea of a regular guy. And listen, since my song is paid for, why not publish it? Yours seriously, Algernon St. Cyr. Believe me, Jim, they've got to publish my song now. And Algernon St. Cyr, nay, Jefferson Sweeney, smiled triumphantly. He considered himself a businessman as well as a genius a bird that does not occur in many regions. End of Words and Music A Passion in the Desert by Honoré de Balzac This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Winston Tharp The sight was fearful, she exclaimed, as we left the menagerie of Monsieur Martin. She had been watching that daring speculator as he went through his wonderful performance in the den of the hyena. How is it possible, she continued, to tame those animals so as to be certain that he can trust them? You think it is a problem, I answered, interrupting her, and yet it is a natural fact. Oh, she cried, an incredulous smile flickering on her lip. "'Do you think that beasts are devoid of passions?' I asked. "'Let me assure you that we teach them all the vices and virtues of our own state of civilization.' She looked at me in amazement. "'The first time I saw Monsieur Martin,' I added, "'I exclaimed, as you do, with surprise. I happened to be sitting beside an old soldier whose right leg was amputated and whose appearance had attracted my notice as I entered the building. His face, stamped with the scars of battle, or the undaunted look of a veteran of the wars of Napoleon. Moreover, the old hero had a frank and joyous manner which attracts me whenever I meet it. He was doubtless one of those old campaigners whom nothing can surprise, who find something to laugh at in the last contortions of a comrade, and will bury a friend or rifle his body gaily, challenging bullets with indifference, making short shrift for themselves or others, and fraternizing, as a usual thing, with the devil. After looking very attentively at the proprietor of the menagerie as he entered the den, 
My companion curled his lip with that expression of satirical contempt which well-informed men sometimes put on to mark the difference between themselves and dupes. As I uttered my exclamation of surprise at the coolness and courage of Monsieur Martin, the old soldier smiled, shook his head, and said with a knowing glance, "'An old story.' "'How do you mean, an old story?' I asked. "'If you could explain the secret of this mysterious power, I should be greatly obliged to you.' After a while, during which we became better acquainted, we went to dine at the first café we could find after leaving the menagerie. A bottle of champagne with our dessert brightened the old man's recollections and made them singularly vivid. He related to me a circumstance in his early history which proved that he had ample cause to pronounce Monsieur Martin's performance an old story. When we reached her house, she was so persuasive and captivating, and made me so many pretty promises, that I consented to write down for her benefit the story told me by the old hero. On the following day I sent her this episode of a historical epic which might be entitled The French in Egypt. At the time of General Desaix's expedition to Upper Egypt, a Provençal soldier who had fallen into the hands of the Mogravins was marched by those tireless Arabs across the desert which lies beyond the cataracts of the Nile. To put sufficient distance between themselves and the French army, the Mogravins made a forced march and did not halt until after nightfall. They then camped around a well shaded with palm trees near which they had previously buried a stock of provisions. Not dreaming that the thought of escape could enter their captive's mind, they merely bound his wrists and lay down to sleep themselves after eating a few dates and giving their horses a feed of barley. When the bold Provençal saw his enemies too soundly asleep to watch him, he used his teeth to pick up a scimitar, with which, steadying the blade by means of his knees, he contrived to cut through the cord which bound his hands and thus recovered his liberty. He at once seized a carbine and a poniard, took the precaution to lay in a supply of dates, a small bag of barley, some powder and ball, buckled on the scimitar, mounted one of the horses, and spurred him in the direction where he supposed the French army to be. Impatient to meet the outposts, he pressed the horse, which was already wearied, so severely that the poor animal fell dead with his flanks torn, leaving the Frenchman alone in the midst of the desert. After marching for a long time through the sand with the dogged courage of an escaping galley slave, the soldier was forced to halt as darkness drew on, for his utter weariness compelled him to rest, though the exquisite sky of an eastern night might have tempted him to continue the journey. Happily he had reached a slight elevation, at the top of which a few palm trees shot upward, whose leafage, seen from a long distance against the sky, had helped to sustain his hopes. His fatigue was so great that he threw himself down on a block of granite, cut by nature into the shape of a camp bed, and slept heavily, without taking the least precaution to protect himself while asleep. He accepted the loss of his life as inevitable, and his last waking thought was one of regret for having left the Mugravins, whose no bad life began to charm him now that he was far away from them and from every other hope of succor. He was awakened by the sun whose pitiless beams falling vertically upon the granite rock produced an intolerable heat. The Provençal had ignorantly flung himself down in a contrary direction to the shadows thrown by the verdant and majestic fronds of the palm trees. He gazed at these solitary monarchs and shuddered. They recalled to his mind the graceful shafts crowned with long weaving leaves which distinguished the Saracenic columns of the Cathedral of Arles. The thought overcame him, and when, after counting the trees, he threw his eyes upon the scene around him, an agony of despair convulsed his soul. He saw a limitless ocean. The somber sands of the desert stretched out to lost to sight in all directions. They glittered with dark luster like a steel blade shining in the sun. He could not tell if it were an ocean or a chain of lakes that lay mirrored before him. A hot vapor swept in waves above the surface of this heaving continent. The sky had the oriental glow of translucent purity, which disappoints because it leaves nothing for the imagination to desire. The heavens and the earth were both on fire. 
silence added its awful and desolate majesty. Infinitude, immensity, pressed down upon the soul on every side, not a cloud in the sky, not a breath in the air, not a rift on the breast of the sand, which was ruffled only with little ridges scarcely rising above its surface. Far as the eye could reach, the horizon fell away into space, marked by a slender line, slim as the edge of a saber, like as in summer seas a thread of light parts this earth from the heaven it meets. The Provencal clasped the trunk of a palm tree as if it were the body of a friend. Sheltered from the sun by its straight and slender shadow, he wept, and presently, sitting down, he remained motionless, contemplating with awful dread the implacable nature stretched out before him. He cried aloud, as if to tempt the solitude to answer him. His voice, lost in the hollows of the hillock, sounded afar with a thin resonance that returned no echo. The echo came from the soldier's heart. He was twenty-two years old, and he loaded his carbine. Time enough, he muttered, as he put the liberating weapon on the sand beside him. Gazing by turns at the burnished blackness of the sand and the blue expanse of the sky, the soldier dreamed of France. He smelt and fancied the gutters of Paris. He remembered the towns through which he had passed, the faces of his comrades, and the most trifling incidents of his life. His southern imagination saw the pebbles of his own Provence in the undulating play of the heated air as it seemed to roughen the far-reaching surface of the desert. Dreading the dangers of this cruel mirage, he went down the little hill on the side opposite to that by which he had gone up the night before. His joy was great when he discovered a natural grotto formed by the immense blocks of granite which made a foundation for the rising ground. The remnants of a mat showed that this place had once been inhabited, and close to the entrance were a few palm trees loaded with fruit. The instinct which binds men to life woke in his heart. He now hoped to live until some Mugrabin should pass that way. Possibly he might even hear the roar of a cannon, for Bonaparte was at that time overrunning Egypt. Encouraged by these thoughts, the Frenchman shook down a cluster of the ripe fruit under the weight of which the palms were bending, and as he tasted this unhoped-for manna, he thanked the former inhabitant of the grotto for the cultivation of the trees, which the rich and luscious flesh of the fruit amply attested. Like a true Provençal, he passed from the gloom of despair to a joy that was half insane. He ran back to the top of the hill and busied himself for the rest of the day in cutting down one of the sterile trees which had been his shelter the night before. Some vague recollection made him think of the wild beasts of the desert, and foreseeing that they would come to drink at a spring which bubbled through the sand at the foot of the rock, he resolved to protect his hermitage by felling a tree across the entrance. Notwithstanding his eagerness and the strength which the fear of being attacked while asleep gave to his muscles, he was unable to cut the palm tree in pieces during the day, but he succeeded in bringing it down. Towards evening the king of the desert fell, and the noise of his fall echoing far was like a moan from the breast of solitude. The soldier shuddered as though he had heard a voice predicting evil, but like an heir who does not long mourn a parent, he stripped from the beautiful tree the arching green fronds, its poetical adornment, and made a bed of them in his refuge. Then, tired with his work and by the heat of the day, he fell asleep beneath the red vault of the grotto. In the middle of the night his sleep was broken by a strange noise. He sat up. The deep silence that reigned everywhere enabled him to hear the alternating rhythm of a respiration whose savage vigor could not belong to a human being. A terrible fear, increased by the darkness, by the silence, by the rush of his waking fancies, numbed his heart. He felt the contraction of his hair, which rose on end as his eyes, dilating to their full strength, beheld through the darkness two faint amber lights. At first he thought them an optical delusion, but by degrees the clearness of the night enabled him to distinguish objects in the grotto, and he saw, within two feet of him, an enormous animal lying at rest. Was it a lion? Was it a tiger? Was it a crocodile? The Provençal had not enough education to know in what subspecies he ought to class the intruder, 
but his terror was all the greater because his ignorance made it vague. He endured the cruel trial of listening, of striving to catch the peculiarities of this breathing without losing one of its inflections and without daring to make the slightest movement. A strong odor, like that exhaled by foxes, only more pungent and penetrating, filled the grotto. When the soldier had tasted it, so to speak, by the nose, his fear became terror. He could no longer doubt the nature of this terrible companion whose royal lair he had taken for a bivouac. Before long, the reflection of the moon as it sank to the horizon lighted up the den and gleamed upon the shining, spotted skin of a panther. The lion of Egypt lay asleep, curled up like a dog, the peaceable possessor of a kennel at the gate of a mansion. Its eyes, which had opened for a moment, were now closed. Its head was turned toward the Frenchman. A hundred conflicting thoughts rushed through the mind of the panther's prisoner. Should he kill it with a shot from his musket? But ere the thought was formed, he saw there was no room to take aim. His muzzle would have gone beyond the animal. Suppose he were to wake it. The fear kept him motionless. As he heard the beating of his heart through the dead silence, he cursed the strong pulsations of his vigorous blood, lest they should disturb the sleep which gave him time to think and plan for safety. Twice he put his hand on his scimitar, with the idea of striking off the head of his enemy. But the difficulty of cutting through the close-haired skin made him renounce the bold attempt. Suppose he missed his aim. It would, he knew, be certain death. He preferred the chance of a struggle, and resolved to wait the dawn. It was not long in coming. As daylight broke, the Frenchman was able to examine the animal. Its muzzle was stained with blood. It has eaten a good meal, thought he. Not caring whether the feast were human flesh or not, it will not be hungry when it wakes. It was a female. The fur on the belly and on the thighs was of sparkling whiteness. Several little spots like velvet made pretty bracelets round her paws. The muscular tail was also white, but it terminated with black rings. The fur of the back, yellow as dead gold and very soft and glossy, bore their characteristic spots shaded like a full-blown rose, which distinguished the panther from all other species of felis. This terrible hostess lay tranquilly snoring in an attitude as easy and graceful as that of a cat on the cushions of an ottoman. Her bloody paws, sinewy and well-armed, were stretched beyond her head, which lay upon them, and from her muzzle projected a few straight hairs called whiskers, which shimmered in the early light like silver wires. If he had seen her lying thus imprisoned in a cage, the Provençal would have admired the creature's grace and the strong contrast of vivid color which gave to her robe an imperial splendor. But as it was, his sight was jaundiced by sinister forebodings. The presence of the panther, though she was still asleep, had the same effect upon his mind as the magnetic eyes of a snake produce, we are told, upon the nightingale. The soldier's courage oozed away in presence of this silent peril, though he was a man who gathered nerve before the mouths of cannon belching grape-shot. And yet, ere long, a bold thought entered his mind, and checked the cold sweat which was rolling from his brow. Roused to action, as some men are, when driven face to face with death, they defy it and offer themselves to their doom, he saw a tragedy before him, and he resolved to play his part with honor to the last. Yesterday, he said, the Arabs might have killed me. Regarding himself as dead, he waited bravely, but with anxious curiosity for the waking of his enemy. When the sun rose, the panther suddenly opened her eyes. Then she stretched her paws violently, as if to unlimber them from the cramp of their position. Presently she yawned and showed the frightful armament of her teeth and her cloven tongue rough as a grater. She is like a dainty woman, thought the Frenchman watching her as she rolled and turned on her side with an easy and coquettish movement. She licked the blood from her paws and rubbed her head with a reiterated movement full of grace. "'Well done. Dress yourself prettily, my little woman,' said the Frenchman, who recovered his gaiety as soon as he had recovered his courage. "'We are going to bid each other good morning.' And he felt for the short poniard which he had taken from the Mugrabins. 
At this instant the panther turned her head towards the Frenchman and looked at him fixedly, without moving. The rigidity of her metallic eyes and the insupportable clearness made the Provençal shudder. The beast moved towards him. He looked at her caressingly with a soothing glance by which he hoped to magnetize her. He let her come quite close to him before he stirred. Then with a touch as gentle and loving as he might have used to a pretty woman, he slid his hand along her spine from the head to the flanks, scratching with his nails the flexible vertebrae which divide the yellow back of a panther. The creature drew up her tail voluptuously, her eyes softened, and when for the third time the Frenchman bestowed this self-interested caress, she gave vent to a purr like that with which a cat expresses pleasure, but it issued from a throat so deep and powerful that the sound echoed through the grotto like the last chords of an organ rolling along the roof of a church. The Provençal, perceiving the value of his caresses, redoubled them until they had completely soothed and lulled the imperious courtesan. When he felt that he had subdued the ferocity of his capricious companion, whose hunger had so fortunately been appeased the night before, he rose to leave the grotto. The panther let him go. But as soon as he reached the top of the little hill, she bounded after him with the lightness of a bird hopping from branch to branch and rubbed against his legs, arching her back with a gesture of a domestic cat. Then, looking at her guest with an eye that was growing less inflexible, she uttered the savage cry which naturalists liken to the noise of a saw. "'My lady is exacting,' cried the Frenchman, smiling. He began to play with her ears and stroke her belly, and at last he scratched her head firmly with his nails. Encouraged by success, he tickled her skull with the point of his dagger, looking for the right spot where to stab her. But the hardness of the bone made him pause, dreading failure. The sultana of the desert acknowledged the talents of her slave by lifting her head and swaying her neck to his caresses, betraying satisfaction by the tranquillity of her relaxed attitude. The Frenchman suddenly perceived that he could assassinate the fierce princess at a blow if he struck her in the throat, and he had raised the weapon when the panther, surfeited perhaps with his caresses, threw herself gracefully at his feet, glancing up at him with a look in which, despite her natural ferocity, a flicker of kindness could be seen. The poor Provençal, frustrated for the moment, ate his dates as he leaned against a palm tree, casting from time to time an interrogating eye across the desert in the hope of discerning rescue from afar, and then lowering it upon his terrible companion to watch the chances of her uncertain clemency. Each time he threw away a date stone, the panther eyed the spot where it fell with an expression of keen distrust, and she examined the Frenchman with what might be called a commercial prudence. The examination, however, seemed favorable, for when the man had finished his meager meal, she licked his shoes and wiped off the dust which was caked into the folds of the leather with her rough and powerful tongue. "'How will it be when she is hungry?' thought the Provençal. In spite of the shudder which this reflection cost him, his attention was attracted by the symmetrical proportions of the animal, and he began to measure them with his eye. She was three feet in height to the shoulder and four feet long, not including the tail. That powerful weapon, which was as round as a club, measured three feet. The head, as large as that of a lioness, was remarkable for an expression of crafty intelligence. The cold cruelty of a tiger was its ruling trait, and yet it bore a vague resemblance to the face of an artful woman. As the soldier watched her, the countenance of this solitary queen shone with a savage gaiety like that of Nero and his cups. She had slaked her thirst for blood, and now wished for play. The Frenchman tried to come and go, and accustomed her to his movements. The panther left him free, as if contented to follow him with her eyes, seeming, however, less like a faithful dog watching his master's movements with affection than a large angora cat uneasy and suspicious of them. A few steps brought him to the spring, where he saw the carcass of his horse, which the panther had evidently carried there. Only two-thirds was eaten. The sight reassured the Frenchman, for it explained the absence of his terrible companion and the forbearance which he had shown to him while asleep. This first good luck encouraged the reckless soldier as he thought of the future. The wild idea of making a home with a panther until some chance of escape occurred entered his mind 
and he resolved to try every means of taming her and of turning her good will to account. With these thoughts he returned to her side and noticed joyfully that she moved her tail with an almost imperceptible motion. He sat down beside her fearlessly, and they began to play with each other. He held her paws and her muzzle, twisted her ears, threw her over on her back, and stroked her soft, warm flanks. She allowed him to do so, and when he began to smooth the fur of her paws, she carefully drew in her murderous claws, which were sharp and curved like a Damascus blade. The Frenchman kept one hand on his dagger, again watching his opportunity to plunge it into the belly of the too confiding beast, but the fear that she might strangle him in her last convulsions once more stayed his hand. Moreover, he felt in his heart a foreboding of a remorse which warned him not to destroy a hitherto inoffensive creature. He even fancied that he had found a friend in the limitless desert. His mind turned back involuntarily to his first mistress, whom he had named in derision Mignon, because her jealousy was so furious that throughout the whole period of their intercourse he lived in dread of the knife with which he threatened him. This recollection of his youth suggested the idea of teaching the young panther, whose soft agility and grace he now admired with less terror, to answer to the caressing name. Towards evening he had grown so familiar with his perilous position that he was half in love with its dangers, and his companion was so far tamed that she had caught the habit of turning to him when he called in falsetto tones, Mignon! As the sun went down, Mignon uttered at intervals a prolonged, deep, melancholy cry. She is well brought up, thought the gay soldier. She says her prayers. But the jest only came into his mind as he watched the peaceful attitude of his comrade. "'Come, my pretty blonde, I will let you go to bed first, he said, relying on the activity of his legs to get away as soon as she fell asleep, and trusting to find some other resting place for the night. He waited anxiously for the right moment, and when it came he started vigorously in the direction of the Nile. But he had scarcely marched for half an hour through the sand before he heard the panther bounding after him, giving at intervals the saw-like cry which was more terrible to hear than the thud of her bounds. "'Well, well,' he cried, "'she must have fallen in love with me. Perhaps she has never met anyone else. It is flattering to be her first love.' So thinking, he fell into one of the treacherous quicksands which deceive the inexperienced traveller in the desert and from which there is seldom any escape. He felt he was sinking, and he uttered a cry of despair. The panther seized him by the collar with her teeth and sprang vigorously backward, drawing him like magic from the sucking sand. "'Ah, oh, mignon!' cried the soldier, kissing her with enthusiasm. "'We belong to each other now, for life, for death. But play me no tricks,' he added, as he turned back the way he came. From that moment... The desert was, as it were, peopled for him. It held a being to whom he could talk, and whose ferocity was now lulled into gentleness, although he could scarcely explain to himself the reasons for this extraordinary friendship. His anxiety to keep awake and on his guard succumbed to excessive weariness both of body and mind, and throwing himself down on the floor of the grotto, he slept soundly. At his waking, Mignon was gone. He mounted the little hill to scan the horizon, and perceived her in the far distance, returning with the long bounds peculiar to these animals, who are prevented from running by the extreme flexibility of their spinal column. Mignon came home with bloody jaws, and received the tribute of caresses which her slave hastened to pay, all the while manifesting her pleasure by reiterated purring. Her eyes, now soft and gentle, rested kindly on the Provençal, who spoke to her lovingly as he would a domestic animal. "'Ah, mademoiselle, for you are an honest girl, are you not? You like to be petted, don't you? Are you not ashamed of yourself? You have been eating a mograbin. Well, well, they are animals like the rest of you, but you are not to crunch up a Frenchman. Remember that. If you do, I will not love you.' She played like a young dog with her master, and let him roll her over and pat and stroke her, and sometimes she would coax him to play by laying a paw upon his knee with a pretty, soliciting gesture. Several days passed rapidly, 
the strange companionship revealed to the Provençal the sublime beauties of the desert, the alternations of hope and fear, the sufficiency of food, the presence of a creature who occupied his thoughts, all this kept his mind alert, yet free. It was a life full of strange contrasts. Solitude revealed to him her secrets and wrapped him with her charm. In the rising and the setting of the sun he saw splendors unknown to the world of men. He quivered as he listened to the soft whirring of the wings of a bird, rare visitant, or watched the blending of the fleeting clouds, those changeful and many-tinted voyagers. In the waking hours of the night he studied the play of the moon upon the sandy ocean, where the strong simoom had rippled the surface into waves and ever-varying undulations. He lived in the eastern day, he worshipped its marvellous glory. He rejoiced in the grandeur of the storms when they rolled across the vast plain and tossed the sand upward till it looked like a dry red fog or a solid death-dealing vapor. And as the night came on, he welcomed it with ecstasy, grateful for the blessed coolness of the light of the stars. His ears listened to the music of the skies. Solitude taught him the treasures of meditation. He spent hours in recalling trifles and in comparing his past life with the weird present. He grew fondly attached to his panther, for he was a man who needed an affection. Whether it were that his own will, magnetically strong, had modified the nature of his savage princess, or that the wars then ranging in the desert had provided her with an ample supply of food, it is certain that she showed no sign of attacking him and became so tame that he soon felt no fear of her he spent much of his time in sleeping though with his mind awake like a spider in its web lest he should miss some deliverance that might chance to cross the sandy sphere marked out by the horizon he had made his shirt into a banner and tied it to the top of a palm tree which he had stripped of its leafage taking counsel of necessity he kept the flag extended by fastening the corners with twigs and wedges for the fitful wind might have failed to wave it at the moment when the longed-for succor came in sight nevertheless there were long hours of gloom when hope forsook him and then he played with his panther he learned to know the different inflections of her voice and the meanings of her expressive glance he studied the variegation of the spots which shaded the dead gold of her robe Mignon no longer growled when he caught the tuft of her dangerous tail and counted the black and white rings which glittered in the sunlight like a cluster of precious stones. He delighted in the soft lines of her lithe body, the whiteness of her belly, the grace of her charming head. But above all, he loved to watch her as she gambled at play. The agility and youthfulness of her movements were a constantly fresh surprise to him. He admired the suppleness of the flexible body as she bounded, crept, and glided, or clung to the trunk of palm trees, or rolled over and over, crouching sometimes to the ground, and gathering herself together as she made ready for her vigorous spring. Yet however vigorous the bound, however slippery the granite block on which she landed, she would stop short, motionless, at the one word, Mignon. One day, under a dazzling sun, a large bird hovered in the sky. The Provençal left his panther to watch the new guest. After a moment's pause, the neglected sultana uttered a low growl. "'The devil take me! I believe she is jealous!' exclaimed the soldier, observing the rigid look which once more appeared in her metallic eyes. "'The soul of Sophroni has gotten into her body!' The eagle disappeared in ether and the Frenchman, recalled by the panther's displeasure, admired afresh her rounded flanks and the perfect grace of her attitude. She was as pretty as a woman, the blonde brightness of her robe shaded with delicate gradations to the dead white tones of her furry thighs. The vivid sunshine brought out the brilliancy of this living gold and its variegated brown spots with indescribable luster. The panther and the Provençal gazed at each other with human comprehension. She trembled with delight, the coquettish creature, as she felt the nails of her friend scratching the strong bones of her skull. Her eyes glittered like flashes of lightning, and then she closed them tightly. "'She has a soul,' cried the soldier, watching the tranquil repose of this sovereign of the desert, golden as the sands, white as their pulsing light, 
solitary and burning as they. "'Well,' she said, "'I have read your defense of the beasts, "'but tell me what was the end of this friendship "'between two beings so formed to understand each other?' "'Ah, exactly,' I replied. "'It ended as all great passions end, by a misunderstanding. "'Both sides imagine treachery. "'Pride prevents an explanation, "'and the rupture comes about through obstinacy.' "'Yes,' she said, "'and sometimes a word, a look, an exclamation suffices. "'But tell me the end of the story.' "'That is difficult,' I answered. But I will give it to you in the words of the old veteran as he finished the bottle of champagne and exclaimed, I don't know how I could have hurt her, but she suddenly turned upon me as if in fury and seized my thigh with her sharp teeth, and yet, as I afterwards remembered, not cruelly. I thought she meant to devour me, and I plunged my dagger into her throat. She rolled over with a cry that froze my soul. She looked at me in her death struggle, but without anger. I would have given all the world, my cross, which I had not then gained, all, everything, to have brought her back to life. It was as if I had murdered a friend, a human being. When the soldiers who saw my flag came to my rescue, they found me weeping. Monsieur, he resumed after a moment's silence, I went through the wars in Germany, Spain, Russia, France, I have marched my carcass well nigh over all the world, but I have seen nothing comparable to the desert. Ah, oh, it is grand, glorious. What were your feelings there? I asked. They cannot be told, young man. Besides, I do not always regret my panther and my palm tree oasis. I must be very sad for that, but I will tell you this. In the desert there is all and yet nothing. Stay, explain that. Well, then, he said with a gesture of impatience, God is there, and man is not. End of A Passion in the Desert by Honoré de Balzac The Cow in Krakow by Mini Muriel Dowie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ginny. It was while I was in Krakow, spending my days happily and quietly in wanderings whose vagueness I jealously guarded from the narrowing influences of the guidebook. My excursions had been governed by a principle which holds a vast amount of satisfaction for me. Each morning I had sallied forth and walked to the root of some impressive spire which had seemed to call me, and I could never tell the world of old houses and rich pink brickwork that I delighted in as I went. One spire only puzzled me. Twice I had started for it. Each time I had arrived, hot and interested, quite elsewhere. Needless to say, it gathered an imaginary importance, and I marked it down finally with a sporting eye and started to walk it up scientifically, keeping it well to windward, and making use of all available cover. I skirted the somewhat French quarter of the town, and passed through the Jewish colony, and thence away by a road that seemed aiming for the open country, when at length I recognized my spire, caught in a thicket of big trees, from which grew the long sides of a raspberry-colored building of many windows and a pervading silence. Silence has slept in its courtyard and beneath the empty arches of its doorways. Silence browsed with the brown cow in the center of its grass plot. In all the rooms and ways of it, nothing was stirring. And yet it did not seem dead. On the contrary, windows were open, and curtains not a fortnight starched fluttered at its sills. My intrusion— for I intruded quite promptly, excited no attention, unless perhaps the cow noticed me. I surveyed the two stories on three sides of me, and the tower and the trees, and I could come to no conclusion, if it were a nunnery, which might account for the tower. Why had it not the traditional high wall all round it? Why was it open to the little byway and gate through which I had approached? Where was the surly porter who, through a grating, should have kept the world at bay? 
now i do not need any one to tell me that my next act was inexcusable i know this but perhaps it was justified however you are to hear and can judge i walked in at one of those doorways choosing for preference one through which a sunbeam was preceding me and i set a resolute but reasoning foot upon the stairway it was thus i reasoned the worst that could happen to me would be to be turned out which would not be injurious and the best that could happen to me would be to discover my whereabouts and perhaps have an amusing conversation with an inmate at the best i could apologize with such wit and grace as the moment vouchsafed me at the worst i could but appear a stupid and intrusive foreigner it was in this philosophic spirit that i ascended two flights of stairs and turned with a degree of deprecation along a flagged corridor but it was not exactly in this spirit that i found myself opposite an open door and regarding a young man shaving himself before a glass a young man attired in a more surprising costume than i have ever happened to imagine he did not see me it was his profile that i was regarding and my eye travelled from the cheek he was elaborately scraping to the curious cream woollen and cotton dress which clothed him then it struck me that he was some kind of a priest or monk i was in a monastery it will not hurt me to admit that a thrill strange to me since years before i depleted a store cupboard of some preserved american limes flickered and prickled in the nape of my neck and down my spine it was then that the young man put down his razor and in turning sideways caught sight of my quite motionless figure i expect monks are a pretty transcendental kind of people and perhaps a little exalted in their minds at any rate that one treated me with the respectful stare one would lavish on a being from another world certainly he did not think i was real and i do not blame him to me he appeared a creature in a front scene i one of the audience of whom nothing but attention was expected he began speaking in a tremulous rapid undertone in polish and i feeling the situation so absurd and so unreal laughed and begged him in french to forgive my invasion i felt in a silly sort of way that my simple person stood for the outside world and vanity and folly and perhaps wickedness and it amused me and made me wish i knew how to giggle and could have giggled then but he wiped the soap from his face with a long narrow strip of the hardest huckaback toweling i have ever seen which hung by a tag from the wall and looked at me still with a rather dazed face but conciliatory madam are you an apparition he said gently and with a smile glimmering through his surprise i nodded pleasantly and how is it that do you want anything of me he had altered his phrase and this second one had in it a note of eagerness that did not chime in with my ideas of the conventual manner thank you i do not know that i want anything now i replied i did want to know what this place was and i came up here the feebleness of my case overcame me and i did not proceed with my explanations the young man however did not seem to notice any flaws in my remarks he was rather thinking within himself as he reached a white serge garment from a narrow bed and slipped into it mechanically i am a stranger i think i just wanted to be interested i supplemented you are the only stranger that has set foot within this building he said gravely since i came here a stranger fifteen months ago but there is nothing to prevent anybody coming in that i can see said i in defence of my presence it's all quite open we are known the views of our order and its laws in krakow no one belonging to this place would pass that first gateway wouldn't they indeed said i much interested and why did you come here the minute i had said it i felt this remark to be inquisitive but i must have appeared so inquisitive altogether that a little more or less could not matter and the young brother in no way resented the inquiry i came here by a trick he replied with some fierceness and i leaned back upon the stonework and blinked at him the oddness of my position struck me far more forcibly than before and though he was speaking even asking me questions it all went by me as though i watched it in a dream until at last i woke and he seemed to be telling me about himself i was intended for the austrian diplomatic service he was saying and was passing through a course at the university of paris i had never had great sympathy with my family and i disliked the austrian ideas and influence i am a pole and i love my own country in paris i met others of the same mind i became one of them 
we had our dreams and we hoped i see now that i abused my father's confidence but my punishment has been bitter for ten months i labored secretly put aside my title and traveled to switzerland to london lectured and spoke for our cause and told my family no word of what i was doing it does not matter it would not matter if i told you the whole of it now for i am as dead to the world as if i were in a silver tomb in the vaults of Wavel. but it broke up my life a lady at whose house i visited in paris learned something of my pursuits and wrote to my family i do not say that she meant ill i was recalled to vienna to join my father who has a high position there and is much favored by the emperor he spoke to me of the ruin of our house of my mothers and sisters in spite of his name he is a modern he swims with the tide i was at once offered a post at a court and compelled to mix with men of my father's opinions and i could not bear it i promised my father to follow any profession to enter on any way of life that did not entail my bending my pride so low my living in a nest of lies eating them breathing them lying down at night with them any life said my father any life i answered a Chernovitsky never breaks his word, said he, nor binds himself to false oaths, said I. That was the end. I left my father at his government office, and on my return to the hotel of my brother, a note awaited me. It announced that this. The young man waved his arm in the direction of his narrow bed and single pre was my father's choice for me. For fifteen months I have seen no one belonging to the world, the world I love. No one till you came, mademoiselle your chance visit i think you have dropped from the skies excites all my old longing for the life i have left why not leave this life and go back to paris cut yourself off from your family you are cut off from them now and make your own life what you please the brother smiled and shook his head looking dreamily into the elm branches that smothered the root of my spire do you know paris he said wistfully well i have just left there and you return he said with sudden eagerness oh in about three months perhaps mademoiselle you have it in your power to do me the greatest possible service you comprehend the greatest possible service will you do it it will not trouble you much you who have fallen from the clouds to give me comfort will you do it he was extraordinarily excited his face which was pale flushed a very dark color and he panted as he spoke I stood away from the cold stone balustrade on which I had been leaning during this remarkable interview, and put a foot over the threshold of his cell. But certainly I will do it. I will do anything in my power that will really serve you, I said. Only tell me. A bell, such a nasty, tinny, ascetic, inhuman sort of bell, rang out from the spire. The young man looked nervously towards his window, but began speaking rapidly to me as though time were precious. I left Paris hastily, as you have heard. There was not time to see or explain to all my friends. One of them, Mademoiselle, I am trusting you, and speaking with my soul, and yet even a dead man hesitates to talk of that which is in his heart's lining, so to say. But I have thought so much, and there is no way. My mother, my sisters would not help me, even if I could get word to them. But letters are inspected, and I, sacred God, I am supposed to have given up such thoughts. You cannot mean that you are going to spend all your life here, doing nothing. Oh, do not be so mad. Come away. Come away now. No one saw me enter. None will see you go out. Come, and let me help you back to Paris. I have money if you need it. Let me help you back to—to to the lady you have not forgotten. It was a venture, but I never was surer of anything than that lady's existence when I spoke. He stooped with a strange, graceful suddenness and kissed my hand. Dear lady, he said, there is my oath, and the words choked him as he said them. But time is short, let me think. A brother might pass at any moment. I must write a letter, and you, ah, uh, I am afraid it is too hard for you to find her and to deliver it. She may not be in the same place. She may be, no, God is not cruel. She is not married. The simple faith of that man's voice, as he said these last words, is what I have never heard nor ever expect to hear the like of i knew very soon i should be crying well won't you write i said i will find her tell me only your name i added with a sudden inspiration and be quick and write the letter he had already found his paper and pen it was a stiff curious piece of paper and he was flinging words upon it 
I am Stanislav Chernovitsky, Count of the Province of. You are Brother Stanislav, of the Order of the White Brothers of Jesus and John, said a voice in the corridor. I have never been so startled in my life as when, with chill, frozen slowness, I turned and saw that white man standing behind me. It was not for myself I was frightened, for nothing could happen to me but the poor Count and his half-written letter. For ten seconds, fifteen perhaps, no one spoke. I admit I had quite lost my head, but it only struck me that all Poles do not know German, and I assumed that the superior did not and that the Count did. For heaven's sake, the address, only the address, I exclaimed, with the stray South German accent of my school days, which recurs to me in moments of excitement. But the Count's hand had fallen to his sides, and the newcomer was addressing him over my head in Polish and with great severity. I knew it was about me, but my wits had not come back to me quite, or I would have behaved with more dignity. I put out my hand for the letter. The name, just the bare name, I said wildly. Ah, oh, no. Go, madam. Pray go, I beg of you. It was the Count speaking with strange, bitter self-possession, and that should have brought me to myself. I turned to the superior. I do not know exactly what I said, but I smiled in my nervousness, actually smiled on the horrid creature who had appeared so inopportunely. Madam, of your goodness, go, and thank you, said the soft voice of the Count behind me. And without a word more I went, down the stairs and out into the court unmolested, and the slamming of one heavy door, that of the Count's cell I felt sure, was the sound that followed me into the sunshine. End of A Cowl in Krakow by Mini Muriel Dowie